We are live. All right, fantastic. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Judicial Proceedings Committee. Today is Thursday, January 28th, and we have 14 bills on the docket. Um, we are gonna take a few of Senator Carter's bills together. So first, we're gonna go to Senate Bill 50 and Senate Bill 482 are gonna be taken together, and they'll be first. Uh, we'll then move to Senator Carter 419, um, and then jump to Senate Bill 61, after that, we'll hear Senate Bill 234. Next will be Senate Bill 328. Uh, next will be Senate Bill 128, followed by Senate Bill 130, followed by Senate Bill 98. Next will be Senate Bill 154, then Senate Bill 236, and then Senate Bill 105. And we'll round out with Senator Cassidy, Senate Bill 381. So Senator Carter, Senate Bills 50 and Senate Bill 482 together, uh, you're up. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, Chairman Smith and all of the members of our illustrious committee. The good news for us today is that we have already heard these bills. Uh, Senate Bill 50 and Senate Bill 482, as well as the next bill, Senate Bill 419, during our September hearings. At that time, with respect to a whistleblower, which is SB 482, and duty to intervene, which is Senate Bill 50, um, it was discussed, it was brought up in testimony, and since then I've had more discussions with other people, and um, I believe, as many do, that there should be a combining of the content of Senate Bill 50 and Senate Bill 482. Senate Bill 50, due to intervene, Senate Bill 482, whistleblower, as well as a bill that, that Senator Sidnor has, has proposed, which is the duty to report. Um, these issues are inextricably intertwined and thus should be uh, dealt with together. And so with that, without further ado, um, in September, um, we heard the issue of duty to intervene. It's a bill that I introduced many, many years ago. Um, we heard from um, current, retired Colonel Neil Franklin and others regarding the fact that there is no duty in state law to intervene when witnessing the unnecessary or unwarranted or excessive force by another officer. It's kind of a common sense no brainer. I don't believe that we heard any disagreement from anyone, um, including Commissioner Harrison from Baltimore City who also testified that Baltimore has implemented that policy and he, he suggested that it should be a statewide law as well. And so I don't think I need to go into too much detail because I think we all understand duty to intervene. Um, with When a, an officer witnesses another officer using excessive force or other misconduct. Um, we've seen it in the case that everybody likes to bring up, which is George Floyd, but um, we've seen it here in Maryland in many instances as well, um, going back to a case that really resonated with me all the way back to, I believe it was 2011 or 12, which was Ethan Saylor, where um, Frederick County Sheriff's Department officers um, what had um, Ethan Saylor, Robert Ethan Saylor in custody. Um, he was a person that had Down syndrome and um, he was uh, killed by asphyxiation um, at the hand of one officer, but others watched. Um, or did fail to fail to intervene and you know fail to to de-escalate. We've seen it a multitude of times and I won't go into it because I've got the testimony of um, public defender Deborah Levi as well as um, Professor Jeffrey Alpert to speak about it. Um, with respect to whistleblower protection, what I would like to suggest is that um, it's much needed. And I don't think there's any disagreement that officers must be protected when they intervene, when they report misconduct. But what's critical about the specific legislation I'm proposing is that I'm proposing that uh, this be um, emphatically stated in written policy when officers are first hired, that they are trained and educated at the outset of their careers, that um, they will be protected 
Um, and if they are not protected, then they are entitled to damages for not being protected um, when they report misconduct of fellow officers. I know that in the opposition testimony that are, is offered by, I think, the FOP and maybe the chiefs and sheriffs, um, they contend that this is already covered under law under the LELBR, but it's absolutely not. Specifically, what this bill proposes is not covered under the LELBR. Um, and, you know, as we all know, we're also debating the continued the efficacy of the LELBR later in the session. But what's important is that Ken Williams testified about his own um, perils uh, and retaliation at reporting misconduct within his agency. We also heard in September the compelling testimony of retired Captain Sonia Pruitt, who had risen to the level of captain and was the first African-American woman to ever rise to the level of captain in the Montgomery County Police Department. She talked about her own story, the perils that she endured, the retaliation that she endured for reporting misconduct within her agency. And I won't go on, I'm happy to answer questions, but I, I just posit that as we look at the ways that we can bring accountability and protect officers, these are some of the most critical bills that we can possibly introduce, possibly pass as laws um, to make sure that the good officers, the officers with integrity um, are protected, but that they are also encouraged um, to do what is right, what is in their conscience. Um, over many years, I've heard story after story from officers of a fear of coming forward, a fear of retaliation, and not to be belabor this, but you know, my somewhat of a crusade for police reform sort of began around 2010 when I was uh, pleaded with by members of the Vanguard Justice Society to please um, do something about the trial boards that were biased because they were unfair to black officers. But when it came time after, after they somewhat begged me to put in legislation to help them, they were actually afraid to come to Annapolis to testify because they knew that they'd be retaliated even for speaking out within their own agencies about the discrimination that they um, and the bias within their own agency. And so with that, I will be quiet. I will defer to, uh, to the professor and to Ms. Levy and be happy to answer any questions regarding the legislation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Senator Carter. And since the two bills have been taken together and uh, Ms. Levy is uh, signed for both panels, we'll take her first and then we'll go to uh, Ms. Roshong. Uh, so Ms. Levy, uh, you are up. Thank you, Senator Smith and uh, esteemed senators. It's a pleasure to be back in front of you today. Um, and I apologize as I um, try to combine my testimony for you. So uh, bear with me if it's a little bit clunky today. Esteemed senators on Senate Bill 50, you have heard or will soon hear testimony on the duty to report and on protecting, and on protecting whistleblowers who make such reports. It follows naturally then that the legislature would address excessive force, not just after it occurs, but before and while it is occurring as well. Senate Bill 50 aims to do just that, to incentivize intervening and to prevent harm while it is actually happening. The Office of the Public Defender's highest priority with respect to policing legislation is to increase transparency and to root out misconduct. As many, uh, if not all of you, have seen by now a video that went viral in July of 2017, and I have more recently shared with several of you, which shows officers planting evidence in a vacant field and then subsequently recovering it and charging an individual for that possession. When the main officer announces on body camera that he's going to go back and look once again for the drugs in the exact location where he had just planted them, his colleagues laugh out loud on video, encouraging him, tacitly giving him permission. This culture of encouraging, of not intervening until this point comes at no consequence for law enforcement. And unless and until the legislature can incentivize intervening incentivize interrupting and incentivize courage. Officers will not have it and they will not do it. I'm going to tell you the story today of Officer Joe Crystal who reported excessive force after it happened and was subsequently retaliated against. 
And days ago, I testified in front of you on another bill about my own reporting story of how I summoned the courage to report judicial misconduct. But sadly, few can stand here today to talk to you about the importance of intervening during instances of violence because their lives have been lost. No one can testify on this bill without asking you to consider whether George Floyd or Anton Black or William Green would still be here today if officers were required and incentivized to interrupt. The duty to intervene goes hand in hand with the duty to report, and we hope that the legislature will implement whistleblower protections for officers who demonstrate such courage and criminalize the failure of those who don't, particularly when someone is, handled, is suffering at the hands of police violence. I told you the other day that if anyone were to tell you about this historic blue coat of silence that it didn't exist, that that person wouldn't be telling the truth. Just this week, Victor Rivera was sentenced to former Baltimore police officer in federal court for lying to the FBI. And while she was ferreting out her sentence, Judge Catherine Blake talked about the strength of the blue coat of silence. And in fact, Victor Rivera's attorney asked for leniency because Mr. Rivera broke that blue coat of silence when he sat for interviews with the gun trace task force. The blue coat of silence, sometimes referred to by officers as what happens in the family, stays in the family, needs to be broken. Do you know that story better than Baltimore police officer Joe Crystal? On October 27th, 2011, Crystal and his colleagues were getting ready to end their shift when they decided to take, make one more arrest. As they honed in on Antoine Green, a suspected drug dealer, Mr. Green fled and entered what he thought was a vacant row house, only to find the girlfriend of an off-duty police officer inside. After some time passed, the officers arrested Mr. Green, whose case in its entirely was ultimately dismissed, and they called for a paddy wagon to take him down to the station. But when the off-duty police officer whose girlfriend owned the row home showed up at the apartment, the officers radioed and ordered the paddy wagon to return. Williams and his colleague, Sergeant Mariano Gialamas, then beat Mr. Green senseless in front of other officers. Crystal, an ambitious and heroic officer, reported the brutality the next day. While Williams and Gialamas were ultimately criminally convicted, Mr. Cruz Mr. Crystal went on to be crucified. He was called a rat, he was intimidated, he was reassigned, and eventually per a lawsuit he filed against the Baltimore Police Department forced to resign. The culminating event occurred for him one morning when he walked out of the home that he shared with his wife to find a dead and bloody rat shoved under the windshield wiper of his car. It is not enough to wish for a change in culture, it's time to require it. Perhaps if we'd done so earlier, good officers like Joe Crystal, who just won Officer of the Year in Florida, would still be here today protecting the citizens of Baltimore. On that, we would ask for a favorable recommendation for both Senate Bill 482 and 50. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Ms. Levy. Uh, next, we'll move on to Ms. Roshong. Riley, you're up. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you everyone else on the committee. My name is Riley Grace Roshong, and I am a law student at the University of Maryland School of Law. I've done extensive research on police reform and various jobs I have had since becoming a law student, and I'm here to share some of what I've learned in support of Senate Bill 50. It's no secret that our country broadly recognizes the need for drastic police reform. In the wake of the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and countless others at the hands of needless police brutality, our nation came together for what was the single largest civil rights mov movement in history. We need police reform and it begins with requiring our officers to hold each other accountable for their actions. According to the US Department of Justice, the feature distinguishing police from all other groups in society is their authority to apply coercive force when circumstances call for it. And let's just be clear about what that means. They're able to do something in the course of their day-to-day -day jobs that no one else can, take the life of another person. For this reason, according to the US Commission on Civil Rights, police officers must operate with the highest standards of professionalism and accountability. Now, I do want to be clear, I'm not sitting here moralizing this issue or making personal judgments about police officers. I get it. A lot of police officers are wonderful people and have the best intentions. And they get into this line of work to defend the people of Maryland and to protect those who cannot protect themselves. I get it. But it would also be misleading to say that police excessive use of force is not an issue. Although the total numbers of deaths by police brutality in the US may seem small, our police kill civilians at rates five times higher than that in Canada, 40 times higher than in Germany, 140 times higher than that in England and Wales, and generally kill more people than most developed democratic countries. 
Current evidence also shows that black people are three times more likely to be killed by police than white people, despite being more likely to be unarmed. And most importantly, relating to this bill, studies have shown that not only is excessive use of force a demonstrable issue, but also the fact that higher levels of peer misconduct among police officers has shown to increase an officer's misconduct rate. And the norm of rerouting offending police officers to new departments exacerbates this issue. This is why you need to give a favorable report on Senate Bill 50. Our nation and broader academia recognizes the need for police reform. Let's hold our officers to a higher standard and set a good example for the rest of our nation. We respect them and we know that they can handle it. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much for your testimony and good to see you again. Great to um, see you as well. Next we'll move, yeah, likewise, good. <laughs> Um, next, we'll move on to uh, the opposition panel and uh, Mr. McAvoy, I see you are here. There we go. Can you hear me all right? We can, yes. Very good. Thank you all, Senators. Uh, Actually, Mr. McAvoy, could you hold for one moment? Sure. I see the Senator Carter um, has her hand up. So Senator Carter. Oh, yeah. Just that I had Professor Alpert on my um, panel. Uh, here. Have, oh, if, yeah. uh, if prof is he here? He's right there. Well, he's on my screen right there. Oh, there you are. All right, let's go to Professor Alpert. Sorry, my apologies, did not have it on my, my, my sheet here, but uh, Professor, go forward. You're, you're, uh, you're up. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Alpert. I'm a professor of, of criminology and criminal justice at the University of South Carolina. Uh, just a little background, I have taught uh, and continually teach at the FBI National Academy and the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. I'm currently a federal monitor in the New Orleans Police Department. Uh, had testified to President Obama's 21st Century Task Force on Policing and President Trump's Commission on Criminal Justice. I'm a member of the International Association of Chiefs of Police committee, on a policy committee, and I've worked with several departments uh, here in Maryland. Um, a few years ago, as part of my work as a monitor in New Orleans, an active bystander program was developed that is now the uh, active bystandership for law enforcement or the ABLE program that is uh, developed, uh, was developed and is now run out of Georgetown Law. Uh, it's probably the most consequential and important program that I've seen in law enforcement in my 40 years in this business. Um, the bottom line is it creates a culture of peer intervention and something that was mentioned earlier by, by Debbie. Uh, it, it's such an important thing to develop this culture of peer intervention because without it, uh, we have all the problems that, that we are currently seeing. Now, this duty to intervene has had a long history in policing, and especially in the area of driving and uh, uh, social interactions. In fact, I worked with Prince George's County a few years ago uh, when they developed the Courageous Conversations. Now, the Courageous Conversations in Prince George's was pretty much limited to driving and uh, prevention of, of single vehicle crashes. But the point was to get officers to talk to their partners, to even talk to their supervisors, when, when they were driving too fast, when they were driving recklessly or, or certainly uh, distracted and not wearing seat belts. And, and over the, the years, now if you may remember, uh, this started because three officers lost their lives in single car collisions in a very short period of time. But after they developed this program and after the Courageous Conversation became part of the, the police department, um, they didn't have those crashes, they didn't have those injuries and they didn't have those deaths. So it works, it's just the idea of peer intervention, the idea of the duty to intervene works, uh, works in Maryland, works all throughout the country, and in fact, the world in, in law enforcement. Moving to the issues of use of force, it's so critical that officers make sure their fellow uh, officers and even supervisors are um. using force excessively. And I think uh, really are unreasonably. And we know that some officers get hyped up. We know that some officers uh, read cues improperly and some officers overreact. And, and what I saw in New Orleans as one of the federal monitors was situations where 
officers would put hands on shoulders and say to their colleagues, I got it, I can handle this. Uh, not so much that you're hyped up and you can't handle it because that was the part of training. And that was what they learned in training and that's what they learned to accept. And that was the cultural change that, that, that existed. When I put my hand on a shoulder and say, I got it, you will automatically back up and let me take care of it because I'm in a better position to do so. And Professor, that's where the force certainly- Sorry, Professor, I just muted you real quick, but uh, your time's up. I'm gonna ask you to just briefly conclude. I, uh, so go ahead and unmute yourself, but uh, thank you for your testimony here. <laughs> if you can unmute yourself again, sorry about that. No, I would I, I just in, in conclusion say this is a very important bill. It's certainly in the right direction with proper training and, and supervision. This this can be transformative in, in law enforcement. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, try to use the mute button uh, judiciously, but I'd rather do that than yell over the over the computer. Um, OK, so now uh, that concludes the, the proponents. Senator Carter, I don't see any other witnesses listed, so I think we're squared away. Um, now we'll move on to the opposition panel, Mr. McAvoy. All right, You're thank up. you so much, committee. I appreciate that. Um, with respect to um, SB 50, and I, I'm not signed up for 482, although I am concerned about, um, well, I agree with the issue in 482 of um, constructive uh, abuse toward whistleblowers. Uh, I am concerned about this becoming overly litigious. But back to um, 50, which I am signed up for, my concern about this, as with so many of the bills, is not the actual wording, but actually how it would work in real life. When you are applying for it, and decades and decades in the city, I've, it, it's just minimal to see, except for the very end. And I just saw a major bust the other night. Uh, three cop cars, two people sitting, nobody touched, nobody. Okay. Um, that when you're getting into the force issue, now things have escalated and that there is a safety issue. And so the, I, I'm concerned that this bill as the rubber hits the road will imbue a sense of second guessing officers, second guessing themselves, sergeants, second guessing themselves while they're in line of fire or in danger. And that shouldn't be the case. I'm also concerned that like the last person that just spoke, that we're talking about seatbelts. That is not an issue. I'm just speaking for both of them. That's not an issue. We've got much more dangerous issues than seatbelts with respect to our law enforcement. And I think that we need to, to keep perspective on that and the death rate that we have in the city and in this state. Um, so for that reason and for the fact that I, I do see this as being a way to draw wedges in between people and cause divisiveness in, in our police departments, uh, I would, I would ask to, to vote against 50. I think it's, uh, as always, I know Senator Carter's heart is in the right place. I just think that as this will hit the road, uh, I think that we have real concern about that. I thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Mr. McAvoy. Uh, and with that, that'll conclude the testimony. And I'll open it up to the, to the committee members for questions. I see Senator West has a question. Senator West. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not muted. This is great. <laughs> um, so um, I've got a, a couple of things. Uh, as you probably remember, I had my own policing bill that came before the committee a little over a week ago. And um, the, the duty to intervene was part of my bill. Um, I had the same problem with this bill that I had with a number of the bills that we heard last summer. Namely, I'm, as I read along with the bill, I'm with them, I'm with them, I'm with them until all of a sudden the bill wigs out. And I say, I just can't go there. So in this, this case, uh, uh, Senator Carter, um, did you, the, the, the penalty provisions, uh, the lower, lower half of page two, um, it, it is correct, is it not, that the failure to intervene would, ha would be a snap decision, a, a, an instantaneous, you see another police officer doing, all of a sudden do something which which is viewed as being excessive and you need to make a decision in a split second whether or not to intervene or whether or not to intervene, correct? Um, I, I, I caught most of what you said, Senator West. Um, I, I don't think that um, 
it's always a snap decision. No, I think that there's, um, first of all, an innate sense of right, right and wrong, but I also think there's formalized training, extensive training that officers have and that cont they continue to have both in the beginning of their service and in service training that is designed to um, educate them and train them on use of force, necessary force, and um, what would what would be excessive force. So I don't think that is something that you know is impossible or too difficult for an officer to ascertain in the moment when they see, for example, with George uh, the Floyd case, or or with the Tyrone West case, or with the Ethan Saylor case, or you know with with multiple other cases that we've seen where there's one or two actual culprits committing the actual physical violence, but there are multiple other officers that stand around and do nothing. And there's a, a, a ton of cases that- um, well, when, you talk, when you talk about the George Floyd case, you're talking about an extreme situation. Fortunately, that did not happen here in Maryland. Um, my, it has my happened. So, very similar cases have happened here in Maryland. I'm, I don't remember. That is, All right. Well, my, my suspicion is say that we knew these issues way before George Floyd. My suspicion is that in, in, in police interactions with citizens, things begin to escalate and then they escalate further and then they escalate further. And at some, t at some point along the way, uh, another police officer would do something which the, which the bystanding police officer would deem to be excessive. And he, he, he or she, the, the bystanding officer, would need to make a very rapid decision whether or not to intervene. Wouldn't you agree that's generally the case? They make a decision whether to intervene. And, you know, if they if, if your concern is that they would fail to intervene and that would be then, of course, um, investigated before a determination was made whether they were right or wrong. So I don't think. That it's not, you know, it's not as if it's not going to be, um, you know, investigated and a determination made if, if there's an allegation or a failure to intervene. I'm not sure why you're resisting to answering my question. My question I, is, isn't it generally the case, isn't it generally the case that in the field, things start to escalate and then at some point, something happens which causes the bystanding police officer to believe that the ac acting police officer has has, react, has overreacted and that there needs to be a need for intervention. Doesn't that tend to happen quickly and isn't a rapid decision generally required under the circumstances? Under some circumstances, yes. Not okay. All right, so now I see in, the, in the, penal, the penalties that you're providing in your bill are imprisonment of the offending officer for up to five years and a, excuse me, and the offending officer is not the person who overreacted, who used the excessive force. It's the bystanding officer. So your bill provides for putting the bystanding officer in prison for up to five years and fining the officer $10,000 and subjecting him to a civil cause of action which could bankrupt him and his family because in a, in a split second, uh, in the judgment of a jury after the fact, he didn't act appropriately. That, that's what this bill does, doesn't it? Well, it's, it's a little more than that. I mean, from, from your perspective, um, which posits that it's not a real problem. I don't posit it's not a real problem. Too difficult I'm only asking, I'm to make a decision. About the penalties. But, so I don't think that the penalty is excessive in light of the fact that we're talking about a failure to save a human life or some other situation like that. So no, well, I let me let me read you. I don't think attorney. subjecting the officer to these penalties and a balancing test is unfair or outweighs the the importance of having that requirement so that officers don't hesitate. What we want is for officers not to hesitate to intervene because they can save other people's lives. They can also, frankly, save other officers from you know, doing damage to their own selves in their own careers if they stop them from, from bad acts. Let me read to you from the testimony of the Attorney General on this bill. He writes, while we have reservations about whether criminal liability is the appropriate sanction, a duty to intervene should be a part of every law enforcement agency's administrative policies and officers failing to comply with that policy 
should face discipline or be terminated consistent with the agency's administrative procedures. Do you disagree with that statement from the Attorney General? I don't disagree that the Attorney General has hesitation about a criminal penalty, but I, I do disagree that we should not consider a criminal penalty. I, I believe that we've seen time after time um, situations where um, the silence and the failure to act is complicity, it is collusion, and that if the officers had acted, had they stepped in, had they intervened, that lives would be saved and tragedies would be averted. So I believe that a criminal penalty is warranted. And if we would compare it to our other laws, for example, felony murder, where a person can even be a bystander, where a felony is committed, someone dies, and we can we allow under our laws to sweep even a bystander up um, being accused of a murder. Um, even situations where we have second degree murder or, or, or murder where, or, or charges where there's four people involved, but only one is a principal, but all of the others that are there are charged under our laws with conspiracy, um, accessory, and, and the like. So this is not inconsistent with the way that we treat people when they are present and either are complicit by they're, they're either a complicit or actually participating. It's not unusual. Well, let me go on then to Senate Bill 42, which I, I gather, Mr. Chairman, we're considering not only Senate Bill 50, but also 42 uh, at this point. That's correct. Okay, okay. Let me, I'm looking at 482 and 482, first of all, contains the definition of retaliatory action. Um, and it says, Retaliatory action includes any recommended, threatened, or adverse em employment action, including one, termination, demotion, suspension, or reprimand. And then turning to section uh, 3803, it says, subject to restriction subsection B, a supervisor and author appointing authority or the head of law enforcement agency may not threaten to take or take a retaliatory action against a law enforcement officer who one, discloses information that the law enforcement officer reasonably believes evidences an abuse of authority, et cetera. So let me put to you a hypothetical. There is a police officer who has committed numerous disciplinary offenses and is in danger of being disciplined, suspended, or fired. And the officer, um, to protect himself, reports something that happened a while ago, which he claims was an abuse of authority by somebody else on the force. As I read your bill, once he has reported an abuse of authority, retaliatory action kicks in. And it would be retaliatory action for that person to be terminated, demoted, suspended, or reprimanded. The, the termination, demotion, suspension, or reprimanding is not in the bill tied in any way to what he, what he did here. So wouldn't this be a way for an officer who, who's concerned about his future in the department to report an alleged abuse of authority and that way protect himself from being demoted, suspended, or reprimanded or fired? Well, certainly given, given our history with um, some officers that have made media and actually been federally indicted to the Gun Trace Task Force and others, I don't, members of the Gun Trace Task Force and others, um, I certainly wouldn't put it past an officer to, you know, try to game the system by reporting some offense somewhere else to protect himself. But I would also think that um, if there's some tightening up of the language that you think or we think is going to be helpful to make sure that doesn't happen, that's something that we should consider doing because that's not the intent of the bill. Um, the intent of the bill is to protect the good officers that report, not the ones that are already bad, uh, to give them another way to, to protect themselves. Great. I'm glad you agree with me on that. I, I will try to draft an amendment and because I agree with the bill. It's in my bill. <laughs> this is another book of my omnibus of policing bill. So I certainly agree that you the retaliatory action is completely uh, impermissible, um, but we can't let allow someone who is about to be disciplined anyway to make a complaint and thereby insulate that person from being disciplined or fired. 
or you could draft a, an amendment that would make make sure that require a nexus between the activity and the and the complaint and the uh, and the it, So exactly, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll have such an amendment drafted. Got it. Appreciate that. All right, uh, Senator West, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Cassley's next, and then we have Senator Jacks, uh, Senator Sidnor, then Senator Jackson. So Senator Cassley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a question for for Senator Carter. Um, I guess first point is just that. I'm so happy on SB 50 that I finally found an issue on which I am in agreement with the attorney general um, <laughs> position on this. So I, that's just, wow. You know, the, the um, but so, you know, when we, we've spent you and I together for six, seven years now, have spent so much time um, working on issues of not over criminalizing things. And, and, and you've taught me, you know, I, and I've listened to you carefully. I really have, you know, and, and you've made a lot of good points on this area with me because, you, you know, we don't always agree, but you've been consistent on not over-criminalizing, um, uh, that jail isn't always the answer, that it can be the wrong thing. And, 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 and many times I, I found that you'd be right. Um, so I'm sort of surprised on this bill because I'm looking at sort of this mass this this would this would result you know there ten officers show up one is alleged to have of, of committed excessive force uh, in a split second decision we end up with eleven indictments um, all claiming that you know charging people with an offense for which they can go to jail for five years plus the the perpetrator the alleged perpetrator actually you know struck the blow or whatever um, and and clearly at least one state attorney in this in this state would probably do that as a matter of course just. Uh, excessively, just any any cop who was around at the time of an allegation of of, of of excessive force, just indict them all because under this statute, there's they had a duty to report, they didn't report, and I just find the chilling. Well, and, duty. This this is actually only duty to intervene, but I do think duty report should be included. Well, du duty to intervene. I mean, hey, every cop within ten feet um, under this bill who could have stepped in there. So we end up with this just. Every cop at the scene second guessing and rethinking should I go kick my partner in the face and drag him you know what, what, these are split second decisions and did you see what that officer saw and you just got here and you he was here for 10 minutes you got here 30 seconds ago you don't know what just happened over the last nine minutes but you walk up and you're like whoa is this excessive but you didn't see what happened before that so we'll just indict everybody I'm really concerned I, I mean I'm looking at the maybe you can respond to just both the attorney general's position, I think the Baltimore County State's attorney, that, hey, this is this is an administrative matter, that you you do have a duty to intervene, um, and, and that's appropriate. And that if you if there's an allegation you failed to do that, um, you can be fired. So if you're a career cop of 15 years in, you face blowing all that, so you can be fired, you can be demoted, um, you can be, you know, uh, uh, financial sanctions and all those things would be appropriate. If, if, if it's determined that you didn't do that. But the idea of just this sort of massive indictment of you know every police officer within 10 feet of any time somebody alleges excessive force, just seems like it goes against, look, I, I, I understand the folks who say we shouldn't treat cops better than anybody else. But the, the reciprocal of that is we don't treat cops worse than we treat anybody else. And I got it, they have this tremendous public duty because they're armed and the like, but that doesn't, I just don't see how that justifies this massive duty to, uh, you know, subject them or the, the subjecting them to this really grossly disproportionately unfair treatment that just because you were there, you're facing five years. I, I wow, this just shocks me. And so maybe you can respond because I'm not, I'm not based upon what you and I have discussed for years now. I, I don't get your position on this, quite frankly. I, I understand the duty. I understand the sanction. I understand sanctions. I don't understand five years and 10 grand. Thank you. Thank you for the question and for the opportunity to elaborate on my opinion. So first of all, um, we've seen time and time again across the state and across the country that administrative sanctions um, do not have, have been a colossal failure. Um, first of all, we've seen that the overwhelming majority of these cases never reach administrative sanctions because internal investigations um, in uh, sections inside of law enforcement agencies um, have overwhelmingly failed to bring any type of administrative sanctions to officers that one, commit excessive force, or certainly not the duty to intervene. 
or a violated duty to intervene. So the first issue is um, there's no statewide law for duty to intervene. Different agencies have policies. This bill would give us a statewide law. So administratively, I would say that we can't rely on um, the agencies to police themselves and on this or anything else that we've, we've done, which is something else that we have to deal with. But number two, I do believe that there are cases where this rises to the level of criminal sanctions, because I've said before, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, but the truth is we are talking about brutality. We are talking about people who, not only the ones that are murdered or killed by the brutality or brutal beatings or shootings, unnecessary shootings of officers, but we're talking about the ones that even live, that live with the trauma and that their families are with the trauma that follows it. And so again, there is case after case after case of this. There are hundreds of millions of dollars that have been expended in settling these kinds of cases. And so if you are asking my opinion as one who does not believe in over-criminalization or over-incarceration, um, in this instance, I do believe there should be a criminal penalty. I believe a criminal penalty is warranted. This is not actually listed as a felony, although I think in some instances, maybe it rises to that level. But I do also believe that as in most of our laws, um, first time offenders for these non felonies were, are not likely to receive um, excessive jail time or any jail time at all. And so I don't believe that this is excessive or somehow an unwarranted potential sanction. I would be more than happy to discuss um, modifying the sanctions in the bill, but do I believe there should be a criminal sanction? Yes, I believe there should be. So just, just sort of a brief coming back, I don't want to belabor this, but I mean, as you know, just the, the threat or the, or the actual event of an indictment, whether you're convicted or whether you're sentenced any substantial is just an emotional trauma and probably a political, a, a, a professional killer. Um, but I, it does bother me when you cite to across the country, because in a country of 320 million people on the street, three, you know, 24 seven, 365 in all sorts of, 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 of actions nonstop, we just, we're gonna see mistakes. We're gonna see bad mistakes. We're gonna see these bad cops. I think we really have to be careful about making Maryland public policy based upon the, we're not gonna get away from this. Now that we have video, you're gonna be able to televise something stupid every day that in the course of history couldn't be done. Um, but cops, no matter what laws we pass, you're gonna be able to find a video of some cop either through stupidity or accident or mis whatever, doing something stupid every day. And I just think it'd be a mistake for us to base our entire public policy on that. Um, I do agree with you, we need to look at the policies. And of course, that's what my bill, the, the procedures on investigating misconduct. And, and, and there certainly have been enough cases in Maryland to warrant that. And that's certainly the bill that I have at the end of the hearing today. Um, there is, you talk about um, the, the most egregious cases. Well, certainly the most egregious cases, you would have to agree that there's always a compass liability. I mean, if I sat there and was a lookout and let you literally kick the crap out of somebody, I'm probably on the verge of accomplice liability uh, just in enabling them. Um, so certainly there's not without any remedy here. Um, well, where officers have been concerned, um, accomplice liability has not been a thing. It has rarely if ever been charged and they ha aren't, aren't convicted of that. And a, a, a case in point, a classic example is Freddie Gray where multiple officers were involved at different levels, but they were never charged with accomplice liability. Um, actually, they were never even charged with assault in that case, but, but nonetheless, um, they have not traditionally been charged with accomplice liability. Certainly that could be something that could be charged, but it is not something that prosecutors have used as a tool. So- yeah, but in that, in that case, you had people at, at separate, I mean, people at the arrest site were different from people at this transition site, were different people at that transition site. These people didn't even know they were all dealing with the same person in the chain of events. So that's, you know, you, you really got there to, to a, a, a case of, did you, did you adhere to your standards? There was no evidence that anybody intended to, to inflict grievous harm on anybody. I mean, whether they adhere to good police standards was always an issue of concern um, for some of those folks, but, but um, I don't see where that, that's really an issue at all. I don't see where this, this law has any relevance to the Freddie Gray case. I didn't remember seeing any testimony that anyone there observed another officer 
uh, engaged in uh, uh, abusive conduct and stood and watched that. I mean, maybe that was um, dereliction. Maybe people should have inquired further, but I don't see where you're putting this in the Freddie Gray context. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Chair. Awesome. Thank you, Senator. Okay, next we'll move on to Senator Sidnor and then Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a question for Senator Carter. Uh, just as with any criminal liability, a state's attorney uh, would have the ability to look at the facts and decide whether or not to, to charge, right? So, I mean, if the and, and, that and, and also, I want to point out that, you know, um, cases that are not felonies are not generally indicted. Um, it's possible, but usually um, charges are brought. But I know that Senator Cassidy brought up, you know, the indictment, which rarely happens if something is not considered a felony. And um, my, my, my two colleagues have made much about things being split second decisions. Uh, would, would you mind, do you, do you recall how long uh, George Floyd uh, lay being strangled and uh, that particular officer's colleagues watched? I believe it was 12 minutes. Would that, is that a split second decision? No, that it it certainly make? wasn't a split second decision. Okay. And, and in looking at the, the language uh, in 2109B, it, it talks about an officer who knows or reasonably should know that another office police officer is using excessive force. And when I'm looking at is using, uh, the way that I interpret it, it is not necessarily something that happened and I just witnessed it happen. I'm not gonna get prosecuted because I, because my fellow officer did something that I wasn't ready or expecting to see happen is something that is happening in my presence that I then don't make a decision to intervene that I know is incorrect. Am, am, am I reading that right? I, I believe you are. And I thank you for giving me the chance though to even um, just remind that, you know, we are, um, anticipating the training of officers on de-escalation. Um, so thus, they would then have that opportunity to de-escalate even before a situation gets to um, the excessive force where they're, they're, you know, then needing to intervene to stop something that's happened. And, 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 and I'm glad you brought that up because I, I would take it that them attempting to de-escalate is an intervention, correct? Yes. Thank you. I'm finished, Mr. Chair. Senator, uh, now we'll move on to Senator Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Senator Carter, for bringing these bills forth. Um, my concern is um, with the bill is the uh, penalty component. Um, and uh, just, just briefly for the record, um, I've, I've served in all, all capacities as an officer on the street, as a union president, you know, uh, representing the officers, and then, you know, as a sheriff of an agency where I had to deal with um, any and everything. Um, and uh, I certainly agree that uh, officers uh, know right from wrong. Uh, and I've had the occasion, um, albeit, um, uh, as difficult as it may have been because I grew up with most of those folks on that same agency. Uh, but I've had the occasion to, uh, um, you know, um, for those who, who didn't do what they were supposed to do, they'd have to uh, face the consequences. Uh, my challenge is that if a, if a law enforcement officer does not adhere to the rules and policies that, uh, um, that are set by the agency, there's an administrative process. Now, I, um, whether agencies and officers and uh, others, for everyone from the officer on the street uh, to the uh, agency head uh, adhere to uh, their duties and responsibilities, that's one thing. Um, the fact that if an officer 
um, does not um, uh, adhere to the policies to be sanctioned criminally. Uh, I'm having a bit of a, a, a challenge with that uh, because during my career, uh, my eight years as sheriff of Prince Louis County, uh, there are a number of folks who actually lost their jobs uh, because they did not adhere to the policies and procedures of the agency. Uh, so much to the extent that, you know, um, just to throw this in here, when I when I ran for another political office, the you know the the union did not support me because I I followed some certain certain rules. Oh, the rule. Um, I I like it. if you could expound on the penalty phase of this, and you know when be, before you do that, let me just say this. so. When an incident occurs that raises to the level of brutality or, or, or the like, uh, there's an investigation. It's not only an investigation by the agency, there's an investigation by the prosecutor's office. And if criminal sanctions are due, then the prosecutor's office uh, will bring those, um, those penalties, uh, criminal penalties. So I guess if, uh, and then once that criminal phase is over, uh, then that officer has to deal with the administrative process. And uh, again, folks have been dismissed from the agency. Folks have been demoted. Folks have been, um, you know, penalized. So I think my, my challenge is a, a penalty for an officer not saying, hey, Mike Jackson, you're going too far. Um, and then that officer facing criminal violations. Um, I think that the the attorneys, um, the state attorney's offices or the like, uh, uh, is, is where that should rest. I think we, the penalties should be administrated. I would love to work with you further on that, but that's where I stand. So I, I did already state this um, in answer in response to Senator Castley. There are some situations that rise to the level of needing um, a criminal sanction. I do believe that. Um, uh, acceptance by silence, complicity, collusion by failing to intervene in the serious bodily harm or death of another person definitely rises to that level of criminal sanction. There is data that shows that prosecutors um, have rarely brought criminal charges for officers for cases of assault, excessive force, um, homicide. It has happened when they have brought them the convictions have been um, few. And so I look at this as another tool to encourage officers to abide by their, not only their conscience, but by their training. Um, we hear a lot of times about the extensive training that um, we offer uh, throughout the state of Maryland. And um, I think you're even on the, the Police Training and Standards Commission um, which oversees this quality training that we anticipate officers to have. Um, I think that everybody agrees that it's critical over the last number of years that we need to enhance our training and they are trained on de-escalation. They are trained on intervention um, and they are trained on, on good character. Um, and so I believe this is not, you know, an outlandish uh, thing to have a potential criminal penalty for a failure to intervene, to watch your fellow officers brutalize, beat to a pulp, to death, another human being. Um, a similar thing happened in the case in Baltimore of Tyrone West, um, even before Freddie Gray and even before some of these other cases. There were multiple officers that did nothing as Freddie Gray was, um, you know, lost his life in, 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 at the hands of the law enforcement officer. I mean, and, and well, I mean, look, and, and again, I, I do not condone anyone doing what they're not supposed to do. Sure. Um, um, I, I think that I believe that the criminal penalty should rest with the prosecutor. It's my belief. I think that um, the fact that, um, you know, look, there's there's all types of training, uh, but there's also accountability at every level. There's a supervisor accountability, there's a management accountability, it's all the way up to the CEO of the agency. Uh, and, and, and we are a part of that accountability um, um, matrix as well. Uh, but I think uh, 
one of the challenges that I see uh, with what we're looking to do with reform, with police reform across the board, uh, albeit we need police reform, so do not get me wrong, is that, um, and maybe this is a stepping stone of where we are, we're starting with the officers that are on the street and yes, hold them accountable. But there's also another accountability component to this or several, which means the agency has to have in place and they do, but they also have to adhere to the policies and procedures that are in place. That goes for the supervisor of the squad that's on the street where this occurs, as well as to the managers and the internal affairs folks. And then the prosecutor has a role as well. Um, and I just uh, have a concern that if I do not intervene, that I'm facing a criminal penalty. Uh, and again, there's no excuse for that officer not to intervene. That officer uh, in most agencies already has the training to do that. Um, or understands or has the mentality or uh, has the directive to do that. Um, but I think, um, you know, the criminal penalty that derives out of that uh, should be established by the state's attorney or the, um, the appropriate uh, prosecutor. Um, so oh, we're, Senator, forward, we're, go. we're giving, um, we're giving the prosecutors another tool. And I just want to reiterate you know, in, in terms of those that want to remind me that I generally lean toward decarceration. Um, this is simply a maximum potential penalty. I've stated before, it's not even a felony. Um, this is another tool that prosecutors will have. And, 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 and Senator Jackson, I, I fully appreciate your position and, and even your concerns. I just wanna make it clear that standing by and watching the brutal beating of another human being is not just something that is, you know, a mistake. It's not something that should be excused. It is something where there should be both administrative and criminal sanctions, and that is my belief. And too long we've gone with having, not having the sanction, and that is exactly why so many families and victims have not been able to feel what they achieve, what they feel is justice. Well, okay. I, I I hear you. Um, I look forward to working with you. And I just want to say for the record that I don't believe any of that is okay either. So I just think that, um, you know, the, the, the legislation, I think the results of the legislation should not warrant the criminal penalties, but we can talk about that further. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you. Next we have Senator Bailey. Thank you very much. And, uh, I, I think uh, talking to the sponsor of the bill, I think I just heard you uh, say that the problem here is really with the attorneys and not the police officers. Now, there's a lot of police officers out there that would really appreciate that uh, that thought. But but I do think that when we talk about education and we talk about uh, police and we talk about this whole issue, that there's a couple things that uh, I think are important that uh, uh, we uh, need to discuss. And one is the thought, and uh, ma'am, you said that uh, when we talk felony murder, second degree murder, there was the fact that a citizen could be charged, which is exactly the case. But there is no exemption for police officers. We are held to a same standard and we are held to a higher standard the police are when they are doing that. So I think that it's important that when we look at that uh, criminal sanction, that that criminal sanction is there and it clearly uh, can be as we know, and um, I have seen in my own uh, agency and uh, other agencies, officers that were indicted they were charged criminally as a result of the investigations that their police department did when they found out that there were sanctions, they moved forward with that. The fact that this crime has criminal sanctions of more than two years, if an officer is convicted of it, you said, well, he won't go to jail, he might not do anything for a first uh, occurrence. This is no different than an officer lying. He will lose his job for his career and never be able to be reemployed. Uh, if he is convicted, because obviously he cannot carry a, a handgun. I didn't know if you were aware of that um, situation. I am, I'm aware of what is potential, but I'm also aware of the practical reality um, of so few officers being held accountable um, for complicity in these issues. Again, they're trained on it. It's a moral obligation 
as well as uh, a police professional obligation. And I do believe that failing to intervene where a human life hangs in the balance is um, uh, rises the level of a potential criminal penalty. That's and, what and, it ab and, and, and Senator, it absolutely is a criminal penalty uh, currently underneath our laws. I think the, the first thing that we need to remember here is we're talking about a very small uh, portion of police. And if something like this has occurred, I do agree that it is a crime. It should be looked at through the state's attorney's office. But the, but the thing is, we need to merely make sure that when we're talking about this, we're talking about Maryland officers and Maryland crimes, because our crimes in this state are, and our laws in this state are not that of the rest of the country. These sound bites on, and doing things on what ifs happened in the rest of the country does not apply to us here in Maryland. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and, and so really quickly, um, I wanna make it clear that I have mentioned um, George Floyd a number of times because that seems to have been what suddenly woke up the conscience of the Maryland General Assembly, even though we've had documented about 138 police killings um, I think since around the year 2000, that could be inaccurate, but it's close uh, based on the ACLU's report. Um, I want to make it clear that this is not some knee-jerk reaction to George Floyd. As I stated before, um, many years ago, about a decade ago, um, there were Black officers pleading with me for relief to fix our laws so that the processes could be more fair within individual agencies. And so what has happened in Maryland uh, is that these violations, these extrajudicial killings, the level of brutal brutality and excessive force rise to the level where we can no longer rely on individual agencies to simply police themselves in terms of violation of policies. They have risen to the level where we need statewide laws that make it clear that there will be uniform treatment of officers for various violations that have gone, for the most part, or, or for too often, unchecked. Yes, prosecutors can prosecute, but there is research, there are data, there's reports that show that there is reluctance on the part of prosecutors. Um, we're going to deal with another issue, I think, this session that we'll, we'll seek to fix that, because prosecutors themselves have experienced, at times, um, uh, lack of cooperation from the very law enforcement agencies that they, they need to receive information from in order to prosecute these cases. That's documented as well. And so all this is, is yet another tool so that we can bring some type of accountability with police officers that violate the public trust. And all of this ultimately is designed to restore the public trust, which has been almost irretrievably broken and it will remain broken unless we send a message to the public that we are willing to take the bold and courageous steps to hold officers that violate their oath accountable. I, I definitely agree with you that an, if an officer violates uh, what they have sworn their duty to do, we need to hold, hold them accountable. There is no doubt about it, but I disagree with the steps you're going about it. Right now, we clearly have the grand jury. We clearly have the ability to prosecute and indict and prosecute these individuals. And, um, and I look forward to working with you on it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Senator Bailey. Thank you, Senator Carter. I'm looking around for additional questions. All right, seeing none. So Senator Carter, you have one more bill in the docket here today. So we're gonna to go to uh, Senate Bill 419. So that concludes the testimony and the hearing for Senate Bills 50 and Senate Bill 482. We'll now move on to Senate Bill 419, Senator Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have one witness for this uh, bill. I just wanna make sure that he's been led into the, um, into the panel. But at any rate, um, so this next bill is no lack warrants. Um, thank you for your indulgence. I really appreciate your taking my bills. Um, I realize these are still contentious issues that we've been debating since September. We also heard this bill in September. It's very, very simple. It simply would eliminate no lack warrants in Maryland. 
Um, there are, I've, I've talked to the state's attorneys association. Um, I understand that they take a position that we don't need to completely eliminate no knock warrants, but they believe that we should simply have like another layer of supervision or oversight in the implementation or of, of no knock warrants. Uh, the reason that I believe they should be eliminated is because um, they don't really serve any legitimate purpose and they cause more harm than good when officers break into people's houses unannounced with no knock. Oftentimes, uh, the people are concerned that these officers are actually breaking in um, and they cause defensive actions where they need not be. Even with a um, knock, officers don't have to wait a period you know, a knock, a requirement of a knock doesn't require that an officer actually knock and then necessarily wait any, you know, exorbitant amount of time, but simply to put people on notice that they are coming into the house. And so back in September, when I presented this bill, I talked about Breonna Taylor. Um, I would believe that there was other testimony that was given about um, other, other people, other families, other children. Uh, Chairman Smith, you remember all the way back in um, the, the earlier 2000s with the, um, the situation with the mayor of Berwyn Heights um, and that issue that caused us to both try to get, you know, some type of recordation of the use of SWAT teams. So this is not a new issue. I actually think the General Assembly just um, made a, a, a misguided decision. And, and I think it was 2005 when we passed a law that um, would allow no-knock warrants um, the law already provides for situations of exigent circumstances and says that if you have probable cause and exigency, you don't have to have a warrant. So I don't think, I think that, you know, we're covered there. And um, I would also bring up the fact that at least two occasions that I know about um, officers broke into homes of people where there were children and the children were actually traumatized by the officers breaking into the house. So on the, the national level, we know of Breonna Taylor, but I can tell you that it's happened here, right here. Um, from 2010 to 2016, there were 81 civilians and 13 officers that died during SWAT raids, including 31 civilians and eight officers during the execution of no knock warrants. Half of the civilians killed were members of a minority. Of those subjects to SWAT search warrants, 42% are black and 12% are his Hispanic. Our criminal justice system is supposed to promote public safety and justice. No knock warrants are currently authorized under Maryland law, even though they clearly undermine those purposes. And during the investigation of the death of the Baltimore police detective of uh, Detective Souter, where there was a fishing expedition to find, you know, some mythological suspects. That is the case where a six-year-old was broken into with a no knock warrant while he was showering. And, you know, that is a type of trauma that will probably take a long time to, to overcome. So for those reasons, um, I will ask that we would move favorably on this bill. And um, I will defer now to my proponent from the Public Defender's Office, Stanford Fraser. All right, thank you, Senator Carter. Um, I know we have one favorable and then two favorable amendments. So first up, we'll have uh, Mr. Fraser. And I saw you enter the room. There you are. Thank you, Chairman, for having me, and thank you to the senators for having me in this hearing today. My name is Stanford Frazier. I'm a public defender in Prince George's County and work for the Governmental Affairs Division of the Public Defender's Office. I'm here to support this bill, which would eliminate no-knock warrants in Maryland. In 2020, no-knock warrants became a national issue with protests across the country after Breonna Taylor was killed by police officers while they were executing a no-knock warrant. Unfortunately, the problems with these warrants are not exclusive to the city of Louisville. As previously stated, in 2008, a SWAT team in Prince George's County conducted a no-knock raid of, a, of Chevy Calvo in Burren Heights, Maryland. During the raid, they shot and killed his two dogs. Afterwards, they found out that Calvo was the mayor of Burren Heights, Maryland. After this tragedy, law was passed to collect data on SWAT raids as well as executions of warrants in the state of Maryland. And there was years of good data that's been cited in various articles and books. Unfortunately, after the data collection expired, there was no follow-up legislation implemented to solve that problem. Because of that failure, in March 2020, the same month Breonna Taylor was killed, a Montgomery County man, Duncan Lemp, Lemp I apologize, only 21 years old, was killed while officers were executing a no-knock warrant here in Maryland. The time for research has passed, the time for half measures have passed, 
we must ban no-knock warrants now. Since the national moment, jurisdictions like the city of Louisville and the Commonwealth of Virginia have banned no-knock warrants. They join Oregon and Florida, which already banned no-knock warrants, as well as Utah, where a 2014 law bans no-knock warrants for the collections of only drug contraband. The problem with no-knock warrants is not that officers don't have to jump through enough hoops in order to get them. The problem with no-knock warrants is they allow officers to break into residence without warning, creating deadly situations for home residents and police officers alike. The rule of knocking and announcing has been in existence in English common law since at least the 1604. And we ask for the state of Maryland to continue that tradition by passing this bill that would ban no-knock warrants. All right, thank you, Mr. Frazier. Uh, always good to see you. Uh, next we'll have um, is Steve Kroll here. If not, we'll go with uh, Mr. Riley. I know you're, you're here, so we'll go with you. And then if uh, Steve gets here, then we'll, we'll toggle back over to him. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Joe Riley. I'm the state's attorney for Caroline County the legislative chair of the Maryland State's Attorneys Association. Uh, we are favorable with amendment on uh, this bill, uh, banning no-knock warrants. The amendment we would seek would allow for no-knock warrants in the cases where state's attorneys can review the warrants and provide uh, with the guidance and make sure that they are appropriately uh, used. Um, the arguments for uh, not having no-knock warrants and saying that police should knock and announce implies that if they knocked and announced, there wouldn't be occasions where they're met with violence and met with uh, some sort of uh, attack by the people that are uh, having the warrants served upon them. And that's just simply not the case. Sometimes, very rarely, but sometimes no knock warrants are the appropriate tool to use and a state's attorney available to uh, necess be necessary to approve these uh, very rarely used uh, tools would be appropriate to hopefully minimize the amount of damage that this bill seeks to uh, curtail. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Riley. Um, I do not, I don't think that uh, Mr. Kroll is here with us, so we're going to move on. Um, to, I see you, Mr. Gibson is. So, Mr. Gibson, you're up. Thank you, Chair Smith. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rich Gibson. I'm State's Attorney for Howard County, Maryland, and I want to begin by acknowledging the conversation sparked by the death of Breonna Taylor, who died in Kentucky on March 13, 2020, unnecessarily and most regrettably due to the actions of law enforcement during the execution of a no-knock warrant. I understand the calls for change in the wake of her death. However, the opposition to no knocks is mostly theoretical. While I and other prosecutors within the Maryland State Attorney Association agree the process of, of seeking a no knock warrant should be reformed to require approval by State Attorney's Office prior to obtaining the no knock warrant, an absolute ban on them as proposed in this bill places our communities and law enforcement who protect us in Maryland at risk, at great risk. Do we ban something simply because the negative result was achieved using that same process somewhere else in the world. No, obviously not. If that were the case, we'd ban air travel. People have died in mass getting onto planes due to pilot error, mechanical failure or malfunction and other problems that arise during flight. Yet we still fly because we recognize the overwhelmingly most flights are completed without incident and we understand the value of flight. The same is true in the execution of a no-knock warrant. You need to understand that no-knock warrants are utilized in two circumstances. One, when the police can factually support the belief that the interaction with the subject of the warrant poses a risk to the safety of the police or the surrounding community. Or two, when police can articulate and factually support the belief that announcing their presence will, will give the target of the warrant the opportunity to destroy evidence. Just two weeks ago in Howard County, Police officers were shot at when trying to execute a warrant, a search warrant. Now, luckily, they, they were not harmed because of the presence of ballistic glass, and no one was harmed in that instance. 
the, the reality is that in Howard County over the last 20 years, the last 20 years, we've had zero deaths due to execution of no-knock warrants. In the last two years in Howard County, we've executed over 100 no-knock warrants. The law, this law enforcement tool has absolutely resulted in the reduction of lethal drugs and guns on our streets. No-knock warrants, when used appropriately, make our communities safer, protect the lives of law enforcement, the people whose homes are being searched in the surrounding community. Banning no-knocks would lead to the harmful results and likely more losses of life than allowing no-knocks to continue and remain a tool, but placing reasonable restrictions on when and how no-knocks are obtained. For this reason, I'd ask that you give an unfavorable report to Senate Bill 419, but we do acknowledge that there is, there is need for change and we'd ask that it be amended. Thank you. Thank you, State's Attorney. It's always good to see you. I owe you a phone call. I'm gonna give you a holler um, soon. Absolutely. Uh, I see that, uh, Mr. Kroll, you're here, you're up next, if you're ready to go. There you go. I think you you are unmuted and if you can begin whatever you. Mr. Kroll, can you hear us? Yes, I can. If you can hear me now, I'm getting some feedback. I apologize. I'm going to make this very simple. I'm Stephen Kroll, the state's attorney coordinator for Maryland and the 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 executive director of the Maryland State's Attorneys Association. And I'm agreeing with Mr. Gibson and Mr. Riley, so I'll make it quick. Now I say I agree. We don't say me too anymore. I say I agree. So I agree. Fantastic. Okay, great. Um, I think then that completes the panel of witnesses for proponents and opponents. So now we can move on to questions from the committee. Uh, are there any questions from the committee? I'm scrolling through. No hands raised. So I know we've had this conversation, Mr. Kroll, and I haven't had a chance to talk about it with Mr. Riley or Mr. Gibson, but the, uh, the, in terms of how each jurisdiction, you know, goes through this process and, you know, what is required, what exactly the type of level of information that's on the form um, and the amount of time that a judge would actually spend reviewing and approving. Because I've heard some, you know, various information that these things get approved very quickly and that sometimes the information that is required is pretty sparse. So, for instance, you wouldn't know if a child or someone, an elderly individual were present in the house or frequented the house or the apartment, that type of information that would, uh, I think, you know, inform the judge's decision making. So if you could just speak to, I guess, your individual jurisdictions, like what, what information is required? And if you have knowledge of how long, you know, on average, just anecdotally, like a judge would review something like this. So a circuit court judge takes, I heard something like, you know, less than a minute to review some of these. So uh, I just w wanted to get your, uh, your take and opinion. Do you, who do you want to go first? Sure, Chair you, can go first. you can go first. Okay. Um, so in Howard County, it's, it's, it, we don't have the, the process that we're recommending, the MSA is recommending of, of requiring that it be reviewed by six attorneys um, is not in place in Howard County. It's done on a case by case basis. Every jurisdiction is different. So in Howard County, uh, the police will, will ask us to review warrants if they feel there's some issue or they want some extra eyes on it, but they don't have, it, it's not required of them to do it and they don't do it in every instance. Um, depending upon the complexity of the warrant, they're gonna have to list out, if they're taking a no-knock, they have to list out why they want one. They can't just say, they can't just check a box saying no-knock. They've got to articulate some rationale, some factual evidence they have that supports the understanding that there's either you know a, a real genuine risk of destruction of evidence or a real genuine genuine risk to the safety of the officers they also conduct the the officers that that execute uh search warrants typically conduct pre pre raid or pre action reports where they actually go out and they do what's called um i think it's called a study of life so they, they look and examine the person to, to to determine what their habits are what the who's in the house um, so is the home occupied by grandma and grandpa as well as the, the suspect um, or is it occupied by young children? Those kind of facts are generally um, captured beforehand. 
Uh, in terms of the time that judges take to review a warrant, it varies. Um, it's usually not hours, and oftentimes uh, warrants are, are time sensitive. So like we have information that this person has something there now and we're trying to act on it now. Um, so there's a, there's a time sensitivity that has to be calculated into it. It's usually not minutes. It can be if it's a very simple, succinct case, but it could also be, you know, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, it, it, it long enough for them to, re, to read, review, have a calculus in their mind of what, what it, first off, does probable cause exist to execute a warrant in the first place? And then secondly, do, have they articulated facts that would support no knock versus knock. So uh, the requirements for no knock, as my colleague stated, need to be separate from just the application in and of itself. And they need to have a different criteria that have to be reviewed and substantiated. Um, I also think it would be important to say that that should be confirmed on the scene before the execution of the warrant. You could have, for example, in your application, well, we saw individual X who were, who were searching for, along with uh, executing this warrant at their location, is known to be armed and dangerous. And therefore, we're requesting no knock. Okay. But we are on the scene. We're getting ready to execute the warrant, and person X isn't there. If that assessment is done at the scene, contacting the state's attorney and them saying, well, now I want you to, to do that knock and announce rather than no knock, I think that would be an important tool to be able to use as well, having it at the time of the execution. As to the time that a uh, judicial officer takes to review a search warrant, they're neutral magistrates. I'm not allowed to be in the room with them. I can speak to my experience as a law clerk uh, when I work for the judge, uh, for the Honorable Judge Daniel M. Long down in Somerset County, and I can tell you everything that was signed uh, was read thoroughly uh, word for word, uh, dot for dot, um, and rejected if uh, didn't meet the cause. So, uh, but, but anything other than that as a prosecutor, I would say would be purely conjecture on my part because I'm not in that room with that neutral magistrate when they're making that decision, obviously. You're teasing out some other reforms, I think. I mean, the, the typical application approval, again, and Steve, we talked about this, is what, like 10 days? And I know that you, know, you talked about kind of gathering intelligence and understanding that person's pattern of life, the subject's pattern of life, so you understand kind of who's coming and going and, you know, work and all that stuff. But, you know, that's another reform that I just think, so is it right? It is right that they're, they're, the application is good for 10 days, right? The approval is good for 10 days. Is that is that uniform across the state? Well, there's a staleness of a warrant. I don't know if there's an exact timeline uh, date certain that it ends by. But uh, the staleness of any warrant is something that must be, for a warrant to be valid, it has to not be stale. So that can facts change. I don't know if there's an exact timeline. I don't know if I'll defer to Mr. Gibson if he knows an exact date. Certain. I, I want to say 14 days, but I could be wrong. Okay. I want to give uh, Mr. Frazier just a second to respond, and then uh, I know that Senator Sidnor has a question. Anecdotally, as a trial attorney doing criminal defense work, there are often times where, for example, they're, pr they're printing out probation paperwork and a judge will announce, if officers have any warrants, can you come up and let me look through them? And I've witnessed, I've witnessed a judge review three or four different officers' warrants applications in the maybe five minutes or less it takes to print out probation paperwork. From a legal standard, you can include information saying, through my training and experience, this officer knows that drug dealers are likely to dispose of drugs if an officer announces their presence. And that could be enough information in order to get a no-knock warrant. Some judges may deny that, but some judges may approve that, just in my experience of seeing these warrants in my cases, as well as being in the courtroom when officers bring up warrants during open court during small lapses of time. This is very helpful. Thank you for that. That's great. OK, um, thank you all. Uh, so Senator uh, Sidnor, you're, you're up. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, what are the consequences uh, for those involved if there's uh, erroneous information uh, in, in a search warrant uh, like one of these? I mean, so if what occurred 
in Breonna Taylor's case happened in Howard County? Or, or, or like what, 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 what consequences would there be for those uh, parties involved? Would you like to answer that question? Uh, uh, any, any of the sta our state's attorneys. Uh, so I'll, I'll take a, a, a crack at the question. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Sidnor. Good to see you as always. Um, the, 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 is, the answer is that, that in the law, there's something called good faith. Right. And so if an officer, if the oftentimes the officer who who it's not all one person. So one officer will attest to the facts that support the the underlying warrant. And they have to affirm it, that that their investigation has led these things to be true. The judge will read that over based upon the judge's assessment of that. He or she will sign the, the search warrant if, if that judge finds probable cause exists. And then it could be no knock or knock, as we already said, depend upon if they establish the, the, the factual prerequisite of either, you know, extreme risk to the officers or surrounding community and or extreme risk and loss of the actual evidence. It's the fruits of the crime. Um, once that's signed, uh, the, the, there's a different police actor, which actually typically would engage in the, the actual kinetic action or search. Uh, of the of the um, the suspect or the suspect's residence or car or whatever it is that the search warrant's for, um, the the good faith in the law says that the acting officer, if they had adequate reason to believe that they had the authority to act, is lawfully acting in that in that instance. The warrant itself. If there's some argument, defense routinely challenges, it's called a Frank's hearing. If there's some argument as to the, the veracity of the actual search warrant itself, defense can challenge that and argue you know, for suppression, but good faith usually protects a lot of the actual findings. As to your question, which I think is separate from what evidentially happens, but I wanna try to answer that for you. Um, the officer, if they're found to be, you know, if they, if they, if they falsified something, if they acted in, again, if, if they acted in, to use a legal term, good faith, in their assessment, in their factual statements, and they end up not being true, that is substantively different than if the officer purposely lied in order to obtain the warrant. If they lied under, under you know, if they lied and, and made an affirmation, that's going to be a problem for them as far as uh, administratively, there are potentially the in theory theoretically perjury charges that can be raised against them. They could face both criminal and administrative sanction. We don't see that frequently, to be candid. Like we don't, there most typically, if there's an error, um, it is it is one that is made not with the design to do, to to misinform intentionally, but something that was left out or something that was misperceived in the the um the workup for the search warrant and joe i don't know if you want to add anything to that so if i can understand the senator's question a little bit better the uh erroneous i, I think that's kind of what it comes down to is it erroneous or is it false uh or, or, if you're or, or maybe something done by 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 omission that uh that the i mean all right, so that, that where you're going is where I'm getting at. Go so ahead. in the Taylor case, the, one of the tragedies with the Taylor case, of which there are many, is that nobody who was in the house was the topic of the, of the search, right? It was Taylor's ex-boyfriend who was the topic of the search. So in the criminal case, Taylor's ex-boyfriend would be charged. So what would this warrant execution, from my understandings of the Taylor case, there was no evidence that was found at the scene that would go to his case anyway. So as a criminal uh, sanction, i.e. would there, would the state be able to use the evidence in that particular case? I don't think it would apply because there was no evidence actually found. And if there was, it would all be as to the person not at the house. However, if in general, you're talking about an execution of a warrant at a erroneous address, or at an address that isn't doesn't have any probable cause. There are, of course, civil remedies that would be there uh, if you know you're make if you're clearly negligent. 
uh, and going into a house or that is wrong on the warrants or obviously if there's some sort of false information, I think you would probably have criminal penalties because you're attesting to that under a sworn affidavit. So that would be uh, criminal sanctions as far as that would go as well. And that would be something I know I would take personally very seriously as a administrator of justice if I had a law enforcement officer that was putting false information into a warrant that he swore to, that was something that we would take action with on uh, quite swiftly. And, and one last question. Um, uh, so the no-knock warrants, there is from what I'm hearing, uh, they're asked for if there's a possibility that an officer's life is at risk. And if there's a possibility of losing evidence, uh, in Mr. Uh, Gibson's uh, written testimony, you spoke about uh, fentanyl. Yes. And, and I'm curious if you, if you believe maybe that that's, if there should be a different standard uh, between the two, losing evidence or something like fentanyl, I mean, if they were to flush it down the toilet some might look at that as a success because now the fentanyl is not going out on the street killing anybody. You lost some evidence, <laughs> but it's not on the street now. Uh, should that be looked at differently than uh, an officer's life being at risk? Maybe different standard? So, so yes and no. The, 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 the issue is this. Yet that particular fentanyl was flushed down the toilet, but since there was no evidence that was seized supporting that this person was dealing fentanyl, they're gonna re-up, get more fentanyl and flood your community with a substance that's killing people in droves, right? And so the, the, the loss of the ability to hold accountable this person for the fentanyl they had, thus removing them from the ability to distribute fentanyl further in your community and seizing that fentanyl is the win. If they get away with the, inc the, the crime of the moment, the instant crime, by flushing it down the toilet, they're going to continue to poison your community. People are going to die, right? Um, as I said, additionally, you know, two weeks ago, I had officers in my jurisdiction that were shot at, right? These were headshots taken at these officers that were going to serve a warrant. But for ballistic glass, they'd be dead, all right? So, so... But that, but, that was, but that wasn't a no-knock warrant situation, was it? No, it wasn't. They were simply going to serve a warrant, warrant and right. as they're driving up, they get shot at. The, the, right. point, is, the point is that it's, it's what is the point? Dangerous. The point is that it's very, very dangerous. The point, uh, Senator Carter, good, good afternoon to you too, is that it's very, very dangerous to, to interact with individuals that don't want to be interacted with, and police are putting themselves and putting their lives in harm's way. We should, we should be we should be taking steps to, and measures to ensure their safety and the safety of everyone in the That's community. Why I was asking if there should be a different test or standard between the, the loss of evidence versus uh, a, a, an officer's life being, being at risk. Certainly the loss of life period is, is paramount. The loss of life in our community is paramount. Like that's that's a someone dying from an overdose because drugs weren't seized is a loss of life. Someone, an officer getting shot at and being exposed to violent death is a loss of life. So, I mean, so you're, or you're, 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 you're is it? So your your answer is no. <laughs> My answer is that is that I don't I don't disconnect the danger of fentanyl in our community. But what about from, marijuana? Maybe they flush down marijuana. Oh, we different. Totally different. Totally different. That's, that's, that's what I'm trying. To, that's what I'm so, trying to understand. So I'm not. No, I'm talking about. <laughs> the, I use fentanyl in my written testimony for a purpose. I'm not talking about marijuana. No one's talking about marijuana. No one is talking about marijuana. We're talking about lethal results, whether it be for officers when they interact, or the community members when they interact, or our citizens, our constituents, when they're exposed to the harm of of this contraband. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Uh, State's Attorney Richards Gibson. Gibson. Great, excellent. Cool. Thank you, Senator Carter. Senator Sidnor, sorry. Um, so, uh, Senator West, you're up next, and we have Senator Hedelman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Senator Carter, 
Um, you, uh, you may recall that when I presented my bill last week, it had a similar, well, it had a no-knock provision in it, but it didn't ban no-knocks. What it did was provide that no-knocks had to be approved not only by the, sup the superior of the policeman who wanted to get the no-knock, but also by the county state's attorney. So it adds two additional levels of review on the no-knock before the no-knock can be issued. Um, I noticed that in the same attorney general letter that I quoted from earlier, he also talks about no-knocks. And here's what he said. He said, no-knock warrants are an important tool to protect the safety of law enforcement officers. The level of scrutiny needed for no-knock warrants should be considered, perhaps requiring high level approvals within the police department and review by the state's attorneys. It sounds very similar to my bill, but cer certainly different from your bill. So my question to you is, do you disagree with the attorney general on this point? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, excellent. So now we'll move on to Senator Hedelman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wonder if I could ask um, Mr. Riley a question. Um, you, wrote, you raised the issue of Breonna Taylor's, the circumstances that um, enabled that tragedy. Um, and I, I'm wondering if you would agree that, well, I guess the question is, do you think it was just a, um, a pile on of errors that would have been caught in a state like Maryland or a circumstance like that could happen here, but for getting rid of no knocks, period? I don't know as if getting rid of no knocks would have saved Miss Taylor's life. Uh, Assuming that no knocks didn't exist, it would be knock and announce. And according to the officers, they did, but saying they did not, uh, a knock and announce could still involve some of the tragedies that we talked about with Ms. Taylor's case. Certainly, if given the time to do the research, I could certainly provide for this committee officer deaths and civilian deaths that resulted from not being announced. They're there, they're awful, but they happen. Um, so as to the Taylor case specifically, were there more errors than being a no-knock warrant? Was it a result of systemic racism in general? All of those are factors, but I don't think the simple solution of eliminating no knocks and going back in time says that Brianna Taylor is alive. Okay, a, a follow up. So, what you just said is that deaths happen as a result of knocking. Would, sure. would, would you, do you have any sense of whether um, deaths, and I would also put another category of mistakes, not not resulting in deaths, do, does that happen at an equal? level as they might, as they do with no knocks. So we can do the research on that. And I would think that would be the main issue, right? If uh, there is equal amount of injury and or death in a no knock versus knock and announce, it would argue that there isn't a necessity for the no knock. I, I think that is the Senator's point. So I would certainly uh, contact our partners and look into that. But I think what you will see is that there's less lethality in our no knocks than there is in our knock and announce. And I can probably defer to Mr. Gibson on that who might actually have those statistics for you if you, if you would allow him to answer. Hey, Mr. So, Gibson. So, I mean, in terms of like raw data, again, in, in, 20, in Howard County, in 2020, there were 54 no knocks executed. In 2019, there were 68 no knocks executed, right? Um, Again, in 20 years, we've never, zero times had any fatality, right? Uh, in, in 2020, we had 44 knock and announce. In 2019, we had 47 knock and announce, right? So we've, you have, in, in our jurisdiction in the last two years, you've got 100 plus no knocks. And again, in the last 20 years, you've had no incidences of anyone getting harmed. No fatalities, no injuries. 
No, I appreciate that. That's one jurisdiction out of 24. If somebody has that data and compares no knocks to knocks, I would like to see the data broken down by fatality and injury. If you have that. So I don't have it for every jurisdiction. I have it for Howard County. I have, I have some information related to Montgomery County. Hold on. Well, if somebody ha could get that from the state's attorneys association, maybe could get that statewide. I think that would be very helpful for this conversation. So thank you. Sure. Thank you, Senator Heldman. And actually that was uh, a perfect segue into my kind of the second line of questioning, which was that I think we need to kind of broaden the aperture of, of reform that we're considering, because if we were to go ahead and get rid of no knocks, then I suspect that people would just go for, you know, the knock and announce. And I think there's some real big problems with the knock and announce. And Mr. Riley, you kind of alluded to the, you know, you think that you've got data that suggests that the knock and announce is potentially more lethal than the no knocks. But one would also think that the knock and announce requires less scrutiny, one. Um, and then also, the knock and announce, I don't know how much, is it uniform for the amount of time that you've got to knock and then breach? Um, and, you know, you're, you're also talking about things that happen at three in the morning is, you know, is five, 10 seconds between the knock and breach enough time for someone to kind of get out of bed. And then you've got the element of plain clothes by, you know, uniform. I mean, there's, these are all of these elements that make, you know, the knock and announce very dangerous, depending on what time of day it happens and, you know, whether the officers are in plain clothes or not. We talked about this a little earlier that if someone was coming into my house with plain clothes three in the morning, um, you know, it, and I have my weapon close by, I mean, there's, there's going to be a problem, right? I mean, there's the interaction, it, the, the increase of uh, a chance for danger. I mean, it, it just, I think it, it just doesn't make sense to me. So I think that when we're considering getting away with you know, doing away with no knocks, I think all those applications just migrate to the knock and announce, which are, are problematic as they are. So. I guess I'd like your feedback on that. And, um, and then Mr. Frazier, if you want to chime in. So in, in, in terms of in Howard County, our warrants are served by our SWAT team. So they're wearing, um, you know, protective gear uh, and they, they are, they are, you know, it's emblazoned on them police everywhere. Uh, and, and so, so that to the, Chair Smith, to the to the issue of plain clothes, there's no in Howard County. There are there aren't any plain clothes officers executing uh, search warrants uh, in that way. Like that's not how they. Someone might a plain clothes officer might be the one who asks the judge for something, but the actual team executing is it's done by our SWAT team. I can speak to that issue. That, that's not uniform though throughout the state, right? I mean, there are jurisdictions in which plain clothes officers are breaching. Yeah, you know, in the middle of the night. I, I don't. I don't know the answer to the other twenty-three jurisdictions. I can't speak to that. I can only speak to Howard County related to that particular question you posed. Understood. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, I think that's just that's something for us to consider as we, we kind of go down the, the path here. Um, all right. Looking around for additional questions, seeing none. Thank you, Senator Carter, and thank you all. This has been very helpful. Um, so thank you for the time today. It's been great. Um, so that then concludes the testimony and the hearing for Senate Bill 419. We'll now move on to Senate Bill 61. Senator Lamb, our apologies. Thank you. I know you've been waiting patiently. Uh, so Senator Lamb, uh, you've got Senate Bill 61 and then Senate Bill uh, 234. Uh, we'll take 61 first. You're up. I think you have a presentation. Is that right? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we do. So if committee staff can bring that up. Um, I think we also have... Um, other members of the sponsor panel, Julie Bainbridge, who's a constituent of mine, Amanda Lay, and Julian Aldridge. Um, so we can be in um, now. Um, you see the presentation before you. Good afternoon. It is afternoon. Um, thank you, um, Chairman Smith and members of the committee to allow me to testify on behalf of SB 61 for the record, Clarence Lamb Center in District 12. Um, if you can advance to the next slide, please. Um, so during the 2019 legislative session, we did pass um, Chairman Smith's uh, bill to require child changing tables in all new or substantially renovated public buildings. After this bill um, had passed, um, Ms. Bainbridge, my constituent, contacted my office to share that she had a son with a disability that requires his parents to change him in the community. 
And because of the lack of adult changing tables, uh, and you know, many of us have constituents just like Ms. May Brainbridge's family who are limited in their ability to go out and be able to fully participate in um, community type activities because of these limitations. Um, similar to the chairman's bill, this bill ensures that Marylanders can safely and uh, sanitarily care for their family. Uh, currently, Marylanders are forced to change their loved ones on the floor of bathrooms and cars, um, otherwise, um, you know, kind of non or in otherwise public places or just have to stay home because they don't have the facilities to be able to do that. Next slide, please. So this bill is a very simple bill. It just requires that current requirements for when a baby changing table is needed and requires that the table used be also suitable for children and for adults. The bill includes an exemption uh, if installing an adult changing table would violate the Americans for Disabilities Act or if it would not be practical. So there are exemptions built into here. When an adult changing table can't be installed, the child table would still be required. Um, and as a reminder, the current changing table law applies to new buildings and buildings undergoing substantial renovations. Um, it's not require retrofitting currently existing buildings that are not going under undergoing any changes. Table must be put in a gender neutral bathroom or one table must be put in a men's bathroom or a women's bathroom if that's how it's set up in the building. Next slide, please. Uh, similar to the child changing table bill, um, SB 61 seeks to ensure that Marylanders have a safe and sanitary places to care for their loved ones. Bill will also improve the accessibility um, of our community and help ensure that Marylanders with disabilities are able to fully participate in our community and also enjoy um, the amenities and everything else that the state has to offer. Adult changing tables are also more accessible to parents with disabilities because many child changing tables are simply too high for individuals using a wheelchair to be able to change their child. Um, so you see some of the, the examples of these adult changing tables um, are shown. These tables can be as simple as a sturdy table or can fold down from the wall to save space. We have had conversations with um, DGS regarding the fiscal node and have made a few changes based on those discussions. Um, as in last year's bill, the Department of General Services was required to maintain a list of changing facilities, but now that's been actually reassigned to 211 which is better situated to provide Marylanders with this information. Uh, DGS also had some concerns about local building inspectors being responsible for deciding exemptions. Uh, the bill was drafted this way to match current law, so it's existing law, but I'm open to amendments to give DGS some more control over how these exemptions would come forward and, and be decided upon. The fiscal note uh, discusses the possibility of costs up to $150,000. Um, per installation, the bill does have a practicality amendment in it, which I believe would also help prevent such a scenario, but I'm open to tightening that language in some way if we can find a way to do that. Um, there have been some increases in building costs associated with this bill, but I, or there could be some, um, but I'm thinking that these tables are more similar to um, ADA required elevators and ramps, um, where initially there was some um, resistance to elevators and ramps because they were seen as expensive modifications that were being made for people with disabilities, but we've also made our communities more accessible for everyone and now are really just considered standard in public buildings and facilities. So with that, um, ask for a favorable report, happy to take any questions and turn it over to other members of the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I think the other members are, we could if we could start with my constituent, Julie Bainbridge, if Ms. Bainbridge could start. I believe she's in this. Hi, sorry about that. Oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> Hi, good to see you again. Hi, nice to see you. Um, thank you for having us. My name is Julie Bainbridge. I'm the parent of uh, Charlie Bainbridge, and we appreciate this opportunity to speak. Uh, to Bill 61 um, on behalf of my son, Charlie. I'll try to be brief and uh, touch again on some of the things um, Senator Lamb explained uh, about, about why this is an important bill. Uh, first, the most interesting thing we have found is how unaware people are of how much our lives are affected by not having public access to bathrooms. When I describe Charlie's life and how he is limited to activities in the community because his daily schedule is hindered by the fact that he can only use the bathroom at home, or he will have to remain in a soiled diaper until we return home. So the friends and 
fam interested parties are always surprised and saddened, as well as completely supportive of this important initiative. <laughs> so when Charlie was a baby, um, you know, we went everywhere with Charlie and we traveled out of state for vacations to see family. And then when he was a bit older and outgrew baby changing tables, we would have to get more creative and literally find things like a picnic table or a patch of lawn in a far corner of a parking lot where we would lay down blankets um, and hope no one could see him. And this was somewhat okay when he was younger, but as an 18 year old young man, it's not appropriate. Um, he deserves the privacy and dignity afforded to anyone else by providing a safe and sanitary options for going to the bathroom while out in the community. And unfortunately, our only, you know, the alternative is often to have him sit in soiled disposable briefs until we do get home. And since we are not comfortable doing that to someone we love, um, Pre-COVID, we were sadly becoming a family where one parent often would stay home with Charlie while the other parent would take our other child to events and on trips uh, or limiting our activities to very short distances and time frames, which was leading to greater social isolation for Charlie, as well as <laughs> denying the opportunity for others to meet Charlie. Um, so I think we can all agree this year how awful it is to feel like you can't leave your home and how isolating and lonely it feels to not be around others. And so once life is back to normal, this bill could be you know, a great beginning and a catalyst for improving access to people with, you know, with disabilities and giving them the same basic rights as all of us. So I wanted to be brief, um, but I hope that painted a very obvious picture and uh, happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Uh, appreciate your willingness to appear here. Um, next on the panel, we have uh, Amanda Lay. Is Lay on? Oh, there you are. Um, I think you're muted. You might need to unmute yourself. I see. There. Oh. <laughs> you were just unmuted for a second. If you want to try that again. There we go. Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Lay. I'm pleased to be here as a member of the Maryland Developmental Disabilities Council. I was born with cerebral palsy. Due to my physical disability, I require personal hygiene support, including adult pads to manage my personal needs in the most dignified way because I am unable to use the restroom without the support of others. My disability does not stop me from participating in activities in my community. I spend my days working in a part-time job, hanging out with friends, and enjoying the same benefits of the community as you do. Yet, it becomes a challenge when there are not changing facilities that can accommodate my needs. Being placed on the floor in order to have my personal hygiene needs cared for is very hard and is not an option. Since I use a power wheelchair, public restroom stalls are not large enough to accommodate my wheelchair. Many people with disabilities are in a similar situation due to the nature of their disability. In order for all of us to meaningfully, to meaningfully engage in all activities, we need access to changing facilities that make it possible for our personal support needs to be met. I believe that making adult changing tables available in state buildings that are renovated or new is a good start to meeting personal hygiene needs in a gracious and dignified way. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Lay. Is there another proponent? Uh, yeah, there was one more, uh, Jillian Aldridge. There we go. Barrow, Maryland, and I'm here today to talk to you about what it means for my brother to be able to go places and do things without having to worry about the bathroom. First, let me tell you about his bro my brother. His name is Mark, but we like to call him Mighty, and he has the best smile. He loves Hamilton, traffic signs, and all kinds of music, and sometimes he has accidents. We try to go places and do things, but it's hard because new things are scary for him, and bathrooms can be even scarier, especially when there's no place to change him. 
One day I might have to help my brother and I hope this won't be such a problem. And if we don't have adult changing tables, we won't be able to be out with the world, with everyone else and Mighty can't share a smile with the rest of the world. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Aldridge. And I believe Rachel London is next. Is she here? Senator? Yes. Yes. Yes, she is. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Rachel London. I'm the executive director of the Maryland Developmental Disabilities Council. I am also the chair of the Developmental Disabilities Coalition. You have our written testimony, both of those organizations' written testimony. The DD Council is a statewide public policy organization that works to advance the inclusion of people with DD in all facets of community life. This bill does just that. I am not going to repeat what you've just heard and certainly cannot do it justice that Julie, Amanda, and Jillian did. However, I do want to point you to a couple of things. Um, yes, it is well accepted and expected that people are meaningfully included in their um, in all of the activities that we offer. I wanted to raise that um, five other states have in fact passed legislation like this. 11 are considering uh, similar legislation. And in fact, right here in our backyard, BWI has installed 12 adult changing facilities in 12 of their family restrooms. So we know that this can be done. Certainly it costs more. Um, I remember when Chair Smith, um, baby changing bill, uh, I think they were quoting about $400 for those baby changing stations. These do cost more, um, but we are talking about renovations and newly built buildings. And so when you do it that way, um, not only are the benefits clear, but the costs are kept down. Um, and so this is, as all as you've heard before, and I am not going to repeat, critical for people with disabilities um, to meaningfully participate in all of the activities and critical that they know where these facilities are located. Um, and 211 Maryland will, in fact, keep track of that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Lamb. Are there any more witnesses? Any opponents? Any committee questions? Seeing no questions, that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 61. Thank you, Senator Lamb and all. Thank you. So I have a second bill too that I think we were going to do right after this. And that's Senate Bill 234. 234. Senator Lamb, you're on. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think as part of this panel too, I have uh, uh, Alvaro Bedoya from the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law. We have George Escobar from CASA and Luz Castro um, as well, who um, I think will have the assistance of a translator too. Um, I can go ahead and begin. Um, thank you committee staff for bringing up slides. Uh, good afternoon committee. Uh, for the record, Clarence Lamb Center in District 12. Um, if you can proceed to the next slide, please. Um, as many of you have experienced, um, since I think almost everyone had the driver's license these days, the Motor Vehicle Administration collects a lot of data when you apply for a license, including obviously your picture, physical description, and, and data, um, home address, as well as documents for proof of identity and residence. Uh, undocumented immigrants in Maryland are also eligible for real ID non-compliant driver's licenses. These are really driver's licenses that are not real ID compliant. As part of the application process for MBA, um, they may also collect uh, this long list of information that I just described, um, and that's also shown um, in the chart on the right side. Next slide, please. Um, according to a, a 2019 Washington Post report, uh, the U.S. Immigration Customs Enforcement Agency known to have completed facial recognition searches on driver's license databases in Utah, Vermont, and Washington. Um, next slide, please. Uh, in Maryland, um, ICE has the potential direct access to personal data by request through the MBA. We also know um, that ICE has indirect access to personal data 
uh, via the Maryland Criminal Justice Dashboard, which is a statewide database that includes more than 7 million driver's license photos that are available for facial recognition searches. Um, I know a few of us in the legislature have had the opportunity to be able to view this information. We've actually visited uh, the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services, uh, Senator Lee is one of them who also traveled with me and some members of the House over to actually view the system. In the system, um, ICE agents can access this database using their logins to NICS, the National Instant Criminal Background Check System. The Department of Public Safety and Corrections has confirmed that over the past two years, ICE agents have saved at least 57 facial recognition sessions from this database. And those are only that we know, because it's important to note that only the session, these, this only counts the sessions that were saved. Um, and each session can include multiple searches and obviously doesn't include any of the sessions that weren't saved that we don't know about. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, this really came to light and why Senator, Senator Lee and uh, myself and others were looking into this is that Maryland is one of the states with the most unrestricted federal access to uh, MVA data of all the states in the US. Um, as far as we know, Maryland is the only state where ICE and other federal agencies can actually directly log in. There's no screening process at all to the state's driver's license photo database and perform facial recognition searches. Next slide, please. Um, this unrestricted access raises many concerns, including a lack of monitoring, as these searches can occur without oversight from um, the Department of Public Safety because uh, the, these federal um, agents have the ability to go directly into the database. There are also concerns about the accuracy of facial recognition technology. Um, studies have shown that uh, this technology is oftentimes less for African Americans, Asian Americans, and um, some others. And this increases the risk of misidentification. I know this is a issue that this committee has been examining. Senator Sidnor has a particular interest in this too. Um, this unrestricted um, access is also a threat to privacy. There's no public notification that information collected by MBA may be disclosed to ICE or other federal agencies. And lastly, I'm concerned that this also represents a breach of trust that we made years ago to uh, folks that may be undocumented that want to seek a driver's license. As um, some folks um, may recall, years ago, um, the legislature had moved forward with being able to grant these individuals um, the equivalent of a, of a driver's license. And we were encouraging these undocumented individuals to do so, so that they could legally uh, be driving with a license. And the fact that this information now is being um, uh, left open for um, search by federal agents um, for um, a purpose that's very different than what we committed to uh, these individuals years ago um, is concerning. Next slide, please. Um, this issue does, however, affect all of us, that we are all having our data routinely searched by federal agents without direct state oversight because they are able to go directly in the system. You don't just have to be a person of interest uh, to be selected based on facial recognition searches. You only have to look like the person um, of interest because it's just based on facial recognition. Next slide, please. Many other states um, have taken action to protect their constituents' data. Um, particularly rising out of this concern. Eight states prohibit facial recognition technology um, use on uh, MBA data. 29 states do not provide um, MBA data to federal um, facial recognition databases. Um, three states, California, New Jersey, and New York, have taken direct legislative action to prevent ICE from using uh, the MBA or, or their DMV data. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, this bill would require federal agents to present a warrant for cr a criminal investigation prior to obtaining access to the MVA information or personal information from other state agencies. It would also require the MVA and other state or local agencies that receive data requests from federal agencies to report data on the number and nature of um, these requests. The reason the bill has been expanded to include all state and federal agencies ensure that we cover any possible access um, that ICE has to use Marylanders driver's license information um, for civil immigration enforcement. However, the bill still only applies to civil immigration enforcement and excludes criminal investigations with a warrant. So there's two really important points here that um, this only applies to civil immigration enforcement. Um, 
uh, criminal investigations, um, you know, that have a warrant will still be able to access the database. Um, and number two, there's a reporting element to this bill so that we actually know how often this is occurring. Because right now there's no, there's no good trail or reporting of how often this is being done. Next slide, please. Uh, the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services houses some of the databases that federal agencies use to access the MBA data. Um, the Department of Public Safety claims um, that they have an inability to know which, which agencies are actually accessing the records. However, um, the current Maryland law suggests that the department should be maintaining a record of when and to whom they disclose this data. Uh, the department is not tracking who is accessing Marylanders' data. That, you know, to me in itself is concerning. We, as a state, have made a commitment to our constituents that non-state entities will not be able to access these records without a legitimate reason. Next slide, please. Um, so this year, um, with this bill, as you recall, there was a bill last year that did make it to the floor, um, but was a casualty of the pandemic, did not proceed further. Um, we modeled uh, this year's bill after that one, made some improvements in, in uh, talking with stakeholders that were involved and have introduced um, a sponsor amendment that would, um, number one, clarify language to remove the distinction between criminal and civil immigration enforcement because immigration enforcement is by definition civil. Um, number two, include the definition of the law enforcement agency. Number three, add language stating that MVA and other state agencies cannot sell personal information to data brokers or other agencies. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we believe that there are practical ways to implement this bill. I think that's also concerned that if this were to go into effect, how would public safety be able to account for this? Number one, dashboard access could be changed to require logins by specific people rather than open access through all the NCIC logins that are uh, currently able to directly access the database. Um, the department could also dedicate limited personnel and attention to monitoring uh, access by users with the NCIC logins. Um, really, this is important data, and so that the least that we can do as a state is to be a custodian of it, and that includes the department as well. We met with the department and are aware that the bill um, as written may unintentionally restrict database access for some of their employees. We're actively working with them on an amendment that we hope will address this issue. There's also a second concern that we were made aware of by the Port of Baltimore and BWI who are concerned that the legislation could limit their ability to work with uh, Customs and Border Protection for security purposes. Uh, that was obviously not our intention. Uh, we were willing to amend the bill language to make that clear. Uh, we had a meeting with the Port Administration and MAA earlier this week, but um, have, they have not been able to actually provide language that would help clarify this issue. Uh, we'll continue to work with them on this to try to find um, some way to resolve that specific concern. Um, in addition, we are also aware that some agencies are concerned that under this legislation, they would be restricted from sharing data with federal agencies unless they are 100% certain that the data will not be used for immigration enforcement. Uh, we do not intend for this bill to require complete certainty on the behalf of state agencies. Really, we would just like them to be able to act in good faith to prevent data from being accessed for the sake of immigration enforcement. This could be accomplished, for example, by adding an attestation or a screener to the databases, asking federal agents to indicate that they will not use the data for, for immigration enforcement purposes. So in closing, um, you know, the bill will help protect all drivers all drivers across the state from unnecessary intrusion from the federal government and will protect all Marylanders from having their data searched by federal agencies without uh, justification, without a warrant. Uh, for these reasons, I urge a favorable report. Um, and again, uh, the bill did pass out of JPR last year. Appreciate all the collaborators, including Senator Lee, who helped work on this bill too. Uh, thank you for your time and consideration. Happy to pass along to, to other uh, members that are on the sponsor panel. Thank you, Senator Lamb. Your primary witness. Uh, I think next we have um, Mr. Bedoya from the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law. Hi, folks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Madam Chair, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, my name is Alvaro Bedoya. I'm testifying on behalf of the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Rockville, Maryland, where I live with my family. Um, to add to what Senator Lamb uh, uh, just shared, in the months after Maryland uh, let undocumented residents apply for driver's licenses, 40,000 people showed up at the MVA and handed over their name, their address, their date of birth. 
Uh, all of this being information that if it were to get in the hands of ICE could result in them being arrested and deported. Uh, but they trusted the MVA. And so they handed over all of this data. Uh, and we're here because uh, unfortunately that's exactly what happened. Uh, ICE, uh, uh, soon after these licenses became available, ICE started searching through all of that data to find and deport people. Uh, and ICE also started scanning all of our faces, all of the drivers uh, in Maryland, not just those with standard licenses, again, to find individuals to arrest and deport. Um, ICE is using searches to pick up people like uh, Jose Santos Quintero Hernandez from right here in Rockville. This is a father of five, been here decades, not once had a run-in with the law. Uh, agents showed up at his home, knocked on his door, his kid answered. Uh, uh, and as they were taking him away, the agents told him, because you got a driver's license. Uh, this was used to pick up Giovanni Rivera in Catonsville. Uh, again, a uh, father of a young boy, three years old, uh, uh, not once had a run-in with the law outside of a prior attempt uh, uh, to cross the border. Uh, and the agents in this case had a photo of his license in their hands uh, when they uh, arrested him on his way to work. Um, these searches are run with no warrants, no transparency, no accountability. What do I mean by that? Um, no one at these agencies can tell us how many times ISIS scanned our faces. Uh, no one at these agencies can tell us how many times ICE has searched through our addresses. Uh, and we know this because when Senator Lamb, Senator Lee, uh, when, when, when we have asked these questions, um, the answer has either been, we don't know, or respectfully, the answer has been uh, the agencies effectively pointing at each other and saying, not it, you know, this is not our responsibility. So, and to add to what Senator Lamb just said, these searches aren't just effectively lawless and, and, and effectively secret. Uh, they're also biased when it comes to face recognition. The National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, in Gaithersburg did this extremely comprehensive study, uh, 100 companies, a little under 200 algorithms, and found that the vast majority of them put uh, women, African Americans, Asian Americans at risk of identification. There's actually a case of a young woman from Towson, college senior, woke up uh, uh, misidentified as the suspect in a terror investigation by a different system, not the Maryland system, but I think it's still on point today. Uh, and exactly as Senator Lamb said, um, any ICE agent, despite these biases, any ICE agent in the country can log into our database and scan all of our faces by virtue of having credentials, not from the state of Maryland, but from the FBI. And uh, I've been studying face recognition uh, for about a decade. Uh, uh, my center has been studying face recognition for about six years. We are aware of no other system in the country uh, where this is the case. Um, uh, this bill does four things to fix all of this without impeding criminal investigations. Uh, first, it makes federal agents get a warrant before they can, for immigration enforcement purposes, search our data held by the MVA or another state agency. Uh, second, make sure that federal agents can't go around that warrant requirement by buying the data from a middleman or a data broker, third party that's bought this information. Uh, uh, third, it makes sure that ICE doesn't have direct access to be inside of our databases uh, um, that hold our information. They always are gonna have to go to and through state officials with a warrant. Uh, and finally, it makes sure that Maryland agencies report on how many requests they get from ICE and how many they answer. Um, this is a common sense measure. Uh, there's precedent for it. If we were to pass it, uh, as we were on the cusp of doing last year, but for the pandemic, uh, uh, in this case, we'd now be not the first, not the second, not the third, but the ninth state to uh, require a warrant from ICE before they search our DMV photos. Um, uh, and uh, uh, as uh, was just discussed, we've written it to try to avoid uh, uh, a couple of the problems that have come up, uh, 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 at least one other jurisdiction in New York. And I agree with Senator Lamb that um, I think the bill could probably uh, not get an MPA's way. Uh, uh, as is, but if, if they require an amendment, it could easily be done. The intent of this bill is categorically to not get in the way of commerce uh, and not get in the way of customs uh, enforcement, which is separate from immigration's enforcement. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, Center on Privacy and Technology uh, at Georgetown Law urges you to support the bill and report it favorably. Uh, we thank you for your time and would be glad to answer your questions. Excellent. Senator Carter, I'm back now if, if you want. If not, you're good to go. But uh... Um, are we, you, oh, you got the, all right, all right. my apologies. Thank you, Senator Lamb for uh, indulging us here. People were jumping from meeting to meeting. Um, so next we have, uh, are you still going down? You're, Mr. Escobar is next. That's correct. Floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Chair and uh, members of the committee. Uh, thanks. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is George Escobar, and I am Chief of Programs and Services at CASA, the largest immigrant organization in the Mid-Atlantic region. More than 90,000 of our members are residents of Maryland. As a matter of fact, CASA experienced one of its greatest increases to its membership base uh, during its work assisting members and benefiting from the historic Maryland Highway Safety Act that we heard about before. Now, this allowed all individuals, regardless of immigration status, an opportunity to obtain a limited use driver's license and an identification. This was a pivotal immigrant and human rights victory for a significant part of your constituency. During that time, tens of thousands of members engaged with the organization to enthusiastically receive orientations about how to apply for the license and receive assistance on filing their state and federal taxes, which were requirements of the act. Simultaneously, the MVA worked very closely with us in ensuring a smooth process. We're very receptive to recommendations on how to adjust their service models to best provide the opportunity to as many as possible. But unfortunately, that incredible work was undermined by an abuse that was so clandestine that few of us really imagined it would actually occur, which is why we were caught off guard when we first heard reports almost seven years ago of Maryland residents with no prior criminal records being summarily detained by ICE by ICE agents who were holding MVA pictures in their hand while they're committing these arrests. We know now, thanks to Alvaro's work and, and many others, that ICE currently has limitless access to privileged data collected by the state, using, among other tools, as we heard, facial recognition software that has proven to be racially biased without submitting any kind of formal request to identify what they're doing, who they're looking for, and why. As a result, this tactic has targeted fathers, mothers, students, workers, detained on their way to work, church, or school, separating them from their families and communities from where they live for decades, with their only crime being that they trusted the MVA enough to apply for a license. So at this critical time when we're facing a global pandemic in which we have to ensure our government at all levels functions with transparency, so we incentivize all to come forward, to cooperate in massive government-led initiatives, such as COVID testing, contact tracing, vaccinations, we got to make sure that the vital information that all of these individuals are being submitted submit are not subject to warrantless searches. This bill is really a common sense measure that once implemented will do nothing to implement the work of law enforcement and the execution of legal searches where, where war warrant is served. I mean, we've heard the evidence. It clearly supports enactment of this policy. We can't do anything to correct the damage this practice has already brought, but we can do a lot to, to prevent future strategies. So, CASA strongly urges a favorable report. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Escobar. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Mr. Castro. Mr. Castro has a, he, he has a translator, but I the translator was in the meeting and I'm not quite sure where the translator went. Okay. Do you want to go to the next witness? To uh, Hamza Ewing. Mr. Ewing, you're up. Thank you, Honorable Chair Smith and members of the Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee. My name is Hamza Ewing, and on behalf of the Council on American Islamic Relations, I thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill 234, also known as the Driver Privacy Act. CARES America's largest Muslim civil rights and advocacy organization. Nearly 10 years ago, when the Maryland state legislator passed laws extending driving privileges regardless of immigration status, it greenlighted significant economic growth, improved road safety, and kept hardworking families together in our state. This measure enabled immigrants who needed to drive, for example, for gainful employment, the ability to do so in a legal and regulated way. It also helped to increase spending raised state revenue, and boosted our economy. Last year, it was revealed that Maryland is one of four states that allow ICE to comb through the MVA's database of registered drivers to search out undocumented immigrants without state or court approval. In fact, according to reports, the MVA began sharing all driver's license and identification card images with the Maryland Image Repository System in 2011 a database of over 10 million driver's license photos from the state MVA and Maryland State Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services, which ICE can access. According to the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, Maryland's system is one of the most broad and expansive in the state. 
Several states now have provisions to limit or prohibit disclosure of motor vehicle information to ICE, which includes Vermont and Hawaii. It's time to add Maryland to that list. Passing Senate Bill 234 will help avoid setting a dangerous precedent for the violation of civil liberties and help prevent government overreach while keeping families together and boosting our state's economy. We thank Senator Lamb for his leadership on this bill and CARE respectively urges a favorable report on this measure. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. All right, so that, um, Sandy, I don't know if we have um, Ms. Castro's translator up. If not, we're gonna move to the opposition panel. I um, have tried to reach out and I, I cannot get a hold of the translator. No worries. Thank you then. Uh, well, we'll take Ms. Castro's testimony, uh, written testimony under consideration, and we'll move on to the opposition panel. Uh, Mr. Tu, I see you popped on. Uh, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, great to see you again. Um, so my name is Chen Tu, um, and I am a legal immigrant and uh, U.S. citizen residing in uh, Rockville, uh, District 15. I'm here to testify against um, Senate Bill uh, 234. I feel like immigration regulation policy are not uh, in uh, state's responsibilities. Um, and the, the uh, state should not be uh, kind of interfere and let alone sabotage uh, federal law um, enforcement in this area. As a Maryland taxpayer, and US taxpayer, I expect every level of the government to work together uh, to protect me as a taxpayer, not um, engaging in sabotage against each other. Um, and uh, uh, this is just not how a efficient and effective government work. So I heard from the, uh, the foresight say, building a trust, how come? How about building trust uh, from, like, from me? I trust you guys to protect my interest. But now you guys are actively protect people who are not here legally. They should not, they're not supposed to be here. And you're doing all these things to benefit the illegal aliens. What about the US citizens? You're supposed to, and you swear to protect, right? Uh, and and Government should really work uh, together to actually provide a, a service that we, des we deserve. Like I give you an example. Um, what if federal uh, department of transportation, transportation plan to build an interstate highway through Maryland? Should Maryland State Department of Transportation said, I'm gonna withhold my state highway information from you. Um, does that sound reasonable? I mean, sounds to me, it's ridiculous. So I feel like um, whoever proposed this law is just like, um, you should tell your constituents, report them back that your act will protect illegal alien. And, um, you know, like just not working for the honest working US taxpayers and your constituents. Therefore, I'm against this bill, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Tu. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Green. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Smith, Vice Chair, Walt uh, Vice Chair Walt Stryker, and members of the Judicial Proceedings Committee. Uh, my name is David Green. I'm an acting assistant warden at the Dorsey Run Correctional Facility with the Department of Public Safety. Uh, I'm here today to testify on Senate Bill 234, which seeks to restrict access of state and local databases to an individual acting on behalf of a law enforcement agency. Uh, Section 3-523 of Senate Bill 234 proposes new language that stipulates that an agency operating a law enforcement database must limit that access to law enforcement officers or individuals acting on behalf of a law enforcement agency. Uh, this would have a significantly detrimental effect on case management specialists, parole and probation agents, and many other departmental personnel not considered law enforcement who rely on access to this information to carry out their essential duties. 
I have spent 14 years in case management, which includes time as the director of case management for the department. Uh, case managers and parole and probation agents are tasked with the development of case plans that support rehabilitative efforts. The development of a successful case plan is reliant on access to criminal justice databases. Without that access, we're not able to identify the criminogenic and other risk factors that lead to criminal behavior, rendering it impossible for us to develop a meaningful plan, which makes it less likely that the offenders under our supervision will be successful on release. Uh, Additionally, we lose the ability to review the totality of an individual's criminal history. Um, I need to know, for example, if an individual has a history of crimes of violence, uh, a factor that would indicate that person may not be suitable for community-based programs, for home detention, or suitable for work release. Parole and probation agents would lose their access to court and other judicial information, eliminating their ability to identify the individuals under community supervision who may have active warrants or other pending charges. To ensure public safety, we need every tool available at our disposal, and the passage of 234 would result in a significant access restrictions of a vast number of our criminal justice personnel. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, uh, and that's all I have. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Green. Um, next, we have uh, Ms. Beskid. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Smith, Vice Chair Waldstriker, and members of the Judicial Proceedings Committee. My name is Jennifer Beskid, Acting Deputy Director of the Office of Government and Legislative Affairs for the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. As Assistant Warden Green has stated, Section 3525, or I'm sorry, Section 3523 of Senate Bill 234 proposes limited access to databases maintained by the state and local law enforcement, as well as databases maintained for law enforcement agency by a private vendor for individuals acting on behalf of a law enforcement agency. The fiscal and policy note assumes that databases operated by DPSCS do not fall under the definition of database as it applies to the bill. However, databases operated by other state and local, local law enforcement as well as on behalf of law enforcement by a private vendor could not be accessed by correctional case managers, DPP agents, and other DPSCS employees who are not included in the definition of law enforcement agency, including administrative personnel within the department who require access to perform essential reporting and management duties. This would be the same for the judiciary and other like criminal justice agencies that access DPSCS systems in order to perform their criminal justice responsibilities that parallel law enforcement responsibilities. One cannot operate without the other. As Senator Lamb mentioned, we've spoken about our concerns and we look forward to working with him to clarify the language through an amendment. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much. Before we go to questions, Senator West, I see you there. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Bedoya, you, you can translate for Ms. Castro, is that correct? So if we can do that, Ms. Castro, if you're still here, Let's go ahead and try to make this work. All right, so I've unmuted you. Um, Ms. Castro, if you're still here, you can come back on and we can get you going here. All right, how about this? If uh, Let's proceed to questions. And if she pops back on, uh, we've got Mr. Rodoy on, on standby. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so Senator West, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It sure sounds to me like this is the, a bill that, that ought to be sent to a, some sort of a work group. We certainly do not want to inadvertently um, impede our numerous law enforcement agencies around the state from doing their jobs. Um, let me just focus on one issue in particular, fingerprints. My understanding is there's a national fingerprint base that the FBI has access to. So that if someone commits a crime or is apprehended for possibly committing a crime in California, they can check fingerprints nationwide and can identify that this person is the person who did something in Maryland. Um, my understanding also is that fingerprints include at least name, uh, probably other identifying information about the person. So as I look on page six of the bill, it says, um, uh, and um, 
an officer employee of the state shall, shall deny inspection of the part of the public record that contains personal information by any federal agency seeking access for the purpose of immigration enforcement. So my operating assumption is that the federal agencies exchange information all the time in the same way that the Maryland uh, public safety agencies exchange information. So if that's the case, and if Maryland makes its fingerprint records available to any federal agency, isn't it likely that that federal agency would in turn share the information with other federal agencies which might need access to the fingerprints and why would ICE be isolated? We can't force the federal government to isolate, to wall off ICE so it can't get information from other federal agencies. Uh, I don't know if Senator Lamb wants to try to answer this concern or maybe Mr. Bedoya uh, who has more experience would be the one to answer this. Um, so what do you have to say? Senator Lamb, should I, should I go ahead? Okay. Very good. Um, it, it's a great question. Uh, um, I, I think we address it and let me explain why. Um, uh, certainly, you know, we, there's nothing in the bill that requires our state agencies for being absolutely certain that information will not later be used by the federal government for immigration enforcement. There's, there's no kind of certification that's required, uh, um, you know, our agencies just need to have the understanding that it's not being used for that or that it's not the primary reason I would suggest. Um, you're referring to a, 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 a very significant program called Secure Communities. Um, the critical thing about Secure Communities and the nature of fingerprint sharing, fingerprint sharing to the FBI has been going on long before Secure Communities. And um, uh, everyone's fingerprints when you're arrested anywhere in the country are sent to the FBI. What the FBI decides to do is share that information with ICE. Um, I don't, it, it's not the intent of this bill to interfere with that. That's a very big program. Uh, um, and uh, that's not the intent of this legislation. Um, and I think the legislation as is it, it, uh, um, would not do that because that's not the primary purpose of the fingerprint sharing. It's, it's predated that, that secure communities program. But if there's some clarification that's necessary, I think that's that's appropriate. Um, uh, I, I don't know how much extra work it needs to speak to the uh, to the corrections concerns. It's also definitely not the intent of anyone uh, um, uh, who's supporting this bill to to impede the ability of uh, probation or corrections officers from accessing our own state databases. And I think there's a, a friendly amendment that could be made to that provision on databases to address uh, that concern. That's certainly not the intent either. Uh, but I appreciate the question. I'm happy to talk about it further. Yeah, I, uh, I, I fully appreciate that it's not the intent of, the, of this bill to, to impede um, people from doing their jobs and protecting us. For example, there's testimony in here from the airport about their need to share information with the federal agencies, uh, you know, the, the terrorist watch, that sort of thing. Um, I can turn to another area, facial recognition. I mean, the old, the old way to identify people was through fingerprints. Now we've got facial recognition. I remember seeing a program, I think it was on 60 Minutes, there was a kidnapping up in New York and the police didn't know what to do about it. And the guy took it upon himself to go from one store to another that had these cameras. And he basically tra tracked the kidnapper through the streets of New York. Uh, so, and eventually they apprehended the kidnapper uh, because of the work this, this, in, this citizen did on his own. Um, I suspect that increasingly federal agencies are gonna use facial recognition to try to protect us. And I guess my concern is, that all, this is we're in a digitized world. When I grew up, we were in a paper world. Everything was committed to paper and contained in file cabinets. Now we're in a digitized world and it's contained in digital encrypted data sometimes that's, that's available electronically um, and accessed electronically. I don't know how we wall, wall off this one area dealing with ICE uh, and if effectively wall it off, even if we wanted to, let's assume we want to, how we can effectively wall it off and prevent person, people's information from indirectly being acquired by ICE. And if that's the case, then isn't this bill sort of chase, chasing a, a, a goal which can't possibly be achieved? If, if I may speak to that yeah. briefly. Yeah. Um, so what I would suggest, I mean, uh, um, these, are, these, are all, uh, um, these are all good things to talk about. Um, we wouldn't be the first state to have a wraparound warrant requirement. So um, Colorado's done this, Oregon's done this, DC actually just did this. 
Uh, and so, and then with respect to MBA data, um, we'd be the ninth state to do this. And so other jurisdictions have successfully done this. Um, all those cases you mentioned, terrorism, missing children, airports, uh, none of those are uh, uh, immigration enforcement purposes. Uh, um, and therefore they wouldn't require warrants under the bill. And if you look at that last provision, the one we probably need to add some language on to make sure that probation and corrections officers have the access, all the access they need. The only agency that's walled off from being in our databases is ICE. We purposely did not include Customs and Border Protection in there to make sure the ports can communicate as freely as they need with uh, uh, folks uh, doing customs work. Um, and, and again, uh, um, in the instance that it is ICE, they wouldn't be walled off, they need to get a warrant. And so um, I think we're addressing, certainly it's the intent to, to make sure to not get in the way of another. And I'm pretty sure in the case of the missing children and terrorism, that information will still flow uh, um, extremely quickly, as quickly as it does today, unimpeded. Um, that would be my opinion. I, 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 I see what you're aiming at. I guess my concern, which I won't belabor, is that your, this bill stops a direct arrow going from Maryland, some Maryland agency to ICE. What this bill doesn't do and can't do, it seems to me, is to stop information going from a Maryland agency to another Maryland agency and from whatever other agency we're talking about to the FBI in the case of fingerprints, to other areas of the federal government in case of other information, and then indirectly going right back to ICE. Am, am I wrong in this? Yeah. I don't think it does can the latter. Prevent, can we prevent the FBI from giving us information to ICE? No, we cannot, and I don't think the bill does that. Um, uh, uh, but the other thing is that we actually don't even, and, and I'm glad you're raising this because this, this raises a way in which the bill is better than, for example, the New York bill. The New York bill, uh, and, and it's probably my fault for speaking in shorthand, um, the New York bill identifies ICE and CBP and says, thou shalt not share with these agencies without a warrant, right? Um, the, the core restriction in our bill is sharing with a federal officer for immigration enforcement purposes. Uh, and so if you're trying to share with ICE, if you're sharing with enforcement removal operations, those are the folks who go out and deport people, yeah, you gotta get a warrant. Uh, uh, if you're sharing with HSI, Homeland Security Investigations, if it's about immigration enforcement, then yeah, you gotta get a warrant. But if it's for a uh, uh, child exploitation investigation, child pornography investigation, any number of the other you know horrible things that, that HSI, invest well, some of the horrible things that HSI investigates, that actually isn't walled off with a warrant. That, so the innovation in this bill is that it's a purpose-based restriction rather than an um, agency, with the exception of not letting ICE directly log into Maryland databases because of what they've done uh, that's been uncovered by The Sun, that's been uncovered by Senator Lee and Senator Lamb's inquiries of basically running around in these databases um, uh, uh, with unfettered access effectively doing it. At, at the risk of imposing on the committee, let me ask you one final question. So let's take this Homeland Security as an example. We've got a serious problem with domestic terrorism in this country. Suppose domestic, suppose Homeland Security contacts MVA and says, we want access to your database. Uh, and is MVA supposed to ask Homeland Security, are you going to give it to ICE? And Homeland no, Security says, no, no, that's sir. not the way we want it. <laughs> and yeah, no, no, sir. No, sir. There's no, it. excuse me. I'm there's, pardon me. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, there's a way to write what you're describing in the bill, but that's not in the bill. You know, uh, um, okay. if you look at, for example, the certifications on redisclosure, we have one of those for resale of the data. So if you're one of these folks that buys the data and resells it, we got something in there that says, don't redisclose. We right, don't- But I'm talking about Homeland Security now. Well, so exactly. So there's nothing- Homeland the Security that gets everything, gets the whole MBA database. And then ICE contacts Homeland Security and says, we got a problem in Maryland. Can you give us the Maryland database? What's gonna stop Homeland Security from saying, sure, so yeah, your bill, the bill can't solve every situation in every instance. And so if there's a scenario where uh, someone outside of enforcement removal operations uh, doing terrorism work at DHS calls up MVA and says, we have an active terror incident, we need data, they're gonna give their data and, and the bill won't get in the way of further sharing. So that's a fault in the bill, right? Uh, uh, under your argument. But it's, but it's not unsolvable fault, isn't it? We can't force the Homeland Security, we can't control what they do with the information we provide. And we're not trying to because I think it would create the scenario that you're describing, which is, I don't think it's something that anyone wants. Uh, we want free sharing for the sake of terrorism. Um, and I think the bill allows it. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Interesting conversation, thank you. For clarity, remember, Senator West, 
ICE is a component of Homeland Security. And so if we're, if, if Homeland Security has it, ICE has it. But um, and I, it, obviously, it, we, we couldn't restrict the sharing of information between federal agencies, even if we wanted to. But um, so uh, S Senator Lee, go ahead. Can, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? We can. I, I guess this question is, is for uh, Professor uh, Bedoya or, or Senator Lamb. Um, you, you mentioned earlier uh, that this bill had been drafted uh, to avoid problems that a similar bill had uh, created in uh, New York um, and to protect commerce at the ports. Uh, can you just like further elaborate on how this bill will do that? Can you unmute? I think the, yeah, I think there we go. Can you um, um, and I can, yeah. So, so the key issue in the New York bill was they said um, uh, they raised this warrant bar, this warrant wall between New York and the agencies rather than based on the, the, the nature of the question that the agencies are asking. So if you look at the green light bill, it says if a federal uh, agency primarily, uh, uh, who, primarily charged with enforcing immigration law um, makes this request, got to get a warrant and actually defines ICE and CBP to be such agencies. And the issue this caused is uh, um, not only does ICE do some things that have nothing to do with deportation, but, um, but uh, CBP does a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with immigration enforcement, particularly at, at ports. And so uh, uh, the two things that this bill does to make sure that there is that free flowing information is it is, an agent, it is not an agency based restriction, again, with the, with the sole issue of ICE going into our databases. There's no such restriction on CBP. So if a customs official needs to have immediate back and forth communication with the Port of Baltimore or somewhere else, that can happen. Uh, um, that's the, the key distinction. Uh, um, and Trusted Traveler was one of those programs that no one intended to impede with the green light law, but because they wrote the law that way, um, DHS, um, and to be frank and, and, and to be candid here, uh, uh, this was a different administration. DHS, right? This was the prior Trump administration. And respectfully, I think they were looking for reasons to kind of bring the hammer down on New York. And they found one in this restriction on CBP. And so they threatened to cut off trusted traveler. New York ended up uh, um, tweaking that law to allow for it. And also the lawsuit was dropped though. This is interesting because DHS had to acknowledge to a, a federal judge that, oh, actually, we, we actually can get this information from somewhere else. Uh, but this bill avoids all of that. And I think I, my understanding, I'm, I'm led, to, led to understand based on the conversation here, that there was a, a concern from the ports. Um, uh, I quickly drafted up a letter uh, um, uh, once I heard that, uh, uh, that today uh, to, um, to address this. Uh, uh, and that letter provides more information. And, um, and I, I think everyone on committee will get it shortly. Thank you, Senator Lee. And Mr. Uh, Padoy, I'm going to unmute you again because we have um, Ms. Castro is here. And so now we can do the uh, the translation, and then uh, Senator Cassidy will go to you. But um, so Ms. Castro, if you'd like to go ahead, we've got a translator. We're making it work. Uh, so and, the floor is yours. And I apologize. My name is Anna. Actually, Luz Castro is having technical difficulty, but I have her English translation with me. Would that got be it. okay? Sounds good. Perfect. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chairman Smith and members of the committee. My name is Luz Castro. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of the Driver's Privacy Act. I'm a resident of Montgomery County and I'm undocumented. I migrated to the United States from Colombia for a better and safer life for my children. Even though I'm eligible, I'm not, I have not gotten my driver's license out of fear that ICE could use my information. I'm a single mom with three kids with the youngest one that still depends on me. I'm in constant worry that if something happens to me, I won't be able to support my kids. Although I really need a license, I'm not willing to take that risk. Sadly, I can't trust the MBA of Maryland. I live in the Silver Spring area and I commute to DC on a daily basis. This can be difficult because I have to take three buses in order to get to work since I don't have a car or a license. During the pandemic, it has been even more complicated because the buses are filled with folks that are not taking the proper precautions that could put my health in jeopardy. Also, the schedule has been more limited, which makes it more difficult for me to get to my work location. As you know, there are many places in Maryland where it's necessary to have a car in order to get to work so I can take care of my family and do the basic things. I'm extremely worried that if ICE could use my information and could come to my home, 
As we know, it has happened to other community members. Last year, we learned of Jose Hernandez, a member of CASA who was picked up by immigration at his home in Rockville, Maryland. His little girls opened the door, and when Jose asked how ICE had his information, they said through the MBA. He was in a detention center for eight months, which impacted his emotional health, and he wasn't able to support his family who depend on his income. How can we trust the MBA and trust that we get our license safely if people don't know um, if we're gonna be punished for having a license? I hope that you're able to pass this bill. So what happens to Jose Hernandez or, or it won't happen to working moms such as myself or other members of the community. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. And thanks for sticking in there with us. Um, all right, so with that, we'll hand over to Senator Cassley. You are up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just sort of one brief question. I guess it's to Senator Lamb. You can deflect it off to somebody else if you, if you feel more comfortable. But, um, I'm just trying to understand that if, if I, I expect there's DHS investigations going on uh, daily in Maryland, looking for someone who's a, a criminal of some sort, uh, has done something bad. And so they're doing, they're going to our folks and saying, um, we need your records to look at this. They give them the records. When they give them the records, is that all the records or is they just give them, I mean, they're saying we need a guy who looks like this. Um, we want to scan for a guy who looks like this. Um, do they just give them, download all the records then? Or does, do we do the scan? Do we do the search? Do they do the search? How do we do this recognition search just on a, on a gut level, you know, on a, a practical level? Do we give them the data and they do the search? Or? So, so we actually had the option, Senator Lee and I and a few others from the House side had the option to go actually view this system firsthand. So um, they have a login. Uh, it's the NCIC they, they, login. Sorry, they, they being the... They being uh, anyone that has an NCIC login. Any okay. person that has an NCIC login, of which there are, that's wide open. There are a lot of federal right. agents that have a, just a general NCIC login. Right. Um, and so they can log into our system. That's very different than other states where there's a little bit more, um, uh, you know, screening that goes in before someone can log in. But they can go into the system and they can have a photograph that they can basically upload into our system and run a facial recognition against everything that's in our database, in our MBA database. So, you know, they can basically bring any photograph in, run a recognition against any other photograph that's currently in the database. And then it spits out, you know, a bunch of photographs that the, the computer system says are matches. Gotcha. In some so way. They, so they don't download our data, our MBA data, for example, onto their system and then, and then right. look through it they, but they have a direct door into our system. I, I got you. So, and that's how this is working. That, that they literally go to our system and say, here's the picture or the composite or whatever of the person we're looking for. And then our system does the search. Right. Okay. All right. Um, and so we, we've heard some testimony, uh, at least some credible testimony, I think, that, that this process would would, would in, 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 in some fashion potentially limit law enforcement. Are we willing to, you know, assuming those concerns cannot be alleviated, are we willing to allow those limitations on our own law enforcement in order to achieve the purposes of this bill? Yeah, and, and Mr. Bedoya can chime in too, but I don't think that's, that's not what we're gonna be doing with this bill. Um, you know, any law enforcement, agency that wants to conduct uh, an investigation simply has to get a warrant to be able to do that. They would be able to proceed just like they would be right now. Um, and this is really just towards ICE itself. So other agencies, other law enforcement uh, offices and departments can still go about their business. So, so that, I'm not sure I understand that part because if, if, if you're a uh, an agent, a federal agent, and you're looking for somebody who you suspect might have been involved in a crime. I don't have a, I don't, I don't have sufficient cause to get a warrant. I mean, if this guy, if if he's, if I can establish that he was within two blocks of the murder site, I might be able to get a warrant. On the other hand, if he's been living in California consistently, then clearly he's out of the picture. So what? 
I could see cases where I don't have probable cause to get a warrant, a criminal warrant. I, I'm co conducting an investigation. I interviewed somebody on the street. Uh, they showed me a quick picture of a guy who was happened to be right near the murder scene at the time. And I'm going to look for that guy. Um, and so I have that picture off of the uh, the, the bank security clap, you know, camera next door. I captured that and I'm saying, who is this guy? Somebody tells me that I've seen him around. And so I go to Maryland DMV and I'm trying to put that in there. Um, you, I, I guess you would have no problem if it was just simply a criminal investigation, but if, what if it was a, a criminal investigation combined with, I mean, what if it was the, um, uh, uh, you know, INS, uh, involved in this, looking for somebody who they knew was a bad guy on the land, or they suspected without having probable cause to get a warrant. How, how do you factor that in? So I think we, they would be able to, because it was a criminal investigation to be able to get that warrant. They would be able to just appear before a judge, present the evidence they have at that point, and since it's a criminal investigation, could be able to seek that warrant and then access the data that they need to. Um, if, if, you, if they suspected that I was involved in something, they could, or, or somebody like, somebody had a quick picture, they could just go and run it. They don't need any probable cause. They can just run it. Um, but now this other, um, they could run it through any records. You're saying, well, you can't, INS can't do that. Anybody else could do that. Just not INS. You're saying it's because it's not for the purpose of a criminal investigation. It's, it's only for the purpose of trying to deport me. Is that what you're saying? Right, right. It's only for and, civil immigration. Uh, well, everything's purpose. civil immigration because we already know for this committee. Immigration is, is civil, that's right. But this committee has heard unrebutted efforts and uh, testimony consistent over the last three or four years that you're not going to get the, the, the criminal warrants. It just isn't happening. End of story. The feds are not going to change all their practices just for, for Maryland. The, 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 the way they operate is the civil warrants or uh, detainers or whatever. And so if we choose as a state to ignore that and jeopardize our people, which Montgomery County has done, they got like this terrible MS-13 problem because they clearly uh, value this above the lives of their own citizens. But if we can, if we want to persist in that, then we just jeopardize our own citizens' safety in their lives. So um, you know, that, that's, that's the challenge I have with this, with, with this thing is that if we're, are, are we really willing to jeopardize our citizens' lives if we can't make this, if we can't satisfy the concerns of law enforcement and we bump, we just sort of rush this through anyway because we value the privacy of the, the undocumented aliens over the safety of our own citizens. And, and so that's why I, I'm not, it sounds like you're saying, no, that's okay. We're gonna run, we're gonna just go ahead and push this through even if we cannot satisfy the legitimate concerns of law enforcement. I think their concerns can be addressed via the criminal warrant process, but I think Mr. Yeah, Bedoya but, has his right hands that's up that he wants because to. We already know they can't. We know for a fact they can't. We've been around this bush so many times here with so many people who are involved in the system, people who are agents, people who run the agency, people. I mean, we've had so many experts, and I'm going to get one more person who's going to give me their personal opinion that that's not true. But my God, we've had the top level people who have assured us beyond any shed of a doubt that, no, they're wrong. And the people you're gonna bring in to say that, they're just wrong. And so, okay. Uh, um, respectfully, if I can, if I can offer some, some insights here. Um, my own personal background, I didn't mention, uh, I was on the Senate Judiciary Committee for five years before I came over to Georgetown, did a lot of oversight work, um, uh, both oversight and supporting federal uh, law enforcement agencies like the FBI, uh, DEA, ATF, um, and, Respectfully, I think the scenario you're describing is, is pretty unlikely. The key thing is that this will not disturb secure communities. Anytime any of the folks that you're worried about get arrested, their fingerprints will go to FBI. FBI will show them to ICE. That's a big system. Um, I could tell you why it's bad, but, but we'll disagree. But that's not what this is about. That will continue unimpeded. That is how ICE finds the vast majority of people it wants to deport. That fingerprint chance. Yeah, but yeah, but you're, asking me, you're asking me to, to discount the the testimony by our own people who say this will impact their law enforcement operations. And I'm not willing to do that. So thank you. Respectfully, I think that was with respect to a provision about accessing our databases to ensure that our state officials, corrections officers, mm -hmm. probation, et cetera, can have access and, and that's easy to fix. So this is a scenario that you're putting forward um, is a scenario where the only person who can somehow call Maryland is ICE. 
uh, where some kind of serious offense has been has been uh, um, raised. And yes, in that instance, if only ICE can place the call to Maryland, if they this person isn't on their radar, so it's like a first time offender, uh, um, uh, then in this instance, ICE would need to get a warrant. But in general, uh, serious crimes are investigated by the FBI. Uh, the FBI would be making the call. And in most instances, ICE would already have that person's fingerprints through this sharing system that will continue unimpeded uh, uh, with respect to this bill. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, what you're saying, you know, we've got like an incredible number of MS-13 people in Maryland. Um, it's really rampant. They're really insidious. They're really tricky. And trying to trace those people around the globe, because unlike any of us on this thing, right, on this in this uh, video conference, um, they have no fingerprints and no records and all ice and all anybody can do is just sort of try very hard to trace them around the globe. And if we don't use every tool available to try to identify these folks, um, we're just going to have to say it's okay if you slit little 13 year old girls throats in Montgomery County and brutally rape them, but we're going to give them a second chance to run across the border back and forth. Hey, that, it's, it's a risk that I'm not willing to support. Sorry. Thanks. All right, thank you, Senator Cassidy, and thank you, Mr. Bedoya. Um, I see uh, Senator Bailey has a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> so, Mr. Uh, Bedoya, I think this might be um, best to you. Uh, as uh, I'm familiar now, it's been several years ago that I did this, but as familiar when we worked with NCIC terminals, there were very strict uh, rules and regulations and there was audits. So anytime that uh, any information was disseminated uh, from that, right, there had to be reasons uh, listed in the NCIC log of why that search was done. And then that search had to be, that uh, reason had to be documented and if there was not significant uh, reason, uh, an accountable reason for that, then the repercussions were rather significant to the police departments. And I was just uh, wondering when you say how easy this is, all you have, have to have is access to an NCIC terminal to be able to do that. That clearly is not the case in my experience. And I just wanna know in the past four years since I've left law enforcement, if they've opened this up so that there's no more requirements on NCIC terminals. Right, uh, respectfully, that was actually also my experience. And so uh, four, five years ago, when we started investigating Maryland's uh, system, uh, uh, we filed freedom of information requests for audit logs. Uh, uh, and we were told there were no audits uh, of the face recognition system. Uh, furthermore, when, um, when Senator Lamb and we both filed freedom information requests to get uh, basic information around the number of searches of driver addresses, again, so because uh, both of these systems uh, um, uh, uh, hinge on that NCIC credential, uh, when Senator Lamb and we asked uh, uh, the Department of Public Safety, hey, you just let us know the number of searches uh, uh, because exactly as you suggest in any system like this, this is a, I mean, below standard functionality to track this, these things. We were sent to different agencies. And still to this day, even though this is on the front page of the Sun and the Post, you know, a year ago, no one in this, in, in this hearing room and what we've all been studying it can say how many times ISIS scanned our faces, how many times ISIS uh, searched our addresses, even though the laws say these records should exist, either they don't exist or uh, um, we're not being given them despite, you know, folks in authority, uh, uh, you know, we're an outside third party. I'm, I'm a, I'm a uh, Marylander, but uh, uh, Senator Lamb's asking the questions and we're just getting, we're getting non-answers. Um, yeah, so, to, that, and that's correct. They're, they just don't have those audit logs. They weren't doing that. They weren't collecting that information. And so those records, um, you know, until we were identifying this as a lapse last session, last year, um, they weren't actually collecting this information. Anyone that had an NCIC credential could basically log into the system and they weren't seeing what they were um, accessing once they logged in. So what I will uh, uh, tell you is I just contacted a police department. They told me they absolutely do have the logs. They are still uh, inspected. Those logs do exist. And the other thing that I did inquire was to just see if officers themselves had the facial recognition uh, level and, they, and I was told no. 
that that is definitely at a higher level than what we're talking about just uh, just by an officer being able to enter in and do facial recognition on their uh, computer. But uh, still something that I'm going to uh, check into a little bit. Just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, our understanding is that there are logs for local police, but not for the federal access. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you, Senator Bailey. Well, actually, your question dovetails nicely with what I was gonna ask about it. And Mr. Bedoya, you brought this up. And so first I'll just say, Senator Lee and, and Senator um, Lamb, thank you both for, for your work, not only last session, but in the interim. But you all both, you both, so Mr. Bedoya, you filed an MPI or a, a, a FOIA request and Senator Lamb, you did the same thing and you didn't get information uh, back. Now, just the, the, I guess it's a two part question. One is, uh, so either the records do or don't exist and you're saying that they don't exist for federal, uh, those federal inquiries or you know, the federal access. Is that true or Senator Lamb? Right, I don't think they exist uh, for federal access. Okay, and then I guess for, for you, did, did you get was did you get a response from our Maryland agencies from your inquiry? What were you told? We were told that when we visited last year that they don't have that information. They don't keep that uh, information um, as an audit trail. Got it. Well, let me just ask this since we have some of the folks here. I'm looking at. Um, Miss, uh, is Miss Best Kid still here? If you come back on, and I miss Mr. Green, um, we'll just ask it plain up, straight up. Do you do you all have uh, that information? Are you aware of those? Sorry, one more time. Are you aware of those requests? Um, you know, do you all maintain that information? And if so, uh, you know why was it not furnished to the senator or to Mr. Bedoya and his uh, organization? Thank you for the question, Chair Smith. Um, I am not a, not able to answer that question. I'd have to reach out to Information Technology and our Criminal Justice Investigative Division or Information Systems Division to obtain that. We'd be happy to look into it and provide it to you. Excellent, because I'll, I'll follow up today as well, actually, I'm gonna have someone do it right now, but okay. uh, thank you very much. Okay. Looking around the Zoom room. All right, seeing no further questions, thank you very much, Senator Lamb, and thank you to the panel. Thank you all for, for your time and your service. Um, and with thank that, you. that'll conclude the testimony for Senate Bill 234. We'll now move on. I see Senator Riley has joined us. You've been waiting patiently, so thank you very much. Uh, Senator Riley, you're up with Senate Bill 328. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, this issue was brought to me by a uh, individual who's gonna to testify today concerning the differences in how the uh, counties handle evictions. So currently in Baltimore City, uh, there's notice mailed, notice posted on the day of the eviction, the uh, landlord, the sheriff show up. And um, if uh, as soon as the unit is uh, empty, uh, they put a padlock on it. Now, any of the personal property inside the apartment, inside the house, inside the, the residence, that is considered legally as abandoned. That's the legal term in the law. The tenant, if he wants any of the stuff back, has to negotiate with the landlord, whether it's to pay part of the rent, or it's a fee. We, this bill doesn't address that issue. In Anne Arundel County, we have a different process. This is where the sheriff shows up, the landlord shows up, and a crew of people to take all of the possessions in the apartment or in the house and put them on the curb. At that moment, they're considered abandoned. And um, if any of you have ever driven past the site where somebody's household goods are sitting on a curb, whether it's rainy or snowy, I think there might be some restrictions on weather, but the person sitting there it is an absolute heartbreak because they're there trying to protect the, their, their uh, furnishings and their clothes and all their appliances <clears throat> and yet trying to make arrangements where to put them. How can I get a truck or a car? How am I going to transport my stuff? And if I leave it for 20 minutes, the vultures will come and pick all my stuff up because it's abandoned. So the bill, uh, Senate Bill 328 is a specific local bill for Anne Arundel County only. It is the procedures for repossession for failure to pay rent. 
And what we're trying to do is take the Anne Arundel County Code uh, provisions and make them uh, the same as Baltimore City. I've also gotten some support from um, uh, a couple other counties. We may be, uh, if this bill moves forward, we may be amending for other counties to uh, participate. I believe one of them was Wicomico. Uh, I have three people testifying on the bill who are much more qualified than I am, but that's the overview. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult subject to bring up because it, it's a very traumatic event. I've never been evicted, but I have been involved with evictions of, of acquaintances of mine. And we have an issue coming up. The eviction tsunami is coming. We all know that. There's probably tens of thousands of people who haven't been able to pay their rent. The courts aren't necessarily taking these cases very quickly or on a very limited basis. When the emergency is declared over, if without specific legislation, which I'm sure some is working its way through the system, without emergency legislation, um, when that time comes, it's not gonna be pretty. It's a little bit like all the foreclosures that happened a few years ago with all these houses that stood empty for a year or two or three. Uh, very difficult subject, but it's an important one for us to come together and try to um, uh, make sure we're doing the right thing for our constituents rather than putting their property on a curb someplace. At least it's secure, dry, and through the work with the uh, tenant and the landlord be made available again if they want it. There's also more prescriptive wording for the disposition of the um, <clears throat> personal property. They, the landlord may not throw it out. The landlord, well, I'm sorry, he may, he may dispose of it in certain specific ways. For instance, in the bill, it talks about transportation to a licensed landfill, donation to charity, or any other legal means. So uh, the bill is pretty prescriptive. Again, those of you who represent Baltimore City, you're living with this now. Um, uh, Senator Jackson, I'm sure as a, as a member of, uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Bailey uh, with law enforcement, this is an issue that has come up in your service, and I thank you for your service. So it may not be unfamiliar with to you, but uh, I ask for a, a favorable um, report. Now, there are a couple of amendments, <clears throat> which I'm very willing to take. They were uh, sent to us by the um, uh, Maryland Multiple Housing Administration to more clarify the intent of the process. So uh, Mr. Uh, chairman or Vice Chairman, whoever's running the meeting, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd be very happy to accept these as friendly amendments. And that concludes my comments. And I think uh, uh, former um, County Councilman uh, John Grosso is our five minute speaker, Mr. S Mr. Uh, chairman. Yep. Thank you very much, Senator. And you're correct, uh, Mr. Grosso, you're up. Yes, sir. Can everybody hear me? You can. All right, good afternoon and thank you for your time and your service. <clears throat> I'm gonna to try to walk you through quickly on the process and as the Senator just mentioned. If you look at Anne Arundel County right now when someone doesn't pay the rent, they automatically get a mailing through the mail from the court system, that's their first notice. And then the sheriff goes along and sticks it on their door, that's their second notice, okay? If they still don't make the payment at that point, then a warrant of restitution, AKA put out, is filed by the landlord, and then the sheriff will come out and put it on the door again. So three notices that they've received. You would like to believe that an individual know would know that it's coming when they don't pay the bill. So we got three notices. And then in Anne Arundel County, when it goes out on the street, not as it only pretty, it, it's a very serious situation because what can happen is, even though the deputy is doing the best he can, there could be stuff in the material that's being thrown out that people don't see. Syringes could be a perfect example. We also know about the epidemic, okay? Okay, they're asking to see my video so you guys can see my pretty face. There we go. Can anybody see me now? Yes. Okay. The other issue that you have to remember is when we got the syringes going out that it could be under the clothing and people grab that stuff. The other problem is, is, is bed bugs. Many, many places that get bed bugs get it from people scavenging through other people's evictions and taking it into their property. That's a huge issue right there. So with that being said at that point, that's the Anne Arundel County. And then on top of that, we, we have our sheriff's department, our deputy just sitting there waiting for people to empty this house out. And in most cases, they require at least four people 
to evict the house in a timely manner, which puts more burden on the landlord. Ultimately, the landlord will take that fee and add it on to the bill of the tenant when they probably go after him for small claim. Now, in Baltimore City, okay, this bill, I believe, is, is an excellent bill, and the simple reason is it's already had a trial. OK, we've already had 10 years plus of it in Baltimore City. And the best bill to put in play is one that's already played out. So 10 years it's been going for in Baltimore City. So in the process in Baltimore City is the same way, but there's a few caveat difference here. First thing that happens is when a tenant doesn't pay the rent. OK, there's a there's a mailing being sent from the court system directly to the tenant. OK, if the tenant still doesn't pay the rent, then the landlord turns around and files a warrant of restitution. Now, count the number of times. You get a mail in from the court system is once. The sheriff will physically post the door is twice. The warrant of restitution gets filed and gets another mailing. Then the, the landlord is required 14 days before the actual eviction or greater must send a proof of mailing, not certified, but a proof of mailing that has the paper that states an eviction is going to happen on this date, the case number, and it gives the specifics and says, once the eviction starts, it all becomes property of the landlord. Then seven days before that, at least the landlord has to send that exact same notice, but he doesn't, he or she doesn't send it. They tape it to the front door. So now the tenants being notified four times plus. All right. And, and then the eviction proceeds. So the big issue behind this here is that we're not taking people's property and putting it out on the street so that someone could get hurt with syringes or something that the deputy doesn't see. We're not spreading bed bugs, which is likely going to happen because I've had it happen in a bunch of my properties. And for you folks who don't know me, I have several hundred apartments. So I'm not talking from unexperienced. I've been a landlord for 35 years and I'm telling you what's going to happen. It has been happening. So with that issue, uh, in my case, uh, the tenant knows that the land, that the evictions happen, and I don't say to the tenants, "Hey, you know, pay me some rent. And, you know, I'll let you have your stuff." I am grateful if they come back to me and say, "John, you know, can we turn around and get ours?" Absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to lock the door for you. Get your stuff up out of there because I have to pay forty to fifty dollars a load to get the stuff taken out of a property, and every piece of equipment or a piece of furniture or whatever you take is a little bit less than the load that I have to pay. And, and, I've, and I've even went beyond that, even though the procedure calls for you to change the locks because you're supposed to change the locks. I'll leave the door unlocked for the tenant. So just go get your stuff. Now, where it has happened one time bad for me is I did something kindly for somebody like that. And they turned around and they went and got a gallon of semi-gloss paint that I had in the basement. And they opened a can of paint up and they dumped it all over everything in that house. The toilet, the tub, the kitchen sink, the floor. So in that situation, no good deed goes unpunished, applies there. But for the most part, most of the tenants that do want to come back and get their stuff, they turn around. I have an open door policy. I unlock the door for them. Get your stuff. Need to be done by that. But, a, but then there's a lot of times the tenants don't even come back. They've already, they've already been notified four to five times. They've got anything that they want, a value already out of there. And it's just, it's just a good piece of legislation uh, finishing up because it's already been tried. It works in Baltimore City. And, and then on top of that, it doesn't it doesn't burden the sheriff's department with, with hours of just sitting there waiting for different evictions to happen. It's just a good piece of legislation, period. Thank you for your time. All right, excellent. Thank you, Mr. Grasso. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Ms. Howard. Is Captain Howard here? Yes, I'm here, Mr. Chair. Hey, there you are. Hi. Uh, let's see. Let me get the video started, too. I guess there we go. Whoops. There we go. There you go. Well, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, fellow mem and uh, other committee members. Um, my name's Kathy Howard. I'm the legislative committee chair of uh, the Maryland Multi Housing Association. The Maryland Multi Housing Association is a, a trade group of uh, rental property providers. Um, we have 27,888 units in Anne Arundel County it combined in uh, 113 uh, communities in Anne Arundel County. And we are very happy to be here to support with amendments, um, Senator Riley's bill. Let me tell you, um, I, in my day job, I am general counsel for a rental property manager in Baltimore City um, the, by the name of Regional Management Inc. And um, I, it was on the uh, task force that um, along with Matt Hill and some other members of the public justice 
uh, Center um, in 2007 when the Baltimore City uh, decided to explore how to better do um, e evictions in a transparent and balanced way. Um, the law that we're talking about today has worked for 14 years in Baltimore City. Um, it, has, it has done the following things. It provides transparency to the tenant, letting them know, as Mr. Grasso indicated, at least, uh, at least twice after all of the uh, court proceedings are finished, um, exactly when their eviction is going to take place. Um, it also provides them with a, a, you know, a timeline to tell them what their deadlines are to pay and stay or to, to try to uh, uh, relieve the, leave the property uh, with their uh, belongings intact. Um, the second thing it does is it makes the landlord, uh, it, it puts it, the responsibility on the landlord not only to deliver the notices, but it does give the landlord a bright line definition of when um, tenant uh, or personal property of tenants is determined legally to be abandoned. Um, that's a very important uh, right of the landlord um, so that the, the landlord is not, uh, it is not accused of having stolen or otherwise misappropriated uh, the property of uh, the personal property of the tenant. The third thing that it does is for the juristic, is for the sheriff, gives the sheriff um, a very good idea of how to and when um, there should be a, if there uh -huh. is any dispute on the street um, during an eviction, how to go about getting that resolved through the court system. And lastly, it is extremely good for the jurisdiction in general. Um, the idea of having to haul uh, the, the government to haul those these pieces of eviction chattels that have been abandoned um, from the street side was one of the motivating factors for Baltimore City to put this task force together. Um, it has worked beautifully. In the first year of this um, law being in Baltimore City, Baltimore City sa saved $817,000 because DPW no longer had to dispose of the trash um, or unwanted items from evictions, it was left on the landlords uh, to be the landlord's responsibility. Um, there are, you know, there, I think that this is a very balanced approach to this. I think that, that this is, it is, evictions unfortunately do happen. Um, and we need to be sure that we have a process in place that it makes sure that every person who is um, involved in the, in that, particular process, particularly the tenant, is aware of exactly what um, the, the deadlines are so that they can be prepared either by paying and staying or by getting their important uh, personal property together uh, before it is, uh, it, it is disposed of um, without, their, without their knowledge. And this is, the, I can't say enough good about this law. Um, I, I, one thing I should note is that in the city, the following, the following groups were involved in the negotiation and the writing of this law. Legal Aid, the Public Justice Center, Green and Healthy Homes, Maryland Multi-Housing Association, the Greater Baltimore Board of Realtors, the City Solicitor's Office, the Mayor's Office of Eviction Prevention, and the Housing Authority of Baltimore City. We all came together, we hammered out this law, and it has worked very, very well um, to keep our streets clean and to uh, have transparency in evictions. Thank you for your time. I'll be happy to take any questions. Excellent, thank you, Ms. Howard. Uh, we'll now go to uh, Ms. Stavinsky. You are up next. Kathy, where are you? There you are. Good afternoon and thank you. Um, my name is Kathy Dubinsky with ANG Management. Um, ANG, we own and manage um, 3,000 apartment rentals in the area, and 1,578 of those homes are located in Anne Arundel County. Uh, we definitely support uh, SB 328, and I, I, uh, you've already heard kind of the procedures on what we, the process we have to take to do eviction. Um, I might add, um, I agree with the whole idea of the transparency to the tenants. 
Um, this would also give, with the timeline, we would be able to give tenants uh, the time they need to seek the financial assistance they may need to be able to pay, uh, which I think is a big plus. Or if they can't, then they know in enough time to begin the relocation process. So hopefully this bill would reduce the incident of where tenants are unprepared or unaware uh, of the scheduled eviction, even though there's those zillion notices that you already heard about. Uh, for whatever reason in their lives, this would at least we know in our hearts that we've given them ever opportunity to do what they need to do uh, to avoid that ugly eviction that you heard about uh, with the abandoned property out in the street. Um, I think it would also provide the sheriff's office with that savings of time and expense as they would not be required to remain on site for the duration of a full eviction, which can be very time consuming, um, several hours in fact. Um, so, that, you know, right now they're remaining on property uh, with us while the eviction takes place, and then that property is put on the designated public property. And as you already heard, the vultures, which is so true, right now with that abandoned property having to remain on public street for 24 hours, you can just imagine, um, and you may have already seen it uh, in your passing in the streets and about, um, that this could potentially create, you know, walking and traffic hazards uh, with the blocking of the county walkways and then stuff being strewn into the street while people rifle through people's uh, discarded and abandoned items. Uh, it can be pretty ugly. Um, so that was definitely an accurate portrayal. Thank you. Um, uh, and also, you know, with that, with us not having to have that item remain or the abandoned property remain on the public street for over 24 hours before we can schedule to have it cleaned up and removed, uh, this would uh, make that more efficient for uh, property managers to be able to arrange for those items to be removed. Um, and with that said, uh, with that abandoned property not sitting on the public street, uh, our curb appeal would definitely be improved for the surrounding communities. And so uh, we ask for a favorable report for SB 328 and uh, thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Ms. Davinsky. Uh, next we have, we'll turn over to the opposition panel. Uh, and first up we have Mr. Hill. Matt, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, Matt Hill, Public Justice Center. Um, we are opposed to SB 328. Um, there are some good things in this bill, and we appreciate the uh, provision of notice to the tenants of the date of the eviction, uh, 14 days by mail with certificate of mailing and seven days posting. That's a good thing. Tenants need to have notice of the date that they need to either pay and stay or uh, vacate the property. And so that's, that's a progress, but the price is just too high. Um, the loss of all a person's worldly belongings, their medications, their vital records, their personal mementos become at the moment that eviction starts the property effectively of the landlord. That price is too high and it's a major change in current law. We know the price is too high because we do have experience in Baltimore City with this law. And I appreciate Ms. Howard's reference, but I was but a baby lawyer in 2007 and had not quite gotten to the Public Justice Center. Um, but it, it is true that our, our organization did have quite a bit of input on that bill. But the experience we've had in Baltimore City is that we still get calls all the time from tenants who say, I didn't get the notice. And I believe them. In many cases, I believe them. I know how the US Postal Service works sometimes. I know that there's a way that landlords can, if they want to, to game the system. And I won't go into the details about that, but it does happen. And then as folks said, the, all the belongings are locked into the property. And unfortunately, our experience is that many landlords are very reluctant to let the tenant back into the property to retrieve their belongings. Or as somebody testified, this is true, the landlord will hold those belongings ransom, saying, pay me $500 in rent, or I'm not gonna let you back in to get your medication. It happens, it happens all the time. And so we're very concerned about the way this law operates currently in Baltimore City. Um, we know there are better ways to do this. There are other jurisdictions. Prince George's County has a provision that lets the, the tenant retrieve their belongings uh, post eviction. Um, and then we listed a number of other states that have post eviction retrieval periods in our written testimony. So we would urge the, the committee to consider the model from those other jurisdictions and allow some sort of post eviction retrieval period. I wanna just call the, the committee's attention to this and I will, I will email the case around after this. It's not in my written testimony at the moment, 
But the U.S. District Court of Maryland uh, actually found that this law in Baltimore City, as applied in certain circumstances, is unconstitutional. That it's uh, it lacks due process. It's a taking from the tenant. Okay. Um, and so it's a very major concern. I'll email that case around to the committee members. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hill. That would be appreciated. Um, I think that rounds out the panel because the representative from Legal Aid was just submitting for submitted a written testimony. So we have questions from the um, committee. So I'll, I'll talk about uh, Senator West will go first and then we'll follow with Senator Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gee, I was about to say this sounds like a great bill until <laughs> Mr. Hill's testimony. So let me, but let me start. Um, I, in fact, I was going to ask what, what, why shouldn't we extend this bill statewide? Uh, if it's worked so well in Baltimore City and Anne Arundel County wants it, well, what would be the problem of making this statewide bill? Um, Ms. Howard, do you have any reason to believe that other counties, maybe uh, Senator Riley wants to answer that. Oh my gosh, am I, um, am I not? Oh, okay, thank you. I, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, as we testified earlier, some counties have processes in place that they're comfortable with. Okay, all right. I, I represent Anne Arundel County. Uh, Councilman Grosso is from Anne Arundel County. Uh, eviction law is done county by county for a reason. But work okay. in the city may not Make, work in Talbot County and that type of thing. So I'm makes very. Sense. Makes sense. Unless are, there's a specific well, request from a jurisdiction to be included. Great. We should take a look at this for Baltimore County for some future year. Um, um, Ms. Howard, uh, Mr. Hill said that the, some court had held elements of the Baltimore city system unconstitutional. What do you have to say about that? She, um, she's not unmuted. There, okay, great. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, it, it is true that there is a uh, pending lawsuit in, Baltimore, in the federal, federal district court in Baltimore city um, that to some extent does surround this, it, it does surround this law, but it is not about necessarily whether the law, it, the, the circumstances are slightly different. Um, the uh, circumstances there are, first of all, there has been no rule. Let me just make one thing perfectly clear. That, that case is, there has been no ruling finally on, uh, on this particular law, and that case is still going on. In fact, it's in the middle of discovery, and um, there is no ruling that the law that this law has any problems with it at this point and stage in the game. Um, so it is still pending. Um, the second thing is, is it involves what's known as a tenant holding over action, not a failure to pay rent case. Those are two different types of cases. Um, and whether this law is applicable to a tenant holdover over case versus a failure to pay rent case is, is to some extent at the heart of that, um, uh, at the heart of that lawsuit. Um, uh, there's no, there, there does not seem to be any issue with regard to how the law operates in the failure to pay rent area. Um, and that's, I think, very important point to be made here um, with regard to that. Um, remains to be seen whether intended holdover actions, breach of lease actions, whether this particular, in fact, the Baltimore City Law it originally, um, as written, did not apply to tenant holdover and uh, breach of lease cases because those are different types of cases that don't involve um, the, the uh, right to redeem um, your property um, out of eviction. Um, those are completely different uh, types of cases. So I think that um, while that case may be pending, I don't think that it really affects what we're doing here today, which is to focus on failure to pay rent cases where a tenant has the right to redeem, should get uh, transparent notice um, before, so that they can indeed exercise that right to redeem, get the help that they need in order well, to exercise look, their If right I could, let me inter interrupt you there. So Mr. Hill indicated that in his view, uh, a lot of these tenants are not getting notice. As, as I read this bill, it looks like and people are bending over backwards to give notice, including posting it on the front door of the lease premises. In your experience, uh, from, from, from your job in, um, in your regional management company, which I, as I understand it, uh, manages hundreds of rental properties 
in Baltimore City. Um, are the tenants getting notice or are there situations more than a handful maybe where the tenants somehow failed to get notice? Well, there's a couple of things that, that needs to be said about that. Number one, yes, I think they're getting notice. Number two, you're right, regional management has about uh, 3,500 uh, Baltimore City, a little more than 3,500 Baltimore City units, and we have no trouble getting the notice out. Um, uh, we, have to, we landlords have the responsibility to make sure that that second notice that's seven days ahead of the date of the scheduled eviction actually gets posted on the door of the tenant. Um, and I see there's a requirement of an affidavit, the person who posted the notice. Yes, under a court. Right. Yes, uh, under the penalties of perjury. But I also might add that there is a mechanism within the bill, um, and it's within this bill too, where if on the day of eviction, the sheriff gets there to, per to oversee the eviction, and there is an allegation from the tenant that they did not receive notice, then that then he they the sheriff has the ability to halt move the moving forward of that um, at that eviction and take the disputed issue back to court for a judge to decide whether or not the eviction uh, notices were done as they are supposed to be done by law, whether or not the eviction should go forward or whether the eviction should not go forward. That, when, that's the fail safe mechanism. Okay, and when and when the case goes back to court, have, have has the judge ruled in any number of cases that the person who signed the affidavit that he put the notice on the door that he locked in his affidavit? Um, I have I have not heard of any of those cases. I can tell you that we have been back to court on some disputes like that, um, and we have you know it is up to the landlord to keep good records and bring their uh, the person who's posting those notices on the doors to court with them. So that they can um, we, you know, they can testify as to what they have done. Um, in my experience, um, there has never been in regional management's experience not been a not been a problem when even when we have come back to court for the dispute issue. Okay. Finally, Mr. Hill, uh, you indicated that there ought to be some post eviction retrieval <laughs> process. So, what is it you're contemplating that require the landlords to? pack all that, all the possessions like in, in U-Haul vehicles and take them to rental uh, units and store them in rental units for a period of time, what a month maybe, um, and, and then to allow the tenant uh, to retrieve belongings for a month. Is that what you're suggesting? Senator, that, that would be one way to approach um, the issue. Um, you could have a period of, of 48 hours, uh, for instance, where the tenant could come back to the property in order to retrieve, you know, essential belongings. Um, there are a number of approaches. And uh, again, some of the jurisdictions are mentioned in my, um, my testimony. I think in Prince George's County, I understand they give a, a four hour window after the eviction in which tenants can retrieve their belongings. And I just want to come back to, to clarify, I, I agree with Ms. Howard that the, the and I apologize if I misstood, misstated this in any way, the, the case is still pending um, in the U.S. District Court, and it does raise constitutional issues with respect to the Baltimore City Law as applied. I definitely intended holding over, but I think some of the reasoning could be applied in, in the fair to pay rent context as well. Um, but it's, it's, it is still pending. It's not a final decision, but it does raise important constitutional issues. Um, Thank you. Ms. Ms. Howard, um, let me finally ask you then. Uh, the suggestion was maybe uh, this could be amended to provide a four hour window um, after, after the door is padlocked. Uh, the, the, the evictor would have to leave the stuff in the apartment for four hours to allow the tenant to come back and take it out. Um, what do you think about that idea? Well, at, at this point, I think one of the things that immediately pops to my mind is that with the with the two notices, the 14 day notice and the seven uh, and the seven day notice, uh, giving an actual eviction date um, that that it's it's designed to make sure that the tenant um, is prepared and has safeguarded um, things like medications and and important documents like birth certificates and whatever else. Um, so that it, it's, it's not that there isn't enough transparency as to when, the, when they would be able to, uh, when, they, when their, their eviction is going to happen. 
However, having said that, um, I am aware that Prince George's County does have a, a period of time that you know, with, on eviction day where the tenant can come back and reclaim property. And I would certainly be happy to take that back to our, um, you know, our board and see whether or not that would be an amendment that we would be, um, it, we would su be supportive of. Um, I will say this, one of this, this topic was discussed at length during the negotiations in the Baltimore city law. And um, one of the concerns of the, of the landlord community is that if there is any quote unquote reclamation period, um, you have, it has to be a very short um, because what eventually, what legally potentially happens to the landlord then if the, the personal property remains in the property after the sheriff has given possession back to the landlord is um, what is known in the law as a bailment. And they, the landlord is not in a position to be a bailor of the tenant personal property and has no insurance for that, has no responsibility for that, and certainly uh, does not want to take on that responsibility because this is really supposed to be, if there is an ev actual eviction performed, the end of that relationship. So um, extending that relationship for any long length of time, 48 hours being a long length of time would be a problem, I think. Okay, got you. Thank you very much. No further questions. If I could just respond very briefly, uh, Senator, just to the, uh, there was a suggestion that I, I, that I had proposed four hours um, as, as a way, or that I just want to clarify, that's what Prince George's County does. I'm proposing something far, much longer, more along the lines of 48 hours. Again, because we have so many folks who tell us they didn't get notice. And frankly, if the landlord shows up with a, a posting and it has a signature on the bottom, the law says that's presumed to be good notice, um, right? As, uh, with a certificate of mailing, which can be uh, manipulated, let's say, what I've seen in the past. So it's, it, it, it is still a problem when tenants don't get good notice. All right, thank you, Mr. Hill and Ms. Howard. Senator West, thank you. Um, Senator Jackson, your hand is still up. Uh, here you are. Yeah, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, and I apologize. I had to jump off a couple of times. I, uh, I apologize, Senator Riley, um, if I missed this point. Um, I know this is an Anne Arundel County bill, um, and uh, I had to step away. Um, where is the Anne Arundel County Sheriff on this bill? And, I, and I'll preface it by saying, um, a few years back, AOBA and I think the uh, um, Mrs. Howard, Ms. Howard's organization put the bill in for st statewide bill. And I didn't know, did the Maryland Sheriff's Association weigh in as well? I mean, although this is a local bill, so. Right, one second here. Thank you. Uh, uh, before I answer you, uh, Senator Jackson, uh, Senator West, if you have a, a suggestion for an amendment, uh, thanks for sending it to the advocate, but you may want to ask me first. Senator Jackson, um, I had a long discussion with Sheriff uh, Jim Fredericks, and he's not in favor of this bill. He thinks okay. the status quo is fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I have to jump off, go back to Ihi, and I apologize. Uh, thank you for your- Excellent, thank you, Senator. thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Um, and what, I think we're concluded anyway, so thanks a lot. Uh, seeing no further questions, and it looks like that is the end of the hearing. Uh, so with that, that will conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 328. Let me move on to Senator Kramer. Is, has Senator Kramer entered the room? While we're waiting for Senator Kramer, Ms. Howard, you win the Room Raider competition for the day. Excellent background. Um, so Sandy, if, if Senator Kramer's not here, we can move to a committee member. Um, sorry, I muted myself. We are told to um, start with the panelists. I did alert his office um, and I will call them again. Okay, so then the first panelist after Senator Kramer would be the Reverend Kobe Little. So Mr. Little, I see you down there. If you'd like to speak on the bill, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. 
Uh, it's good to see you all even, uh, even virtually. I'm here on behalf of the NAACP Maryland State Conference to offer our, our full support for Senate Bill 128. Uh, this legislation would provide uh, financial and other uh, remedies as an option uh, in civil uh, cases where there has uh, been uh, a commission of a, of a hate crime. And I'd like to just frame uh, my testimony on this legislation this year um, through this lens. Hate is antithetical to democracy. And we saw on January 6th, the deleterious impact of hate and how it feeds and fuels um, anti-democratic movements. Um, the president of the United States, Joe Biden has declared that now is the time for us to build back better. And uh, the charge is that we take bold uh, action. And at every level, I believe, Mr. Chairman, that Americans must do their part to create, a, create the beloved community, to create an environment that supports uh, community and, and, and the peaceful engagement of society and advances our democracy. Uh, in Maryland, one of the ways that we can do that is to pass this legislation, which would allow a judge to levy a, a financial uh, penalty or to direct uh, a, a, a person found uh, liable uh, to do, do other things. And we think this is important because it, one, will offer an opportunity for repair. When people are victimized by hate crimes, uh, they are damaged. And one of the ways that we can repair that damage is through a financial compensation and through uh, letters of apology and other expressions that uh, hold uh, violators accountable. And then the second point is that uh, a financial uh, penalty is not only a deterrent or it's not only a an opportunity for repair, but it's also a deterrent. And so we support this legislation wholeheartedly. We believe that if people are held to financial account for the commission of hate crimes, um, it will deter them from, from committing hate crimes in the future. And this is a small but important way that the state of Maryland can stand up now today in the fight against hate. So we're very delighted that Senator Kramer has, has offered this legislation again. And we stand with our colleagues on this panel who will also testify in support of the bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the members of the committee. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Little. It's always good to see you. Uh, so now I see we have Senator Kramer here. Uh, Senator Kramer, uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the Judicial Proceedings Committee. Uh, ben Kramer here to introduce Senate Bill 128, and I thank the good Reverend Little for uh, kicking off the discussion of this legislation. Uh, he is a great partner in this effort to address the issue of protecting our residents from hate crimes and from being victimized. Um, Senate Bill 128 provides the missing legal mechanism for victims of bias-related violence or intimidation to initiate a civil action against the perpetrator or perpetrators of the crime. Biased crimes are acts motivated by prejudice and hatred. These ugly crimes affect the fundamental rights of the victim as well as the group, the group of which the victim is a member or is perceived to be a member. The consequences of hate crimes go well beyond the individual who is the victim. These acts rooted in prejudice and disdain for an individual based on what they are creates fear, anger, a sense of isolation, and occasionally retribution from similarly identified minority groups. Biased crimes pose a unique danger to society. More often than not, perpetrators of biased crimes do not act alone, but act in a group to shield themselves from the responsibility of their prejudice-rooted actions. 
in the free state of Maryland, where we have a proud heritage of embracing our diversity, acts of violence or intimidation based on a person's race, color, creed, sexual orientation, gender, disability, or national origin cannot be ignored nor condoned. In recent years, there has been a dramatic, and I emphasize dramatic surge in bias-generated violence targeting immigrants, African-Americans, Jews, the LGBTQ community, women, and Muslims. This legislation serves the purpose of discouraging people from acting on their biases and it serves as a statement, and this is important, as a statement that we as a community do not tolerate violence motivated by prejudice. With the passage of this bill, we will join better than 30 of our fellow states that have similar laws on their books to allow a person or persons who are a victim of our hate crime laws to bring a civil action against the perpetrator of the crime. And I would like to point out to the committee that I introduced legislation two years ago in 2019 that was similar to what's before you today. However, there were three prominent points of contention that were the result of the hearing and the discussion when that bill was introduced. This bill, has addressed all three of those points of contention. This is a far more targeted bill than what was introduced two years ago. Uh, two years ago, the provision that would allow the attorney general to step into the shoes of an individual who was a victim of one of these hate crimes and to go into court on their behalf, file civil action. That was a contentious point and it is out of the bill now. That is no longer part of this legislation. There was a concern about non-economic damages for property damage. That is out of this bill now. It qualifies that non-economic damages under paragraphs one and two of this subsection may not include emotional distress or mental anguish caused solely by the need to replace or repair personal or real property. So that piece of it that was the subject of contention, and I, under, I, heard, I heard the committee and I got it. It's not part of the bill this year. Finally, the bill is very clear and specific about who we are hoping to help with passage of this legislation. And it is a person who is the victim, the person who is the victim of an act. So we are very specific, we are very clear. It's a very concise piece of legislation. Committee, I would proffer to you all that now more than ever is the time we need to send a message to the haters that we aren't going to tolerate it. And it's also more now than ever a time to send to our communities a message that we are taking this issue of hate crimes very seriously here in our Maryland state legislature, and we are highlighting it and raising it to a higher standard of regard and let our citizens, our residents of this state know we care. With that, uh, I thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. Uh, I welcome any questions or we can move on to, uh, uh, other witnesses. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kramer. So we'll finish, we'll round out your panel, then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, so next we'll have um, Mr. Wiesel, Ms. Wiesel, Sarah, uh, Meredith, there you are. How are you? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the committee and Senator Kramer, always a pleasure to be with you at judicial proceedings. Um, for the record, again, Meredith Weisel, just like last week uh, with the Anti-Defamation League with ADL. And we're pleased to be here supporting Senator Kramer with Senate Bill 128, the Hate Crime Civil Remedy Bill. I wanna point out a few things. So in 1981, ADL was actually part of crafting the first model hate crimes laws in the country. 
And now there are 46 states as well as the District of Columbia that all have hate crime laws on the books. The most recent state, Georgia, we're very excited, joined last year in 2020. And of all the states, 33 states, including the District of Columbia, have hate crime victims, have hate crime laws where victims can take a civil cause of action to pursue statutory claims for harms under the hate crime statute. It's important to remember that behind every hate crime statistic, there's a person, there's a family, a community who is dealing with the unimaginable. Hate crimes cause a distinct type of harm. They have a lasting and measurable impact. And we all know that the hate crimes are targeting people due to their protective and immutable characteristics, things like race, religion, the LGBT community, um, gender uh, disability, gender identity. And it's important to note that in appropriate cases, civil remedies provisions can be incredibly powerful tools for the hate crimes victims. First, you need to remember that statutory provisions make sure that victims can recover for the harm caused by the bias motivation itself. I wanna repeat that, they can recover for the harm caused by the bias motivation itself. It's not merely for the damages that flow from the underlying torts that have happened. The victims get to show by a preponderance of the evidence that they were targeted because of their protected characteristics. Senate Bill 28 is that type of bill. It's going to provide injunctive relief, reasonable attorney's fees and costs as, as Senator Kramer laid out. Look, there's no magic wand that's going to wave the, the um, undo the irreparable harm that hate crimes cause. But in Maryland, we need to continue to make sure that our laws and our policies are crafted in a way that help to prevent the rising tide that we have continued to see over the past several years. And we expect 2020, the numbers to come back are even higher than what we saw in 2019. So with this, we think it's extremely important that this committee give the Senate Bill 128 a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you very Hi. much. All right, um, for the staff there, just make sure you're muted. Um, uh, okay, there we go. Next, we will move on to Sarah Mickey. I don't know your, your, uh, your new last name correctly. So. <laughs> yes, sorry, it is Mickey. Yes. Good afternoon, Chair Smith, Vice Chair Wallstriker, and members of the committee. I'm Sarah Mursky Mickey, Deputy Director of the Baltimore Jewish Council, which represents the Associated Jewish Community Federation of Baltimore and all of its agencies. I'm here today in support of SB 128, Hate Crime Civil Remedies which has been explained by the sponsor and previous speakers. Like everyone testifying in support, the BJC is concerned with the ever increasing amount of hate bias incidents in this country and in this state, from white supremacists to storm the Capitol with Nazi apparel or t-shirts that said 6 million was not enough, to the increasing amount of swastikas found spray painted in Baltimore and other parts of the state, including an incident from just the other night. According to the 2019 Maryland State Hate Bias Report by the police, which is highly underreported, Maryland experienced an average of 386 hate bias incidents each year from 2017 to 2019. And there were 10 more incidents reported from 2019 as compared to 2018, with anti-Black followed by anti-Jewish making up the majority of total incidents. These incidents were reported in all of Maryland's jurisdictions. While there is a criminal statute for hate crimes, our state is one of the few states that did not have a specific cause of action for hate crimes for civil suits. While victims can still bring tort claims against their perpetrators, but not for the bias, what is important is that words and names have meaning. This is the same reason we have a criminal statute for hate crimes, because even though those crimes are actual prosecutable crimes, when someone is victimized simply due to who they are, due to their gender identity, religion, race, etc., that type of crime deserves a special name. This should also be true on the civil side in Maryland, like it is in the majority of other states. Lastly, allowing tribal damages on the civil side, similar in context to some criminal enhancements for hate crimes, further acknowledges the heinous behind the offender's actions. And for these reasons, we ask for a favorable report of SB 128. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And I think that concludes the testimony for the proponents. We'll now move to the opposition panel. We have one witness, Mr. McAvoy, are you still here? I don't see Mr. McAvoy. So then that will conclude the testimony in the panel. Uh, questions from- He's here, I've asked him to unmute. Okay. 
Yes, thank you. Can you hear me all right? We can, there you are. Yes. Right, thank you so much. I'm sorry I got to switch that sits for the two committees. Um, thank you. I want to um, start off by saying that um, I have a real issue with the scope of this bill, um, and I'm hoping that you're going to shut it down for that reason. The scope um, is extremely wide, and as we just say, we can already talk toward on this. If we have actual criminal issues, we can actually have those handled as well. Um, so the duplicative nature of it is a real problem. The other uh, issue is that it's getting into feelings. These issues with feelings, they can't be uh, qualified. This is just someone expressing their concern and asking for rem remuneration for that. Um, and I, I want to part, point out an issue that, that's alarming that our state is doing, where we are financially incentivizing certain groups, including churches, mosques, churches, synagogues, um, for reparations from the state. There was an article in the Baltimore Sun about uh, two years ago, a local archbishop appeared on it, caught my eye. And I, I, I think that we, we mustn't have institutions coming to the state saying, where, you know, with a tin cup, where are my reparations? Because we experienced hate and somehow uh, trying to drum that up. We've also found that, that sometimes these happen in say religious schools. We found it wasn't an adult. We found it was the students in the schools. We know this for a fact in Montgomery County. Uh, and I don't know if this person represented the entire group, but when, when we're talking about sexuality issues being immutable, look, they're either immutable or fluid, they're not both. Um, and so the issue of trying to remunerate someone for their proclivities, I think, is, is wrongful for the state to get involved with it. It's something that in a court, you can basically just walk in and say, as of today, I am thus. So, um, and that's, I think that's a smaller part to where I just bring up that as, as, as detailing the facts on the issue. But really the issue with this bill is feelings. There's nothing objective to it. And we already have objective issues. I think JPRB will advise not to create duplicative um, bills. Um, I urge you on favor. Well, thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Um, McAvoy. Um, we have some questions from uh, the committee and I see Senator Sidnor uh, before I unmute Senator Sidnor, just in the future for the guests, um, just make sure that our rules are that you have to have when you're testifying, your camera's on and you are uh, visible. So uh, I know Ms. McAvoy, you're toggling between two things, but um, the next time let's, let's get, get you in the screen. All right, Senator Sidnor, you're up next. Thank you very much. And this question is for Mr. McAvoy, because I'm looking at the legislation and I'm trying to understand where it talks anything about your feelings. And, and, and that's, that's question number one. And question number two, uh, you were speaking about reparations, but I'm not understanding where it gets into state providing reparations. So I just want to know if you might be able to point me to where you're talking about within the language. Sorry, I got muted. Um, the uh, the issue with reparations was was actually a reimbursement from the state regarding a Baltimore Sun article in 2019. Uh, I'm going to pull up the bill to talk about the feelings issue. But I'm but I'm talking about on the bill. I, I'm t I was talking to the, to to issue of cause or to. Um, but this is for a, a civil action for something that's I mean it's, it's already in the law. So this will provide damages for a violation of something that's already in the law. Am I correct, uh, Senator Kramer? Thank you. Uh, so so to, to my question, where is the state providing reparations under this bill? That's, the, again, the word was used in reference to an article in 2019 that okay. incentivize that, that's that issue. The issue having to do with the feelings issue is right in C, subsection two, number one, pain and suffering. Um, number four, loss of enjoyment, loss of companionship services, number five. Other well, those, but those are just non-economic damages other that anyone can get under any type of, this, that, those are just so, any type of non-economic damages that anyone can get under any six, type of civil action, correct? non-pecuniary loss. So the issue was, 
Senator, that these I'm, issues are not subjective. Could you could you answer my? They're 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 completely subjective. They're not objective issues. Then it goes down but, to three. It says non-economic damages under paragraph. So, Mr. McAvoy, do you have an it. issue of non-economic damages for just civil remedies? Period. I say that again. You have a problem with non-economic damages in any type of civil type case. Glenn, we are actually, the, the issue has to do with duplication. We already have a victim services uh, act, which we actually- No, no, could you answer my question, please? Yes, it's duplicative. And yes, I do have an issue with it being duplicative, yes. You have an, you have an issue with non-economic damages for any type of civil remedies? With it being duplicative because of, of we already have victim services, that can be solved. You have, but, the, but this isn't about services. This is about damages. And damages. Yes, and damages. Am I wrong about that? Do we? Does Maryland not have a victim services committee and a victim services um, aid? Mr. Chair, I'm 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 fine. I'm 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 good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Senator Sidnor. Uh, looking around the Zoom room for additional questions. Seeing none, uh, with that, that'll conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 128. Thank you, Senator Kramer, and thank, thank you to the panelists. Uh, we'll now move on to, I see Senator Ellis is here with us. We'll move on to Senate Bill 130. Senator Ellis, you are up and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Chairman Smith, uh, Vice Chair Wall Street, Arthur Ellis, representing Charles County, District 28 in the Senate of Maryland, uh, esteemed uh, committee members. Uh, it's my pleasure to come before you this afternoon to present Senate Bill 130 and to ask for your favorable support. Senate Bill 130 addresses the landlord and tenant to failure to pay rent and late fees during public health, public emergencies. Uh, this bill establishes that a landlord may not demand or be entitled to a late fee for the failure to pay rent if a tenant is an impacted tenant who provides written notice to the landlord. The bill's provisions apply during the course of a declared state of emergency, catastrophic public health emergency, or other similar event. The bill takes effect January, I'm sorry, June 1, 2021, and expresses the intent of the General Assembly for the bill to apply retroactively to the extent authorized by law to all failures to pay rent actions arising after March 5, 2020. And could I just say March 5, 2020 is when the current state of emergency was uh, enacted. I having to do with the COVID um, period. I must say that, um, you know, I've been in negotiation with some of the parties that will be impacted by this bill. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, uh, most of them are here to support the bill with amendments. And I have to say that I spoke to the folks representing Maryland Multi-Housing Association and uh, they come in favorably for support of, with support for SB 130. And some of the changes, I think uh, you have the amendments. I accept those as friendly amendments. Uh, we negotiated a change in the bill uh, one called for, say, a nine-month period after uh, health or any emergency is over for this to be in effect. We want to change that to uh, five months. So that's a negotiated uh, time period right there. And uh, let me see uh, if I could go into some of the uh, details of this bill. Um, I mentioned the impacted tenant. That means a residential tenant who suffers a job loss or a reduction in household income of at least 50% at the time the state is under a proclamation. 
issued on the title 14 of the public safety article. Um, the landlord is permitted to make a reasonable request for information from the impacted tenant and uh, notice from the uh, former employer or current employer about a reduction in wages, bank statements, etc. cetera. Um, the landlord is authorized to verify this information and this bill provisions apply for the entire duration of a declared state of emergency. And um, in the fiscal notes, um, it talks about potentially meaningful impact on small businesses. But I must say, in negotiating with the uh, uh, businesses, the uh, association, say who, uh, let's say the Maryland Multi Housing Association, they have uh, 178,000 rental homes in their association, over 700 apartment communities in Maryland. These are the people who will be impacted by this. And so uh, we've negotiated with them and you'll hear from them uh, with their amendments and but with their support uh, in an overwhelming manner. So with that, uh, I wanna thank you uh, chairman and committee for hearing this and um, open up for any questions in whichever order you so choose. All right, excellent. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and so now we'll, we'll uh, go to your panel and then take questions at the end. Um, and so first up, we'll have um, Mr. Shaw, Zephyr Shaw. I saw him in the room. You're up next. There you go. Let's see. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Smith, uh, Vice Chair. Wall Striker, members of the committee. My name is Zafar Shah. I'm an attorney in the Human Rights to Housing uh, Project at Public Justice Center. Um, I'll, I'll get straight to our um, points on this bill. Um, the principle at the core of this bill is one that Public Justice Center believes in. Amid a state declared emergency, it doesn't make sense to add penalties and late fees on top of mounting rental debt. At a median uh, rent in Maryland, a 5% uh, late fee is about $70. Uh, and of course, that's meaningful uh, money that could, in, instead of uh, paying a late fee, could be helping a family uh, keep their power on uh, and what have you. Um, there's two points, uh, really three points, uh, where we would like to see amendments on this bill. One is in the definition of impacted renter. Secondly, in the documentation requirement. And thirdly, we have uh, concerns about preemption of, of local laws on the same subject matter. The impacted renter definition using a 50% loss of income rule uh, is proportional and it's sort of like a flat tax issue. It seems fair on its face, but ends up with bad results, particularly for lower income Maryland households. Uh, and we've, we've covered that in our, in our written testimony. For instance, if a, a family with $200,000 income suffers a 50% loss, they're covered by this bill, although they have $100,000 income. A $35,000 income household, however, if they suffered a 25% loss, uh, they would not be covered by this bill despite having far less income. So that's a problem. We'd much rather see a substantial loss of income definition similar to that used in Governor Hogan's executive order on evictions um, and seen elsewhere. Um, secondly, the documentation requirement uh, is simply onerous on tenants. Uh, rather than allow the tenant to provide some documentation uh, that they can access with their and provide with their notice, this bill allows, in its specific lang language, allows a landlord to request any documentation, and then there's no uh, language about what, uh, what limitations there might be. For instance, if a landlord must accept the submitted documentation after a first request or may continue to make repeated requests that ultimately affect a runaround on the, the late fee protection. Um, this bill is kind of in contrast to what we've seen in Prince George's County, Howard County, Baltimore City, Frederick, where there are late fee protections uh, that don't require uh, notice and documentation and therefore have broader reach. Um, but it, but we, don't we don't contend that notice is a bad thing here. Uh, it's simply that onerous documentation requirements really kill the protection. Baltimore, uh, Baltimore County passed a similar protection to this bill in September of 2020. And their language simply says that at, 
you know, um, if, the, if, the, if the tenant is impacted, they should demonstrate it in written or electronic proof. And it doesn't go into repeated uh, types of documentation. So we, we support this bill. We're happy to work with the sponsor. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. And then next we'll move to uh, Ms. Johnson. I see you, she's over there. You are up next. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Corey Johnson and I'm an attorney and the Senior Policy Research Analyst at the Job Opportunities Task Force. Here at JLTF, we advocate for meaningful employment opportunities for low-skill, low-wage workers. Additionally, we advocate for the elimination of barriers that are plaguing the Maryland workforce. One of the largest obstacles plaguing hundreds of thousands of Maryland workers is the lack of financial stability, especially in the current public health crisis. The governor's proposed 2022 budget indicates that at the peak of the economic shutdown, nearly 400,000 Marylanders lost their jobs, their jobs, largely in part due to COVID-19. This current public health emergency has left a spirit of financial uncertainty in all Marylanders, regardless of their socioeconomic status. With the stratification of the polarizing economic times, our state economy has been particularly unforgiving for low-skill, low-wage workers as food insecurity is at an all-time high and rates of homelessness has spiked. The Aspen Institute estimated in August that 30 million to 40 million people could be at risk for eviction during the months spanning August of 2020 and December of 2020. According to the United Way of Central Maryland, in September of 2020, 9% of Marylanders are at or below the threshold of living paycheck to paycheck. To remedy the impact of the virus on living conditions in Maryland, as you all know, last year, Governor Hogan issued an eviction prevention moratorium at the beginning of the pandemic that ran until December 31st, as it was essential to protect the human rights of Maryland residents. Senate Bill 130 follows the same type of equity and decriminalization of poverty. It will prevent landlords from charging certain late fees during the public health emergencies and other emergencies. Particularly, SB 130 identifies that if a tenant, as a result, at as a result of a job loss during a state declared emergency has suffered a 50% reduction in household income, it would eliminate fees associated with late payments. Financial uncertainty is already a monster hovering over the shoulders of Marylanders that are trying to recover from the socioeconomic impact that the virus has had. Reducing this strain by preventing landlords to tacking on additional fees to individuals during public health emergencies is absolutely necessary. For the reasons above, I urge a favorable report of Senate Bill 130. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next we have um, is Grayson Wiggins here. Oh, there you are. All right, you're up next, Mr. Wiggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, Grayson Wiggins on behalf of the Maryland Multi-Housing Association as the sponsor noted, we did have some conversations with him about amendments to the bill. Uh, some of those did happen after the 48 hour de testimony deadline, unfortunately. So last night we were directed by staff uh, for the committee to send our new amendments that we negotiated with the sponsor to members directly. Additionally, committee council has a copy. I would encourage you to focus on those amendments and not the original written testimony that we submitted. We have three amendments. Uh, the first establishes a nexus between the job loss and the event that leads to the emergency. Uh, the second amendment, as the sponsor noted, uh, reduces the time after the, the end of the proclamation from nine months to five. And then the third amendment clarifies that when we start talking about the documentation that the tenant has to provide, and Mr. Shaw touched on this a bit, our amendment would just clarify that if a tenant can't provide that information for the purposes of the COVID-19 emergency, they could provide a signed copy of the CDC eviction declaration form to the landlord. Uh, we think that may resolve some of the concerns about the documents, but I'd be happy to talk to Mr. Shaw offline. I, I, I wanna commend the sponsor for bringing this bill and his motivation behind it. As he noted, uh, we are an industry association. We do. Uh, have a few more members than, than the sponsor mentioned. We house over half a million residents, not not 100,000. Uh, but I, I think we can get this done and, and we're generally supportive of the bill with the amendments that I mentioned. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Wiggins. Uh, so that rounds up the panel for the proponents. We'll now switch to the opposition panel. And here he is again, Mr. McAvoy. Thank you so much, Senator and committee. Um, I, Senator Ellis, I, I, I applaud his attempt at this to help mitigate this horrible situation that's going on in our state. The finances of our state has been have been devastated. We have over a 4,300% increase on unemployment. And frankly, even with 50% reduction in rent, I don't know how people are affording rent. It is, um, it is unparalleled. It has never happened in the state before. My issue with this bill is not the intention. Um, I, I, I was good hearing that lobbyists from the Renters Association are there so they can speak to the finances. Uh, but the issue is is where we're Wisconsin, where we're slapping in the Title 14 issue into um, the actual bill. The, the concept like we're going to have an ongoing emergency should be of immense alarm to all of us today at in probably less than an hour over in HDO, there's going to be a bill to actually get, and I don't know who has actually signed up in your committee to speak to ending the state of emergency. This is unparalleled. We don't have a state of emergency going on that warrants this entire destruction of our economy, our state, and we're forcing people into hopeless situations, including homelessness. And so I really urge, um, I, I, I honestly, in my heart, this is speaking off the bill, think that these per these efforts will be better directed in the state of emergency than trying to band-aid what has been caused by the executive uh, branch. And this is your job. Your job is to check that executive branch. Um, I don't know how we can go on like this, honestly. Uh, I, again, I do applaud Senator Ellis. I love his heart, and uh, and I thank that, I'm thankful that he looked into this, but we have a really, really big issue. Thank you for your time, committee. All right, thank you, Mr. McAvoy. Um, so with that, that concludes the, uh, the testimony for the panel, I mean, for this bill. Looking around the room for questions from senators, we have one, Senator Cassidy. Senator Cassidy, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, uh, Mr. Wiggins, who do, who do you represent? I'm sorry, if you unmute, Mr. Wiggins. Sorry. There you go. Uh, the Maryland Multi-Housing Association. Okay, and, and you were, that's what I thought, and you, you said that you were, you were provo proposing an alternative to the um, documentation the bill requires that in the alternative, the tenant could just simply submit the CDC notice? Is that what you said? Yes, yes. So the, the bill requires tenants in certain situations that a reasonable request from the landlord to provide that information. Our members right. mentioned that they would be happy to accept the CDC eviction declaration form, which is signed under penalty of perjury. And that just says, I got, I'm, I'm unemployed or my employment is reduced and that's done, right? Yeah, it, that, well, it says a little more than that. Uh, yeah, but not, not much. Um, and then, and you would accept that instead of, and that would be whose election, the landlord's election or the tenant's election? Our members are happy to accept it after. So if you look at our amendment, the third amendment we sent over, I believe it's worded that if we make a reasonable request for the documents and the tenant cannot provide those documents, you know, a letter from an employer or something like that, that we would accept the CDC declaration form in that case for the purposes of COVID-19. Okay. And then if, if I just ask uh, Senator Ellis real quick, a couple of questions. This is more clarifying, uh, Senator Ellis. The, it says, uh, I'm on page two of the bill, line 24. It says uh, the landlord may make a reasonable request for documents. Um, so I, I assume what, what, what's not clear to me is, is, is that request made to the tenant or does the landlord have to make a request to the former employer, current employer and to the bank? Or are they asking the tenant to provide those documents? I'm not really clear from the from the bill. So uh, thank you for that great question, uh, Senator Cassidy. So um, so if the t everything comes through the tenant, so okay. the tenant so has a request to the tenant. Gotcha. You ask yeah. the, as the landlord asks the tenant, and the tenant gets the stuff from the bank and the employer. 
Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Senator Castley, and thank you, Senator Ellis. Looking around thank the you. room, seeing no further questions, that will conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 130. Thank you, Senator Ellis. Mm -hmm. I see that Senator McRae is in the room. So we have Senate Bill 98. Senator McRae, uh, you're up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, all members of uh, JPR. Um, I come to you on a bill that I've come to you three years in a row, and I actually came one year in the House when I was in the House of Delegates. Uh, I put this bill forward on Senate Bill 98. Um, Senate Bill 98, uh, county boards and public and non-public pre-kindergarten pre programs and school discrimination prohibition. This bill simply uh, establishes a prohibition against uh, public and non-public schools that receive state funding, making ensuring that there's no discriminatory acts uh, for any person because of their individual race, ethnicity, color, religion, sex, age, national origin, marital status, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. Um, this bill also requires written policies uh, about that prohib prohibited discrimination and it creates an administrative process with the Maryland Department of Education, uh, which a student or family member may file a complaint or discrimination of discrimination and request the MSDE provide a remedy or mediate to alleviate the discrimination. Um, today, I will be joined by um, my, my partner for over the last four years, MSCA, um, and also a student to talk about why the importance of passing Senate Bill 98 and like I said, I won't belabor because you've heard this three straight years. Uh, many of the folks that's on here outside of my good friend, uh, Senator Jackson. Um, but I'd also, as I close, just ask for a favorable report and ask that this is the year that we can get Senate Bill 98 across the finish line. All right, thank you, Senator McRae. And I hear you have a stellar cross file for this bill. Um, that's good stuff. Uh, all right, so what we're gonna start off with is Miss Dove in the room. Is Tina here? Here you are. Hey, Ms. Dove, there you are. You're up first. I see you're multitasking, you got a lot going on. Yes, there's a, an MFCA meeting happening as we speak. So I apologize for that, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Tina Dove. Um, as has been said, I am with the Maryland State Education Association. Um, and let's get you on the right screen. Here we go. Um, so uh, we are in support, as you all know, because you've seen me a million times testifying on this bill, we are in support of SB 98. Um, the bill is really simple. It's really just about um, providing every single child with a safe and inclusive school environment and making sure that we respect the ways in which those children show up in the world, however they show up in the world. It's also about ensuring that every child that attends a school that is funded by state and public dollars, either in whole or in part, and federal dollars, um, that those children are um, afforded the equal protection under the law that is uh, required under state and federal law. In 2019, Free State Justice, one of our allies on this bill, um, they had they conducted a statewide, um, or rather they did a statewide analysis um, and they released some data that I think is really important for us to note in this moment. What they found is they did a needs assessment of students um, in, a, in a statewide listening tour. And the top two issues that came from this needs assessment lived in the spaces of health and education in terms of the concerns of the LB LGBTQ community. And these results came as no surprise because unfortunately the data that they saw speaks very clearly and it's data that we've seen for a number of years. What they found was that a majority of the Merlin LGBTQ students feel unsafe in their school. 64% of our LGB students and 44% of our transgender students respectively. 65% of students reported being harassed or assaulted at school based on their orientation or their gender identity. Most students, about 54% of them, never reported the incident to school staff and only 29% of the students who reported incidences said that it resulted in the staff intervention. Less than 15% of the students reported that their schools had comprehensive non-discrimination and anti-bullying policies. Lest we forget, 
these are real people and serious consequences behind these numbers. They're not, they're not just data, they're not just statistics. These are real people, these are kids. These are our kids. The Trevor Project, a national LGBTQ crisis intervention and suicide prevention service for youth, receives nearly 1,500 calls each year from LGBTQ Maryland youth considering suicide or self-harm. I think we can all agree that one person, one young person that is considering suicide or self-harm is one person too many. And this should especially weigh heavily on all of us right now, given the trauma that we have all sustained during our quarantine and during this pandemic. We should all be thinking and grappling with the very heavy weight of the behavioral and mental health challenges we face post pandemic. And this is on top of the challenges that these children in this community faced before we went into the crisis. So really, we need to be thinking about this bill in a way differently than we have in years before. We don't have an inch of, move, of room to move with. We have got to protect all of our babies including the ones that are members of the LGBTQ plus NIA community. Some have argued in the past that this legislation is really an effort um, to unfairly and unconstitutionally deny religious freedom and First Amendment rights to schools and to and encroach on their ability to freely exercise their religion. And that's absolutely not the case. The acceptance of public funding by a non-public school is entirely voluntarily. It's not mandatory. If a public school wishes to not um, accept that funding, they don't have to. If a public or non-public school chooses to accept the funding, then they have two choices at hand. They can either not discriminate, which seems relatively simple, or they can choose not to accept the funding. The requirements in this bill, as you well know, are not new to the recipients of either public or not, the non-public or public recipients of funding. In fact, these are things that are longstanding requirements for everyone. For our non-public schools that are participants in the textbook and technology program, in the boost voucher program, et cetera, they are all made to sign an assurances document that says very clearly that they will not violate um, the civil rights and civil liberties. They won't discriminate against any of the protected classes according to federal and state law. So these are not new, nothing is new. We're just codifying this in law because as you all know that that language only exists, <clears throat> excuse me, in budget language. It does not exist in state statute. And we're also making this applicable to both public and wow. not schools. In closing, I think 2020 yeah. means it's time for us to make a change. In 2021, we need to protect all of our students and make their school environments healthy, safe and supportive learning and teaching environments. We ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dove. Uh, appreciate your testimony and uh, good luck with the multitasking. Um, all right, next we have Mr. Young. I see you're here. You're up next. Uh, how you doing, Chair Smith? Uh, thank you and to the members of the committee. Uh, my name is Kaylin Young, Public Policy Director here at the ACLU of Maryland, here in support of Senate Bill 98. Um, unlike other parts of Maryland law, such as public accommodations, employment, and fair housing, uh, Maryland's education laws do not have codified anti-discrimination protections for students. MSDE does have some stated guidance, uh, but that guidance does not provide for the legal protections of a codified anti-discrimination policy. Uh, so what this legislation simply does is codifies that policy uh, and provides also for uh, a process of, uh, of complaint and remedy uh, for people who are uh, victimized uh, or discriminated against under, the, under what would be that policy. Uh, Senate Bill 98 codifies the same provisions included in the budget language every year uh, and adds protections for uh, students with disabilities. Uh, the ACLU of Maryland would also uh, like to just point out that uh, those who, um, victim, who are victims of discrimination of these discriminatory acts, um, again, do not have a clear right of action or process. This bill creates that right of action and process for, so they can seek remedy uh, and by requiring the schools to have clear policies of discrimination similar to those detailed in school codes of conduct, students and their families will know how to file complaints and seek corrective action uh, and resolution uh, to their discriminatory actions. Uh, and with that, we urge a favorable report. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Young. Uh, next we have 
Wetter, Wetterine, Lou, how are you? I'm good, how are you? You're up next. Um, all right, so uh, thank you all for having me here, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Lou Wetterin, and I am here to speak in support of Senate Bill 98. I am here today both as a student of Richard Montgomery High School and as president of a student-led LGBT advocacy organization named MoCo Pride. I'm here on behalf of my fellow students and on behalf of the members of my organization because I am fortunate enough to know that being here today will not present any dire consequences to me. And I do mean fortunate. In many ways, my security arises from luck. For me, for example, when I was changing my name on the school roster, it was a relatively painless process. I believe this is for three reasons. One, my school, Richard Montgomery, makes an effort to be inclusive and attentive to students. Two, my mom is a strong woman who always has my back. And three, my mother was a teacher at my school. My friend had the two, first two of these three advantages. And yet when he asked to make his name different on the school roster, he was asked to present legal papers, which was a discouraging and humiliating process. In a strange display of nepotism, my mother's position allowed me to avoid unnecessary hoops and distress. But a student's rights should not depend on who they know. In schools, LGBT students band together for our own protection. We pa pass out flyers and documents stating our rights and what we can and cannot expect from our schools. While other students warn their friends, watch out, Mrs. X is a harsh grader, or promise Mr. Y is flexible with deadlines, we tell each other, be careful, Mr. A will not like calling you by a different name, or if someone's giving you trouble, go to Mrs. B, she'll help you out. School is already difficult, but trying to pass a class with a teacher who has a grudge against you is near impossible. For this reason, students will not speak up without protection from retaliation. This is why we need the Inclusive Schools Act. Please support the Inclusive School Act Bill 98 and protect your students. Thank you for your consideration and we urge for a favorable report. Thank you, Ms. Winter, and thank you for taking the time and sharing your story and your perspective. Um, next, we will have uh, Mr. Lamaster. Jeremy, are you here? All right, while Mr. Lamaster is getting set up, we're gonna move over to Mr. Hurwitz. Mr. Hurwitz, you're up next. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you again this week. Urging you to add an amendment to SB 98 to expand the prohibition to include a county board that provides private or parochial busing. Last year, about a year ago, when I learned that Howard County was providing parochial busing, I ended up writing a very long memo to the county council regarding it because I discovered a couple things in the bill that apparently being ignored over the years. It says that the funds weren't supposed to come from property taxes. And it says three times that the school's not receiving state aid. Turns out, apparently for the last two decades or so, the schools were participating in the school textbook money and the non-aging public school money and boost scholarships. As part of my analysis, I used the legal documents that Bethel Christian Academy had filed after they were kicked out of the programs in 2018 for violating the non-discrimination provisions. Apparently that's still being litigated with the state. But by using their documents, I concluded that they were even would admit that they were receiving state aid. But paradoxically, now that they were no longer receiving state aid, they now became legal under the Howard County provision for parochial busing by the absence of participating in the state programs. So it's a little paradoxical that you get kicked out of one program for violating the discrimination provisions and then it makes you eligible for another one. So it would seem that you should close that loophole and paradox by dealing with the few counties that apparently still having local laws for private and parochial uh, school busing. If you have any questions. No, thank you very much, Mr. Hurwitz. We're gonna take questions at the end. Um, so Mr. Lamaster, I see you there. Uh, you're up next, good to see you. 
Great, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, committee members, for having me here today. My name is Jeremy Lamaster. My pronouns are he, him, and they, them, and I'm the Executive Director of Free State Justice, a statewide LGBTQ legal services and advocacy organization. We help represent thousands of uh, Maryland LGBTQ folks across the state, including those that are facing discrimination, um, including the ones that subject here today, um, youth and families um, that are sort of at the center of this act. Uh, Ms. Dove did a great job at summarizing a needs assessment that Free State Justice conducted in 2016, um, surveying the needs of our community members. One of the top issues that came up again and again, county by county, was education. And in looking at education and the issues that Ms. Dove described, the similar sentiment came up that students didn't feel safe. I myself, um, as a queer person growing up, um, I went to a parochial school for 12 years. Um, I grew up in a state where we did not have anti-discrimination protections, and I also had no means um, to sort of be, I had no clear path um, in which to seek support, seek help, um, and, to, and to, to get and address these needs of discriminations as I experienced them. What I find most exciting about this legislation is that it really outlines a clear process for students and their families to be able to be heard when the discrimination is, felt, is, is, is levied. I find it disheartening that when students do experience discrimination, they don't feel the, the ability or safety to report it, whether that be to their, super, to their superiors, to their teachers, to their caregivers, and we hope that this bill addresses that today. Evidence shows that when there are comprehensive anti-discrimination uh, policies in schools, students are less likely to hear negative remarks, are less likely to report, or are more likely to report incidents, are less likely to face violence, and are more likely to have staff interventions and staff support. Another issue here is that even though we have policies in different counties and different school districts across the state, um, in our casework, we notice that different students in different uh, communities have uh, uh, different policies. Um, and we really envision a Maryland where no matter where you live in the state, you have protection and you have support and your voice will be heard. We want Maryland students to have an excellent education and we need to ensure that schools are safe, welcoming and affirming to all. Um, with that, we strongly urge a favorable report for this bill. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Lamaster. And so I think that concludes the testimony for the proponents. We'll now switch over to the opponent. And here he is, Mr. McAvoy. Thank you so much, committee. Um, I heard something from the MC uh, EA about respecting the ways that children show up. And I think that's important. Um, it's speaking to feelings. And, you know, in this bill, and let me scroll down to where the it is. Oh, I don't have a code. It talks about a public pre kindergarten program. That, that's where the, the slippery slope has gone with this issue. I'm glad that one of the other speakers had brought up the issue of Bethel Academy. I invite you all to look at their Facebook. I don't see any discrimination going on there, but if they have certain beliefs and they don't want to change those beliefs, I don't see where the state should be interjecting on this. Now, frankly, my feeling is that, uh, you know, if, if, if you don't want it, don't take the government money. But that's that's not to the point of what I know about Annapolis, how these bills are introduced. And then the next year, another line is taken away. And then the next year, another line is taken away. Um, because if you don't respect their beliefs and you don't respect what they advocate and you don't respect how they worship, then you're not respecting those children. That's, that's just a fact. We're talking about pre-kindergarten. Some of these issues, and look, we're not, we, there's a set area that we're talking about here. Okay, Some of these issues don't need to be brought up to children. Matter of fact, a lot, especially the pre-kindergartens. Private schools already had anti-bullying programs. And we have a record amount of people leaving public schools. Um, and some are even going to homeschool. Um, we have provision in here, um, but what happens next year when it's taken away? And, and why would it be taken away? Because we actually have a David and Goliath issue. Look at this Bethel Academy issue where we have a multi-state uh, organization taking these folks to court and they have to spring for these court. And some of the, the, the language of this cease and desist, we already have during this COVID issue in this state, it's hard to believe that the crater rock of many religions 
uh, in, in Maryland that we have unconstitutional restrictions on churches right now as we speak. So to go forward with this, this is definitely not the right time. I, I urge that we respect these children, that we respect their beliefs. I, I think that's the least that we can do. And um, I, I think it'd be good to take my advice and um, take the, the money from Caesar. But honestly, let's let's respect their beliefs. They have as much right as anyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McAvoy. All right, so that concludes the testimony for the bill. Uh, looking around the room for questions. Any qu so Senator Cassidy has a question. Senator Cassidy, you are up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just start off with a request to uh, questions for the sponsors. Senator McGray, hi, good to see you. Um, the uh, thanks for coming into JPR. Uh, just I just want to be clear that that looking at the bill, this uh, would also disqualify uh, a school from receiving state funds based upon discrimination upon a teacher. This is we've heard a lot of testimony about students and LGBT students and and, and et cetera, but this would apply equally to any kind of discrimination on the basis of uh, religious preferences or the like in, in teachers and staff, correct? I believe the staff are already covered. We're talking about parents, students, um, and, and the staff are just already covered. Where are the teachers already covered? Uh, I, I know that MSEA can elaborate on it, but I believe that it's a federal practice in reference to where staff are already covered. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how you, how, you, how you say that, because if I have a, if there's a religious school and, and they require their teachers to all be Muslims or Jews or, or Protestants or Catholics or whatever, Hare Krishnas, um, and so they're basically discriminating against a person on the basis of their, of their uh, religious uh, uh, affiliation, um, then um, that would clearly disqualify them. And we've got schools like that currently receiving boost scholarships. So it appears pretty clear to me that we're not discriminating or that this currently doesn't apply to to uh, well, basis of staff and their religious preferences. Yep, Senator Cassidy, I would go on to ask you to read the fiscal note. It clearly states that students, parents, guardians, it does not say anything about teachers. And as stated that MSCA will be able to elaborate on the section but, of the uh, right, but that, uh, I'm, I'm just saying uh, discrimination from teachers. Okay, I'm looking at page three of the bill, and it says on lines, these are, this is new language, and it, it's in the bill, and it says that they cannot adopt, maintain a written anti discrimination policy for the county school system. Um, and, it, or, or, um, and it says from or, or prohibit a school from discriminating against any person because of the individuals, and then it includes their religion. So how, how is that not applicable to staff on the basis of religion? I'm, I'm on page three, and when I look at page three, it explicitly says discriminated against a student regardless of the outcome of the complaint. So I I'm think, sorry, where is where is that? I'm, I'm, I'm on line 27, but you didn't state what line you were on. I was up at the beginning. I started at the very beginning on the, the, I stood the, the, the inserts, line 13. Um, and you're looking on page, you're looking at line 27? I, yep, 27 on page uh, three, the same page you're on. Right. Explicitly state student right there. Well, this bill applies to, to private and public schools, right? It does. And I think also the fiscal note on page one also complemented and redirected the same question that you that explicitly states students, parents, or guardians. But it doesn't say students, it says persons. Persons would include the staff. Senator, if I if I could. So first of all, there's already existing labor laws, you know, in the state that relates to employment practices. It was a it was an issue that was brought up when the first the first and second iteration of this bill several years ago, the Civil Rights Commission noted that there are already protections in the labor in labor statute that protect educators. Um, and, and adults that work there. But I would also point to you, sir, the ruling by the Supreme Court in Our Lady of Guadalupe School versus um, Morrissey Veru that provided a religious exemption for um, staff that are considered religious staff or religious um, um, entities within the school. And so yeah, but that's, that's, but that's not, it doesn't really answer the question because 
We're not. Sir, if you'd let me finish, I will answer your question. Some of these teach. Some of these schools they believe that religion is taught in math, religion is taught in science, religion is taught in religion class, it's taught in gym. And so it wouldn't just be the people teaching religion. I understand their narrow exception that if you're the one teaching Judaic studies or whatever, that they can say, you got to be Jewish to teach the Jewish studies. But a lot yes, of- Yes, sir, but if you, look at the, if, the, if you look at the Supreme Court decision in um, Our Lady of Guadalupe School, the mm-hmm. exemption of who is considered to be instructional staff in a religious Mm -hmm. or parochial school gives schools the, um, it gives the schools the provisions to be able to determine who is instructional and ministerial staff. So those staff are protected, sir. I can cut this short because I I assume from the testimony then that Senator McCray would not in any way oppose a clarifying amendment that this does not in any way relate to the religious or, or this does not in any way relate to the staff in any of its capacities. This is only as to the students. Is that, is that without, true? Again, with all I'm asking respect, Senator McCray, Senator, if, you would accept that, if you would accept that friendly amendment to this, that this bill does not in any way relate to the staff of the school, it's only as to the student body. The Senator, that's okay. unnecessary based on, well, I, based I, I, on I, I appreciate, the Senator, I really appreciate that, but I'm trying to get Senator McCray, gotcha, check. Your, Senator McCray, would you accept that as a friendly amendment that we just simply say for clarification purposes, so we don't have to get people alarmed that, that, that the the, um, three, because we have three quarters of our boost uh, scholarship recipients are free and reduced meals, and thirty percent of them come out of uh, Baltimore City, and thirty percent are, are out of Baltimore are, are out of Baltimore County, and, and and the majority of the rest are Prince George's Montgomery County. So it's clear from what, as I understand it, if we do a clarifying amendment to say, hey, this does not. That, that this does not in any way relate to the staff of the school. This bill is only as to the student body. You're okay with that. Senator Castley, I just wanted to be clear that I don't uh, uh, go for any discrimination at all. While I do believe that this bill uh, clearly goes for students, parents, and guardians, I think that any form of discrimination is wrong. Yeah, I'm, I'm just asking about this bill right here, whether you know this law, we're trying to pass a law, here's the bill, and, and, and we're just talking about this bill and, it's in, and the impact it's going to have. And I just wanted to be clear that, that this bill, that if we vote on this bill, it does not relate to the st- that the teaching staff of the school, that that's not impacted on this because clearly the current law, the current law allows um, these, religious, these religious exceptions because we know the quarters of the, the boost money is going to schools uh, that do make, that do discriminate on the basis of religion in their staff and they're getting the boost scholarship right now and they're all free and reduced meal kids. I just wanna make sure we're not gonna cut those kids out and deprive them of an yep. opportunity to go to a really good school. Senator uh, Cassidy, I wouldn't mind entertaining it if this was would bring towards your support for the bill. I, I, I don't have a problem with, with not discriminating. You know, I, I share the concerns about little kids and all that. Let me ask Ms. Dove. Well, if, the, if, the, if this is what gets your support for the bill, I do not mind okay. entertaining it. All right, well, let me, I'll, I'll talk to our staff and try to get a, 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 a um, an appropriate amendment that we can all come and kumbaya on this thing, if that's okay. Um, and then- Thank and you. Ms. Duff, can I just ask you, because I'm trying to understand where you're coming out on discrimination. So do you, you, you already agree this doesn't relate to, to, to the staff. So we need to discuss that. This is just about discrimination against kids, the K through K through 12, I think is what this says, or pre-K through 12. Pre-K. That's all this is about. We're talking about kids, not about staff, right? There is in no way that previous iterations reference staff. This version of the bill does not, because okay. those those staff are already protected by labor law that exists. And now- I don't um, care where they're protected. I just don't want this bill impacting them. I just don't want this bill impacting them. That's what we're- I'm I'm not sure if I understand the the nuance of what you're you're asking. The the nuance is that- They're already protected. The nuance is that there's a lot of law out there. And- Yes, sir. Balance is what it is. That law is what it is. We're not going to change that law. I'm only concerned about the impact that this will have on all that existing law, whether it's common law from the Supreme Court or the Maryland Court of Appeals or the commissions or whatever. It is what it is. I'm just concerned about this bill right here. And I just want to be clear that it doesn't make any changes to, to the teaching staff. I imagine I would need further clarity from you, Senator Castley, in order to properly a- answer your question. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Asking, sir, 
That's what you're asking. Okay. All right. Because I believe I words matter, and I'm trying to answer your question. Right. What you're Thank asking you. me is: there would there be restrictions on the teachings of an educator in one of these schools that is rooted in the religious tenets, and would that then constitute? A discriminatory action? The answer to that question is no. That has already been affirmed in law okay. and in the Supreme Court ruling in, in Guadalupe. No, this, is, this has to do with the hiring and the, of the this, this bill, as I understand it, has to do with the employment and hiring, discrimination against them in their employment and hiring. No, and sir, the, it doesn't. It has to deal with student admissions. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll just make sure that's clear. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, y'all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Senator Cassidy. Thank you, uh, Ms. Dove. Um, Mr. Young, I saw that you had your hand up, but I think we'll close the loop on this. Do you still want to chime in? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Very briefly, um, I just wanted to point out to Senator Cassidy that this question was brought up last year um, when this was House Bill 1204. Um, and the answer to that is that according to uh, the Civil Rights Commission, there are current laws that deal with employment and discrimination against employees. This bill only includes language that centers students and prospective students. Uh, there's no protection language that extends to teachers, staff, uh, or administrators. So uh, this bill uh, does not go to, I think, what your question uh, speaks to. Also, I believe that the mailing code that speaks to this, and I will I'm gonna verify this um, after this hearing, is 20-602, uh, which deals with employment discrimination of the human services code. So uh, just a few things that I was able to pull up really quickly. I wanna just verify that for you. Uh, after the hearing, um, but hopefully that uh, helps you as well. Let me know if I can help with. Excellent. All right, excellent. Um, all right. Um, Thank you very much. Um, so with that, we'll move on to, I saw Senator Hedelman, and then we'll go to Senator West and then Senator Bailey. So Senator Hedelman, you're up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I think this question is directed to Mr. Young or um, Ms. Dove. If you could answer, I know um, through uh, the boost program, especially uh, over the past few years, that the conditions under which schools accept that funding has changed somewhat over the years, and they have to sign and attest to certain um, uh, statements about non discrimination. Can you, and I realize that that is a year to year thing, and that is not enshrined in law, and that because it's part of the budget bill. Does this um, alter in any way, or does it mirror what they already attest to through that process? Can you, can you tell me if they're exactly the same or, the, or, or if there are some differences? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for that question, Senator. They are mirrored except in one way in the language that you all, uh, when you were formerly on the Appropriations Committee in the House last year, the language for the FY22 budget, I do not believe includes children with disabilities, whereas the language here does. Otherwise, um, the language I believe is pretty much on par. Okay. And the language that you all added last year um, added uh, gender identity, gender expression, I believe um, in the previous years, it was not there. Okay, thank you, very helpful, thank you. Thank you, Senator Hedelman. So next we'll have Senator West, you're up. There we go. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me quick, uh, briefly pursue um, uh, Senator Cassidy's line of inquiry. Many of these religious schools just uh, think it's very important to have the head of the school, the senior people in charge to be members of the religion who, who, who are, you know, whose school it is. Uh, wouldn't this bill uh, require the school to hire um, people to head the school, to have the lead leadership positions in the school on a non-discriminatory basis. Therefore, you, you could end up with somebody who's um, fundamentalist Christian uh, heading up uh, one of the Catholic high schools. Or someone who's an agnostic altogether <laughs> heading up a Catholic high school. What am I missing here? Senator McCray, maybe you could answer that question. I, I think you may be missing a lot. I, I, I reiterated with uh, Senator Cassidy that this was dealing with students, it's dealing with their enrollment, it's dealing with the folks that are currently 
at the school, uh, uh, expelling, uh, refusing the enrollment, privileges, things of that nature, but it's strictly a student parent focused bill. Where does it say in the bill that it only applies to students? Well, it also says that in a fiscal note, it stated that- I don't, I don't care about the fiscal note, that's not law. Where in the bill does it say this bill only applies to students? Well, students are referenced a number of times um, during this Senator West. In the previous hearing, when the uh, Civil Rights Commission talked about this, when the question came up, it stated that teachers were already protected. So you'll see where it says discriminate, uh, uh, refuse enrollment or expel, withhold privilege student or prospective student because of individual's race, ethnicity, uh, discipline, invoke the penalty against or take any other retaliatory action against student or parent or guardian. So it's, it's referenced student or guardian or parent a number of times throughout the bill. Well, I know, I know that's correct, but that, um, so I, you know, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> I read the language as it's written and it says on page three, each county board shall five adopt and maintain a written anti-discrimination policy for the county school system that prohibits a school from discriminating against any person, et cetera. That doesn't say any student, says any person. So in my, in my world, a person includes teachers, staff members, most importantly, the head of the school and the, and the leadership at the top of the school. Am, am I wrong in that? At, at this point in time, it's already been explained that the, the and I said federal law, but state law already precludes uh, teachers or the, the employer from being able to ex, uh, discriminate against the employee. All right, um, could you uh, maybe send me a text or something and direct me to that part of the state law? So we have one part of the state law that says you you can't discriminate, or you, 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 that the uh, religious school can okay. hire whoever wants to run the school, but this school, this bill seems to be inconsistent with that. Um, no problem. I think it was- uh, other law, me, Let me see if I can compare the two reference. laws. Yeah, no problem. I, as stated, I think that it was Mr. Young that also referenced the section of the code. But I got a second question, which is more significant. Um, most private schools, most parochial schools, especially most private schools, they simply cannot, and they're the first to admit, they cannot educate all students irrespective of their disabilities. So for example, private, some private schools say, we cannot take autistic children. Others say we can't, we can't take children with certain learning disabilities because we're not equipped to handle that. Um, as I read this bill, it requires all non-private, non-public schools to not discriminate against a student based on disability. What's your response to that? Um, I'll, I'll let Tina Dove weigh in on it, but I do believe I'll let Tina Dove weigh in on it. Thank you, Senator McCray. Um, Senator West, thank you for that question. If you look on page four on lines 11 through 14, particularly with line on line 13, you'll see the notion of reasonable accommodation and all it's saying is that a school- I don't, I don't able see that on page four, line 13. Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. I'm looking at the house version of the bill. Okay. If you look at the, it's the exact same language in the Senate version of the bill. The page in question is, it is page four, it's line eight, lines eight through 11. It requires that reasonable accommodation under federal law be attempted. That does not mean that you have to completely change your school or change your operating procedure, your construction, any of that. You just have to make attempts to provide reasonable accommodation. Well, so if you've got a non-private, non-public school that doesn't take dyslexic children because it doesn't have the staff that are needed to properly educate dyslexic children, does this language protect the school to continue to not take dyslexic children? Or does this language say that the school must, must make reasonable accommodations in order to teach dyslexic children? What this language infers, and it's the same language that is, you, that is applicable to public schools, 
when public schools are working with children with disabilities and they're not, they don't all have the capacity to deal with every type of disability that our students show up with. But if collectively the, the system, is, collectively the system has capabilities of teaching all the children, no matter what their disabilities, right? Not, the, not, not necessarily. In some cases, the, in some cases you may not have the personnel to be able to address a certain disability, at which case, public schools will oftentimes work with a non-public entity that may have the capacity to do that work. In the case of a non-public school- How does a private school do that? In the case of a non-public school- is gonna take, Private school is gonna take a dyslexic child and then outplace the child to a different school somewhere that, that would be able to educate the dyslexic child. Is that what you're saying? No, so that's not what I'm saying. Okay. What I'm saying is that in a case like this, if a school is attempting to provide reasonable accommodation, but they aren't able to provide what that child and their family need, then they would not be held as being discriminatory because they could not provide the accommodation that that child needs. That student, that parent would need to seek another option to feel, to meet their educational needs. But in this but you case- keep, You keep saying, you keep stating that the school has to provide reasonable accommodation. So take my example. You have a family that wants their dyslexic child to attend a, a, the Talmudical Academy, but the Talmudical Academy doesn't have any ability to teach dyslexic children. So what, what reasonable accommodation could the Talmudical Academy make to help that family? Again, sir, if they are, in, if they are unable to provide a reasonable, a reasonable accommodation, then the student and the family would not be within their right to say that that was a discriminatory action. As long as the school took the steps necessary to provide a reasonable accommodation, if they are unable to provide anything more than that, then they don't have the capacity to do that. That is the case now with public schools when they are unable to provide services for a child, they do what they can to provide reasonable accommodation and in as, in as much as they are unable to do that, then that family um, and that child are instructed to in order to fulfill the needs of their IEP, there may be other options that have to be pursued. Some of those might be at a different school within said county. Some of it might be um, an out of county placement in a, in a non-public school. Would it be the obligation of the school that can't offer this dyslexic education to, uh, to provide financial assistance to the applicant family so that they could get it somewhere else? Senator there is no language to that effect in this bill, sir. Yeah, okay, fine. Law, so like, this is the kind of like in, in the federal law that you have to make every, you have to make an attempt to accommodate. If you can't, then that, that, that gets you out. Okay, so I'll pull the, the statute for you. Um, and then just to close the loop, I want to let the dialogue play out a little bit, but I'm looking and I'll ask the sponsor. Um, I mean, so I see what Senator Casting, what Senator West were saying. Um, so if you go to page five, you know, lines one through three, I mean, I maybe suggest a friendly amendment that we can work on some language where you strike that and you say kind of subject to, and then for Senator Cassidy, title 20, subtitle six of the state government article prohibits discrimination in employment. So I think we could pull that and that'll answer kind of your question, at least some of your questions from before where it shows that, you know, that type of discrimination is prohibited and would already be covered and therefore not necessary for this bill. So if you wanted to clarify that, maybe we could have an, an amendment. Or, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the sponsor, I'll work with the sponsor on this, but I think I think we're there. Um, so I'll, I'll make sure we pull that and send it to the committee. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chair, that, that would be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, um, Senator Bailey, you're up. Unless, are we done? You're done, Senator West? Okay, great. Uh, Senator Bailey. There we go. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. I pray. Welcome. Uh, this is my first time hearing this bill, so I have a, a quick uh, question about this. How is this process different uh, from the Office of Civil Rights complaint that currently can be filed? So the reality is, is that every year we put in budget language to make sure that uh, we, those folks that are in non-public um, schools uh, currently don't discriminate. They will have to give the money back for that respective year. There is no process at this moment in, uh, 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 in reference to the Civil Rights Commission. That's what we're trying to establish. Okay, thank you. All right, excellent. All right. 
looking one more time around the Zoom room. All right, seeing no further questions, that will conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 98. Thank you very much, Senator McRae. And Thank you all. Panel, see you all later. Have a good one. Stay safe. Uh, we'll next move on to Senator Hedelman. You have two bills. We'll take 154 first. So, Senator Hedelman, uh, you're up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm Shelley Hedelman, uh, District 11 Senator, and I'm happy to be here this afternoon uh, to present Senate Bill 154, which would provide a right to counsel in eviction cases. Senate Bill 154 will ensure that low-income tenants in Maryland who are facing eviction have the right to an attorney to enforce existing legal protections. And as we all know, and we've heard um, throughout the past few days, these protections have grown more complicated in the wake of COVID-19, making enforcement through legal uh, representation even more critical. And there are a number of cities, including Baltimore, um, around the country that have provided such a right. By passing this bill, Maryland will join these cities in recognizing that a right to counsel in eviction cases is a proven cost-effective means of preventing the disruptive displacement of residents. There are a couple of really important parts of this bill. One is it would create the position of a council coordinator in the attorney general's office that would contract with a nonprofit legal services organizations to provide low-income tenants with representation, legal representation. It would establish a task force of stakeholders to advise on the implementation of these provisions. And it would implement the right over a four year period and require annual reports and hearings to this body. It would also fund community-based organizations that would conduct outreach and education with tenants. So why do we need a right to counsel in eviction cases? Um, there's a recent report that focused on Baltimore City by Stout, which is a consulting firm, that showed that an annual investment of five and a half million dollars in a right to counsel for tenants in one jurisdiction would yield 18, over 18 million dollars in benefits and costs that, in costs that would be avoided by the state. These costs include homeless shelters, Medicaid spending in hospitals, homeless student transportation, and foster care costs. And in one study, 92% of represented, represented tenants avoided disruptive replacement with a right to counsel in one Maryland jurisdiction. And in New York City, where they had this right, um, where it was already implemented, 86% of the representative, represented tenants were able to stay in their homes. Another reason, this levels the field. 96% of landlords in the same study were represented, while only 1% of tenants were. And this levels the playing field in this very complicated system in our courts to ensure that tenants are treated with the respect and dignity and have the information they need to be able to present their cases. Two, um, many, in many of these cases, they do actually have defense for their um, evictions. In one 2016 survey of Baltimore renters, 80% of, of the respondents had a defense to their case, but only 8% of those renters without counsel could successfully raise the defense. A another point, how, how will this right be implemented? So there is this, the bill provides for a coordinator position and a consulting task force that will study the best practices that are out there and propose an implementation plan over the course of four years. The Attorney General's Office will likely contract with Maryland Legal Services Corporation to administer the program, and then will advocate for, advocate for implementation um, to include a more integrated approach to eviction prevention that combines representation with rental assistance, connections to rental assistance, and to other social services that already exist in the community. How much will this cost, and how will the state pay for it? So we estimate that the full implementation of this program will be just over $28 million. But it was, again, like I stated earlier, we anticipate that it would result in over $90 million in savings from this in the state. We believe that there are a number of ways that we could pay for this. Uh, you may know that um, the recently passed federal legislation is going to result in $402 million coming to the state of Maryland to provide for rental assistance. And uh, up to 10% of that is can be used for eviction prevention services. And legal services certainly would qualify under that. 
The um, Senate Budget Committee today unanimously just passed um, a, an amended version of the governor's relief bill, and that also includes um, $25 million in rental assistance and $3 million in um, that should go directly to legal representation. And there are a variety of other um, suggested approaches to how to pay for this, but I think it's eminently doable. Um, and why do we need this now? You know, these are issues that have been around for quite a long time, but I think COVID-19 has shined a light on the cracks that already exist within our housing system. And this is definitely one of them. Even with the protections, and it's been a patchwork of protections to uh, prevent um, evictions over these past many months, over 2,500 renting families were evicted. And that's even with the governor's moratorium, the federal moratorium, CDC moratorium, um, et cetera. So I think it is um, very compelling. And there, actually there's a recent study that talked about eviction prevention as a way to save lives. That when people were evicted, they were more um, susceptible to catching COVID and to dying. And I'm happy to share that study with the committee. So that is my case. Um, I respectfully urge um, your support of Senate Bill 154 and I have a wonderful panel of eminently qualified professionals who can uh, shed more light on the details that I have overlooked. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Hedelman. Thank you for bringing this to us. Uh, your first uh, panelist is Mr. Hill. Matt, the floor is yours. Wait, what, one second. I do want to say, sorry, Matt, and sorry, Mr. Chairman. I do want to say that um, there are uh, a couple of things that we would like to tweak in this bill, one of which is this stakeholder group that we um, that is part of the bill. We inadvertently left out a represent representative of the landlord community and certainly would be open to adding that back in. That has been uh, certainly an issue that's been raised by a couple of the um landlord groups and the, as well as the bar association and definitely want to be responsive to that. So I'm sorry, Matt. Excellent. All right. Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, Senator Hedelman. Um, Senator Hedelman made all of the incredibly wonderful points that, that I was hoping to make, but I will just highlight a few of them and expand on a, on a few. Um, SB 154 is about leveling the scales of justice and enforcing the legal protections that have already against eviction that have already been enacted by this body. And as Senator Hedelman uh, said toward the end, there's no greater illustration about the need for this bill than the fact that with all of the CDC eviction order, the governor's order, the other protections in place, we've still had over 2,500 Maryland households evicted since March, 2020 in the middle of a pandemic. Do we need rental assistance and affordable housing? Yes, absolutely but we also need to enforce the laws that we already have on the books. SB 154 does that by ensuring that low-income tenants in Maryland facing eviction have the right to an attorney to enforce legal protections. Um, in addition to the seven jurisdictions that have already enacted uh, similar uh, programs, I understand that there are six uh, measures pending in other states that would do just this. Maryland has the chance to, to be the first, however, um, with, this, with this body support. Um, I'll just raise um, five points in support of the bill. Uh, many of these Senator Hedelman covered, I'll expand on a couple. Uh, but right to counsel is cost effective. Senator Hedelman talked about the Stout Report. Um, again, if in just in Baltimore City, if you provide a right to counsel, it would cost $5.7 million, but $18.1 million in benefits and cost savings to the state alone, not counting the benefits and cost savings to Baltimore City. And that's because evictions create homelessness and homelessness is expensive to the state. Namely, uh, folks who are homeless are mostly insured by Medicaid and often use the emergency room as their primary care doctor. If you're a child and you're evicted and become homeless, you are much more likely to get into the foster care system, which again is paid for by the state. Um, it is effective. According to Stout, 92% of represented tenants avoid disruptive displacement with a right to counsel in eviction cases. Balancing the scales of justice, again, 96% of landlords right now are represented by an attorney or a specialized rent court agent. In their study, only 1% of tenants were represented. I wanna talk a little bit about the disparate racial impact of evictions, because I think that's important. And the studies even prior to COVID were legion that black households have been disproportionately subjected to eviction 
due to centuries of institutionalized systemic racism. Now, due to COVID-19, 36% of black renter households in Maryland are likely facing an eviction compared to 14% of white households. There's a cruel irony here in that black and, and Latinx households are also disproportionately among our essential workers. And thus they are both facing uh, the brunt, bearing the brunt primarily of COVID-19 infections and will soon bear the brunt of COVID-19 evictions. Because right to counsel is a proven means of leveling the scales and preventing disruptive displacement, this bill can help address that disparate impact as well. Um, Senator Hedelman talked about the right, the, the defenses a little bit, the tenants have in these cases. I'm happy to talk through what those defenses are. One survey that Public Justice Center did in 2016 80% of the respondents who had come to court had some sort of defense to their right to their eviction case. Only 8% of those renters or at, without counsel successfully raised that defense related to severe conditions of disrepair at the property. Um, I'll just say that the, I, I wanna get to, because other, other folks can't testify and there've been over 50 individuals and organizations that have submitted written testimony um, in, in favor of this bill. And I wanna get to a few of those. Um, there's tenants like the Tanya Abrams from Montgomery County, who was facing a retaliatory eviction uh, by her landlord uh, because she had complained to the county about the lack of heat in her unit. Um, council stepped in, was able to um, win that case. Martha Shaheen from the Eastern Shore, who faced an eviction each month for over two years related to illegal fees um, she, and, until she was able to get counsel from legal aid who was able to get those, those um, eviction cases to, to stop happening. Um, we have landlord testimony, Broadview Apartments testified, wrote, the, quote, the right to counsel will increase fairness and stability in the housing market long after the pandemic has waned. We believe this legislation will benefit landlords as well as renters in the state of Maryland. The judiciary supports this bill. The MSBA supports this bill. You have testimony from Steve Sachs, former attorney general, pointing out that the right to counsel in cases involving basic human needs is rooted in the state's constitution. Further, you've got testimony from the Maryland Access to Justice Commission pointing out that this bill comes from a long history and a framework that the commission has helped put together. Um, so I think that it's just that there's a real moral imperative here. The, the stakes are incredibly high and we uh, really urge the General Assembly to act. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have Mr. Uh, Kemmerer from the uh, Attorney General's Office. Annabelle, you're up. Thank you, Chair Smith, Vice Chair Waldstriker, and distinguished members of the Judicial Proceedings Committee. For the record, my name is Hannibal Kemmerer, and I am Chief Legal Counsel for Legislative Affairs to Attorney General Brian Frosch. Today, I'm here to testify in support of SB 154, Senator Hedelman's legislation to provide a right to counsel for indigent defendants in landlord tenant actions. This bill is a common sense measure and we urge a favorable report. My written testimony is in the record and I commend it to your attention. Instead of reading it, I'll attempt to rebut some of the opposition testimony. Mr. Chairman, under the American rule, parties pay their own counsel fees unless otherwise provided by a statute or contract. It's contrasted with the English rule, uh, which has a loser pay, English common law has a loser pays uh, bent. These landlords, the ones you're about to hear from, have been contracting for prevailing party attorney's fees contrary to the baseline American rule forever. And the courts have further subsidized their serial filings by charging a pittance for landlords to file a summary ejection case. Yet the MMHA now has the gall to complain, quote, landlords should not be required to pay for their tenants' attorneys, end quote. Let's be clear, Mr. Chairman. These same landlords regularly expect their indigent renters to pay for their counsel fees. Landlords are, on balance, more sophisticated than their typical renters. They contract for prevailing party attorney's fees, show up in court with attorneys, and obtain judgments plus costs interest and fees against unrepresented tenants. Just as absurd as MBIA's argument that the bill will, quote, ultimately be harmful to both tenants and landlords and has the potential to cost the state millions of dollars when implemented. 
I'll just reiterate what Senator Hedelman's already said about the three to one return on investment for uh, adopting a right to counsel in these cases. Finally, AOBA claims in its written testimony that the landlord's quote, legal action is solely based on a resident's action, presumably not paying, uh, for which there is no legal defense and the case is summary in nature, end quote. That's incorrect as a matter of law. Even in a summary eviction proceeding, tenants have legal defenses that I'm sure Zafir Shaw and Matt Hill can tick off if anyone should ask. Finally, Mr. Chairman, let me just point out that we, we asked the evictions lab at Princeton for data on the top five counties uh, eviction filing rates. And three of them, Baltimore County, Prince George's County and Baltimore City have filing rates that exceed the number of rental properties. That means that within a given year, landlords are filing complaints yeah. against the same person multiple times. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I urge a favorable report and I welcome questions. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Actually, I, I looking through the testimony, if, I'd love to have, I think that report would be great if it's not already incorporated in your testimony, that'd be great for the committee. Uh, it's fantastic information. And uh, don't worry about the dogs that happened to vice to the president a couple days ago. So <laughs> it's probably a nurse to your benefit bonus. All right, next we have Miss, um, uh, so Ehrlichman, Susan, you're up. Thank you, Chairman Smith, uh, Vice Chair Wallstriker, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Susan Ehrlichman. I'm the executive director of the Maryland Legal Services Corporation. I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, in favor today of Senate Bill 154, which provides a right to counsel in eviction actions. Um, the Maryland Legal Services Corporation was created by the Maryland General Assembly to secure and distribute funds to nonprofit legal aid providers to ensure that civil legal aid is available to low-income Marylanders throughout the state. We currently fund 36 grantees throughout Maryland last year. These programs served over 182,000 clients in a variety of civil legal matters, including evictions, foreclosures, child custody, unemployment problems, food stamps, and a variety of other issues that impact the quality of life and basic human needs. Behind family law issues, housing problems represent the greatest area of need. In fiscal year 2020, MLSC grantees assisted 31,000 people with different housing issues. In some instances, legal problems can be resolved without litigation. And certainly if they can be, they should be. Um, but in all too many instances, a lack of resources and overwhelming demand result in legal services providers not being able to provide the level of service that's truly necessary to resolve the client's problem. In no area is this greater than the, in the area of eviction defense. In response to the scarcity of litigation services, MLSC established the Extended Representation Project in 2018, and we dedicated about a million dollars annually for cases that required representation in the courtroom. And the programs that we funded were primarily for summary ejectment cases, pilot projects in Baltimore City and Prince George's County. We, um, over the course of the last two years, there were 4,600 cases where tenants were represented, benefiting 12,000 people who otherwise would not have had legal help. But we, we need to do much better. Senate Bill 154, would expand the current services we're able to provide to low income Marylanders with regard to civil legal aid and provide a right to counsel, uh, setting up a program dedicated to representation of low income tenants in eviction cases. This is a laudable and desperately needed step towards access to justice for Maryland's low income citizens. Senate Bill 154 also calls for a convening of many uh -huh. entities um, I would just like to conclude by saying that uh, Maryland Legal Services Corporation as a longstanding and trusted convener and funder of civil legal aid would be very happy to lend its expertise to this undertaking. And again, I thank you for your, for your time and urge a favorable report. Thank you, Ms. Ehrlichman. Uh, next, we'll move on to Ms. Saro. Lisa, you're up. That's my fault. 
There you go. <laughs> That's a, no problem. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Smith, Senator Heddleman, and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you about this important bill. My name is Lisa Saro, and I am general counsel for Arundel Community Development Services. ACDS serves as Anne Arundel County's nonprofit housing and community development agency. We help Anne Arundel County residents and communities thrive through the provision of um, safe and affordable housing opportunities, programs to prevent and end homelessness, and community development initiatives. As part of our role, ACDS administers grants to nonprofit par partners and develops and implements programming. Um, and we advise the county on housing and community development policy initiatives. What I wanna to talk to you about is not just the importance of uh, lawyers for tenants. I wanna to talk to you about the importance of lawyers for as part of what is going to be a gigantic rental assistance program going on throughout the entire state over the next several years. As Senator, Senator Hedelman mentioned, lots and lots of money is coming into the state for rental assistance. Um, as the program administer for Anne Arundel County's emergency rental assistance program, ACDS stood up the first um, emergency rental assistance program in the state after the pandemic hit. It was up and moving in April of 2020 um, and was providing emergency rental assistance soon thereafter to low income residents, renters facing eviction for failure to pay rent. By the end of the summer, it was clear that courts were reopening people were going to be evicted without rental assistance and without legal assistance in the court system. So ACDS partnered with, well, they brought me on, but they also partnered with um, Community Legal Services and nonprofit legal services provider to provide representation for applicants for rental assistance benefits who were sued either before they applied or during the course of our processing their application. We know from experience that having an attorney makes a difference. Virtually every single uh, applicant, rental assistance applicant that we sent to community legal services for assistance uh. avoided eviction. So as we go forward, um, this bill will be all the more important to have that lawyer connection, get money to landlords and keep tenants housed. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Kemmerer, thank you for sending me a link along already, the report. Um, I'll make sure the committee gets it. It's pretty high speed. So thank you very much. That's great. Um, all right, so that concludes the panel for the uh, proponents. We'll now switch to the opponents and we'll start off with Mr. Enton. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Robert Enton, on behalf of the Maryland Multi-Housing Association. Um, you know, I, I know my time is limited, so I'll, I'll try to talk quickly. The, um, uh, you know, I, I think our primary concern and the reason we're opposed to this legislation, um, you know, forgetting about the fact, as uh, Senator uh, Hedelman uh, mentioned, that not a single landlord was named to be on the task force. And I appreciate the fact that she's recognized that. The uh, legislation calls for three tenants to be on, advocacy groups and a lot of other people, but not a single landlord. So we very much appreciate that. Um, the, uh, uh, but I, I think that the driving concern for us is this seems to be a tremendous misdirection of, 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 of effort and funding. Um, uh, as was mentioned, there's going to be $402 million in rental assistance for the state of Maryland. I spoke of Hunter Pickles a little while ago while this, um, some of the other hearings were going on. This is the number one priority of the Department of Housing and Community Development is to get this money out. They anticipate they will have it out and in the hands of, ten, of, 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 of landlords to uh, pay rent for tenants by the first week of March. So think about that, $402 million. 
And I guess my main point is that if the tenant pays the rent, there are no failure to pay rent eviction cases. It's that simple. And where we need to be focused is on making sure that people who can't pay their rent uh, get the rental assistance that they need. Uh, nonprofits and landlords and the housing departments and local governments did a very good job of getting the CARES money out. I did some math and it seems to me that if you look at um, uh, the fact that, that historically maybe there are, there are uh, for the whole state, entire state of Maryland on an annual basis, roughly $600,000 eviction cases filed. And let's say that you take half of that amount, maybe would want to have legal assistance uh, front through this bill. And if you look at what it costs under the, it says under the fiscal note for Anne Arundel County and for Frederick County, in Anne Arundel, the cost for representing the uh, tenants there in, the, in their program was $875 a case. If you multiply that, let's say by 300,000, if that's half of them, you know, you're talking about uh, 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 over uh, $200 million is what it would cost uh, to, if you applied that statewide, if you did the math. Um, and we just don't think it's, it's necessary. We don't think it's appropriate. I know there's this study out there I know that you hear from the advocates that if you have a lawyer, you have a defense, but 98% of the eviction cases are failure to pay rent cases. There's no complex issue of law. And it's basically a question of whether or not the tenant paid the rent or didn't pay the rent. Um, um, we're not opposed to people having counsel. And in fact, in Baltimore City, in every complaint that gets filed and in every lease that gets signed, the tenant gets an, uh, a, attached to the lease and attached to the complaint is a listing of where they can go for legal services. They can go to legal aid. Uh, they can go to the other nonprofits that provide rental assistance. And we don't have any problem. I think if you wanted to do something and pass something statewide, you'd look at what Baltimore City Mr. currently Eddie. requires Mr. and Mr. send that out on a statewide basis. So um, I know my time is up, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to answer questions, but we just don't think that this bill is where the resources need to go. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, next we'll move on to Vince McAvoy. Hope you can hear me all right. You can. Thank you. Um, thank you, committee. Um, there was a bill I was testifying on yesterday and there was a snafu why I didn't connect, but it was a similar type of thing where the Senator was bringing a bill basically costing millions. During the era of COVID, the issue of bringing millions and additional cost for bureaucracy. And why would anyone go there during an emergency when the government can't even pay unemployment benefits? Why? So my, my thought was either maybe Brian Brosh is in that district or maybe there's just a whole lot of lawyers there. Because the idea of paying a 150 hour billable, you know, at that rate, can't you just pay the homeless's rent? And so we're introducing a middleman. We're basically doing a slush fund for probably the Maryland Legal Services Corporation, $28 million during COVID. And this issue has been brought up because we have a shutdown. It's simple. <laughs> we're, we're applying Band-Aids when we're, we, we know what's actually causing the issue. We have shutdowns where we ought not. We have people who are striving and dying to work. We have restaurateurs who are closing their shops. They can't pay. Their employees that are waiting for things to open up. We heard yesterday uh, in um, tax and budget that there's um, people who work on um, like movie crews and play crews, this type of thing. Everything's shut down, so they're not making any money, and they're probably not going to make it as an industry. We're seeing that in, in other countries, they're not making it, they're just shutting down. So we need to learn from those folks across, across the ocean where. Their industries are shutting down, they're not coming back. And no amount of band-aids is gonna fix this. This is essentially socially. The issue is not a matter of getting the rent. And in fact, speaking to what the, the previous speaker just said, judges do have empathy. They know that they're not that people are not representing. We have sturdy laws in areas where we have a lot of these eviction issues. And and they should be. These are horrible times. But we're these are government made horrible times. We're not, 
people are ready to work and pay their rent and government's getting involved in interfering with that and you all are a check to the balance of power and we should be focusing on that instead of and, and 28 mm. million 28 million dollars no this thing is 90 million dollars in a trench four-year issue for something we haven't even suffered 10 years under COVID. so no my time is up but thank you for listening Thank you, Mr. McAvoy. And we would love to see your entire face one of these days, but- um, I, I got a corner and then I got the computer over there. So it's, I'm sorry, I'm really doing the best I can. I hear you. Okay. All right, so now we will move on to Mr. Wiggins. Good there afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Back again, for the record, Grayson Wiggins on behalf of the Maryland Multi-Housing Association. It's a general us too. In, in regards to Mr. Inton's testimony, I would just like to quickly address two things that were uh, that were addressed by the Attorney General's office. First, in our testimony and the discussion of the cost of the program, I, I've read the Stout reports, uh, which is a report that they're mentioning. Uh, they did one for Baltimore, did one for New, for New York City as well. I'm looking at an Office of Civil Justice annual 2019 report from New York City for the Universal Access Program, which says that they are projecting 166 million in mayoral, mayoral funding annually to provide free legal services to approximately 125,000 cases. So that's where our, our site for the million dollars comes from. I'd be happy to share this report with the committee. My bet though is that the proponents have probably cited something from this report in support of another provision in the bill. Uh, additionally, the AG's office talks about the high number of filings. I would just note that Maryland has a, a right to redeem, which allows a tenant to pay uh, the, the, the owed rent anytime before an eviction and redeem their right to the property. In Maryland, you can do that up to three times per calendar year, four in Baltimore City. Our contiguous states usually, generally have one. So in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, Virginia, you can exercise your right to redeem once per tenancy is my understanding. So of course, Maryland's gonna have a higher number of filings. I encourage you to go look at the information and data from the Maryland District Court, which was changed in 20, July 2019, or the method changed in July 2019. You can see 98% of the cases filed since July 2019 are failure to pay rent cases. Limited defenses, and yes, there are uh, repeat uh, tenants who we do file against, but again, it's because of the right to redeem. And so I, I would just, I would submit on that and I would just note an unfavorable request uh, from the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wiggins. All right, so with that, I believe that rounds out the panel for the opposition and we'll switch over to questions from the committee. And I see that uh, Senator West and then Senator Sidnor and Senator Cassidy. So Senator West, you're up first. Mr. Chair. So two days ago, I think we had the bill, a very similar bill. In fact, it was worded almost the same in large part uh, to provide legal counsel for Im illegal immigrants who are subject to deportation proceedings. Um, at the time, I said that uh, in general, I'm in favor of uh, civil Gideon. I'm in fact, I'm a member of the Access to Justice Commission. And the entire goal of the commission is to promote civil Gideon. Uh, Ms. Berlichman is on the commission with me. The problem has always been and continues to be, how do you pay for it? Um, we've gotten estimates today for just this limited uh, program of, of representation in civil cases. These are eviction cases. On the one hand, of $28 million um, from the sponsor of the bill and now from the Multifamily Housing Association uh, estimate is $100 million. How are we going to pay $100 million? Well, this year we have an advantage because this year we're getting $402 million from the federal government. So it may be possible to pay whatever this cost, whatever this cost is going to be this year from federal funding. But the federal funding is a one-time deal. And if we put this bill into law, this bill, this will be the law of Maryland from now on. So we're not gonna have it funded by the federal government after this year, after this emergency situation. So let me, first of all, ask Mr. Kemmerer a question I asked the other day. 
Uh, the bill we got about the funding for um, illegal immigrants was originally written to be run out of the attorney general's office. And uh, there an amendment was going to, was announced at the time of the bill presentation that it was going to be transferred to the office of public defender. And then I asked the public defender a number of questions about how he expected to bear the cost because the public defender's office is already strapped for funds. And frankly, he didn't have a very good answer. So Mr. Cameron, let me come back to you. Is the attorney general's office prepared out of its budget to pay somewhere between $28 million and $100 million a year for these representations? Uh, can right. we, we could, we could um, unmute Mr. Cameron. Yep, I'm going to, give me a second here. Uh, Senator right, West, thank you for that question. Um, under the bill's text, it says that the, the funding for uh, the representation can come from any source. Um, so, you know, the, the short but if answer- if there are no other sources, then it's coming from the attorney general's budget, right? So the short answer to your question is no, we're not prepared to pay $28 million a year. Um, there are a number of different potential funding streams. The attorney general has a bill that you'll hear in February uh, the, to increase the surcharges on landlords who file, you know, 600,000 of these cases annually, um, which is just around 80% of all rental housing in Maryland. Uh, so, you know, that's one way to potentially pay for this. I'm sure Senator Hedelman has another idea. She also mentioned uh, the, the provision of a fraction of the um, federal funding going towards paying for this. I get that your yeah, question. She, I think she mentioned three million dollars, but if the cost is twenty-eight million dollars, get that gets us three million dollars there, but we still got twenty-five billion dollars to make up. Is if the attorney general's office have twenty-five million dollars it can devote to this in the next year? We do not have twenty-five million dollars to devote to this. Uh, however, um, if you if you multiply the number of filings, six hundred and sixty thousand per year, and the increase in surcharge fees is that we propose from $15 uh, per filing to 120. That's 105 times 660,000. That's, that's a lot of money. That's, that's some millions. Well, why, let me ask this. Why, why isn't that funding provided for in this bill? I'm very reluctant to pass this bill and saddle the attorney general's office with a, with a, with a funding requirement on an annual basis that you've admitted you can't pay uh, without providing for some meth other alternative method of paying the bills, right? I don't want to get out too far ahead of my uh, my principal uh, on answering these questions, but um, I think you'll hear from him uh, on the 17th or the 18th uh, in connection with our bill, uh, Senate Bill 530. Um, that's one means. Uh, like I said, there may be other means for for paying for the provision of counsel in these cases. Well, let me ask you one final question then. Wouldn't it make sense to make this a pilot project for a year? During, during, the, during this emergency, we're going to, we're going to go this place. Um, and because we, we believe the money's coming, is here from the federal government to pay for it for this year, make this a pilot project bill. And then if it's, and then study it, and if it succeeds, um, then in the few, a year from now, we can come back and come up with a long-term solution to this problem, which would be properly funded. So I'm not prepared to, to agree with that. Um, you know, where would the pilot be? Uh, right now, Baltimore City has a right to counsel in uh, eviction cases. I'm not sure how they're funding it either, but Baltimore City's got 103% um, of filings per, excuse me, 103.21% of filings per um, year against their tenants. It's actually worse in Prince George's County where the percentage is 123.61%. And it's even worse still in Baltimore County where the percentage of filings is 146.72%. So if you've got people filing serial, you know, summary eviction cases that people, that the tenants ultimately are able to redeem, uh, and then they just keep filing them and filing them and filing them, we're losing a lot of money and it's highly inefficient. Um, so I don't know where you would put the project or the, the you know, pilot program, uh, but the need is gonna be everywhere throughout the state. I guess you could always eliminate the right to redeem. That would prevent the serial filings. Um, so 
at the very least, would you have an objection if the committee decided to hold this bill until such time as the committee comes up with another bill, which would provide a mechanism to fund this bill? Senator, I don't, I don't want to encourage the committee to hold, <laughs> hold Senator Edelman's bill uh, one bit. I mean, I'm here um, with all due respect supporting it, and I want it to move, and I hope it's enacted. Well, let me just finish by saying if we pass this bill, it becomes law of the state of Maryland and we don't pass a mechanism to fund it, your office is gonna to have to pay for it. I just, I'll leave you with that. Thank you. I'd just like to respond to, to that. Um, the bill has a mechanism and it creates a grant fund um, for this very reason. So I, I do believe there are a number of other legislative initiatives that we're going to hear um, in the next couple of weeks that will, and potentially, potentially identify other sources of funding. So I, I, I would, um, I do think this is something that we can discuss and we can work through and, and figure out. The other thing is in other programs that are, um, that exist in the other communities, they're all funded through the general fund. So it, you know, I'm somewhat, I don't want to say agnostic because that's too mild a word, but um, I, I, I'm open to lots of different possibilities for the, ways to fund this right. And I think we can figure it out. All right, thank you very much. We'll now move on to Senator, oh, actually, Mr. Hill, you, did you wanna chime in here? You have something responsive? Yes, just briefly on the question of a pilot project, I just wanna point out that as uh, Ms. Ehrlichman, I believe stated that the MLSC has essentially been piloting this kind of right to counsel in Baltimore City and Prince George's County and seen some, some fantastic results um, in terms of providing tenants uh, with defenses, with right to counsel and not right to counsel, but greater access to counsel and results in preventing evictions in those jurisdictions. So we, we have the, we, we've had the pilots, we've done the study, we can extrapolate from the study as to what it would cost and what effect it would have. And so I just urge the, the committee to think of this as a time for bold action particularly in the wake of COVID-19, that we cannot afford not to take bold action given the tidal wave of evictions, given the racial impact of evictions, and given the individual and social costs of evictions that again, pay for itself in reduced Medicaid expenditures, in reduced foster care expenditures. So I just really wanna push back on that just a bit, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, we're not toggle over to uh, Senator Sidnor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just before I get into my question, I just wanted to make certain that I read Merriam Webster's definition of socialism because that term gets thrown around and by in, in no way do I understand how this is socialism uh, as one of uh, our, our speakers testified to. It says any of various economic and political theories advocating collective or governmental ownership and administration of the means of production and distribution of goods. It's a system of society or group living in which there is no private property. That had absolutely nothing to do with this bill. Am I correct, uh, Senator Hedelman? You are. Thank you. Uh, now to my question for uh, Mr. Hill. Uh, why do we need um, this bill if we already have uh, rental assistance? Thank you for that question, Senator. Um, this is really important. Uh, you know, the test opposition testimony was essentially said, look, there's no defenses in these cases. And that's just simply not true. I can tell you from 10 years of experience, that is not true. Um, again, that survey we did, 80% of our clients had some sort of defense. A lot of times this is related to conditions of disrepair at the property, severe conditions of disrepair at the property, lack of heat, um, you know, leaking roof. Often it's about a lack of licensing, a lead paint certificate, illegal or excessive fees, mistaken accounting, retaliation, and even much, many more defenses and much more complicated when you talk about subsidized properties. Um, so there are defenses in these cases. Rental assistance is incredibly important. These two things work hand in hand, though. You don't want to give rental assistance to, you know, a tenant and a landlord where the landlord's refusing to fix the heat. 
I've had cases already where the landlord is getting rental assistance. They've agreed to accept that rental assistance from Baltimore City, and they're still moving forward with the eviction because they're like, well, oh, wait a second. You didn't pay this other fee. I forgot about this fee. I'm going to move forward with the eviction, even though I've got the rental assistance. Council works hand in hand to make sure that the laws that we have in the books are enforced. We have an excellent track record of preventing evictions. And again, the stout study and studies around the country show that council is effective. Uh, the stout study was 92% of tenants are avoiding disruptive displacement when they are represented. And I'd also just like to point out that council does more than just litigate. We settle cases all the time. We work out payment plans. Um, we are really trying to, sometimes it, the, the tenant does need to leave the property, absolutely. And we work out a graceful exit that includes a neutral reference, time to gather their belongings, make alternative arrangements. Mm -hmm. And so these are all important, you know, roles that council plays in these cases. And so there are defenses. And I just want to, the, the whole notion of how much this is going to cost, and we have all these filings, so we have to give everyone an attorney for whoever has a filing. I just want to point out that, you know, 600,000 filings, a lot of those cases are dismissed before trial, or they're dismissed at trial, because the tenant has paid in those failure to pay rent cases, and the landlord dismisses the case or the tenant's going to pay. So they don't show up because they don't have a defense. They're not looking for assistance. If they show up, and that's who we're talking about, we're talking about providing counsel for tenants who do show up, who want to fight the eviction, who think they have a defense. And we estimate statewide that would roughly be uh, 34,000 uh, 34, families once the law is fully implemented. And so that's where we get these numbers. And it's uh, again, it's based on a lot of data. And so we are ready to go and make an impact. So, which is not a slush fund. And I'll, I'll take the head nod as a no. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Senator, Senator. Mr. Wiggins has his hand up. If he wants <laughs> it, it's responsive to the inquiry, I just want to give him a chance to chime in and then we'll go to Senator Cassidy. Sure. Senator, I just wanted to clarify that Mr. McAvoy is, is not with our organization. And I think he was the one that called it socialism and a slush fund. That was not us. Just to right. No, uh, I, I, yeah, I think he's just a private citizen who's testified on a number of bills. I just, I just wanted to clarify. No, we appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I think we all got it, but thank you very much. It's always good to clarify. <laughs> um, okay, um, Senator Castley, you are up next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hill, just really quickly, something you just said um, that you estimate that about, I guess, 34,000 folks would have legitimate defenses that would want to pursue those and that you would want to represent them. I, I, think, that, I think that's what you said. You please unmute, Mr. Hill. I'm sorry. There we go. Um, yes, yeah, so if you um, extrapolate from the Stout study that, Balt that uh, the Stout did for Baltimore City from their, based on their eviction filings to the state's eviction filings um, in Baltimore City, the 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 right would cover seven thousand, uh, roughly seven thousand families. Um, average t attorney hours per case of seven point seven hours. A rough cost of eight hundred and twenty dollars. You know, again, some of those cases take an hour if it's the landlord doesn't have a license. Uh, I, I don't wanna, I, yeah, I'm trying to focus. I'm going to move along here, but Sorry. I thought you said that there were out of out of all the hundreds of thousands of cases that you are estimating there are like 34,000 that would have a, a defense you would want to pursue in court. Correct. It was just my long-winded way of saying, yes, that's how we got there is from those 7,000 those 7, uh, to 34,000. Sure. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not challenging your math. Really. That's, that's one to make well, sure you should. Okay. So, but, but the, 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 one of the problems I have is you won't know that they're willing, you won't know who has legitimate defense and wants to pursue it until you've provided the attorney and they're in court because, I mean, look, let's face it. If I'm a tenant and I really have no defense, it's the last thing I want to admit to you. I would much rather you give me an attorney and we'll spin the landlord as long as I can. I want to, if I legitimately have no defense and I'm just a freeloader, then I'm not going to tell you that. So how can you say that, you know, until you provide them an attorney and you've evaluated it um, and perhaps been suckered into court based upon the tenants trying to, trying to get over, how would you know how many you're going to have? 
Well, Senator, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, there are certainly bad apples in, in every bunch, and there, I'm sure there would be someone who would sucker me into thinking they had a defense when they don't have a defense, and then I would get up in court and, you know, my client would, would um, tell me the exact opposite of what he told me five minutes ago. That happens, um, but it's not but the vast majority. But you at least Sorry. have to inventory everybody to see, I mean, you have to make an evaluation, you have to inventory or, 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 or interview everybody to say, what are your defenses? Well, you don't, you don't, you interview, you interview the people who reach out to you. And again, even right now, most people do not reach out for legal assistance. They are going to pay it from the 600,000 filings. They're going to pay the rent and stay. There's no legal dispute. There's no defense. The only ones who actually reach out to us, frankly, are the ones who have a defense. And so those are the folks who are going to be covered under this law. So, okay, so that, so that's, okay. So there's a challenge I have then with the wording of the law, then maybe that's, you know, my, my interpretation this is right to right to representation. I mean, ever since the DeWolf versus Richmond case, or whichever one was first in that one, um, there's been a legal right to counsel initial hearing. Um, there's got to be an affirmative waiver. You can't show up and 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 and. I mean, at some point, a lawyer has to be with that person. They can always say, "I don't want a lawyer," but you got to be there, and and you have to make an appearance. Um, I mean, the, the 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 client can say, "Go home. I don't need you." Or the client can fail to show up, I suppose. But um, you've got to you've got to be there in court and ready to take on that client because the judge is going to say there's a right to counsel. Um, I'm calling the case of landlord versus tenant. Uh, where where do, do we know that tenants waived his right to counsel? No, I can't prove that. Okay, well let's let's get tenant in here so we can waive his right to counsel. Um, and and so you've got to have somebody in their staff for every one of these cases. Why is that not a proper understanding? My understanding is, and in, in, for instance, in New York City, that's one of the ways they do outreach is they will have tenants. And we do this right now in Baltimore City and Prince George's County. And I understand to a certain extent, I have tenants present same day in court, uh, willing to provide representation to tenants who want to take advantage of that service. The problem is we just don't have enough attorneys. The, the, the need far outstrips the supply of attorneys that we have there right now. And so I'm just not gathering the 34,000 number then because I, I would just expect that other than the tenants who don't show up, but I'm not sure how we do that even because there would have to be some sort of presumption that if the tenant didn't show up that they waived their right to counsel and their right to appearance, which we don't do in initial appearance case. We go get the tenant and we get the person and make them come into court. So, Well, they wouldn't be losing their right to counsel. They would just simply have a default judgment entered against them and the yeah, landlord would but, move but forward. But if it's even a default judgment, I had a right to counsel. You should have a, a lawyer should have reviewed the file and say, "Well, wait a minute, this is not an appropriate default judgment. I'm going to challenge the service. I'm going to challenge the the process server. I'm going to challenge the sufficiency of the complaint. I'm going to challenge you name it. I'm going to challenge everything on that piece of paper. Um, uh, and then only and then once the court rejects all my challenges, 20 minutes later, um, after all my time, then I lose the case and the end of default judgment." I mean, Senator, there, there's certainly ways to vacate a default judgment if a tenant reaches out and um, we're able to file a 10-day or a 30-day motion. No, I, I, um, I got all that. I got all that. Okay. You had to represent every one of them. It's not 34,000. It's 600,000. No, it, 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 in my interpretation of this, it's not. It's the tenants who are seeking actually to avail themselves of this right to counsel who would be covered under the law. And as I understand, that's the way it's been functioning in New York City. Um, and the way they intended to function in San Francisco, they, it is functioning in San Francisco and the other jurisdictions that have done this. It's a right, but you have to take advantage of that right. You have, it's, it's a right of access. In fact, that's an important distinction, Senator. Um, if yeah, you not, look I'm at the saying, language, you see yeah, that? The access? Language. Yeah, yeah let, me, in that. let me find that. Uh, so 8904A, this is page four, section, uh, line 16. And I remember this because actually the original draft that I, that I looked at didn't have this and we, we wanted to make that clarification. The coordinator shall provide for access to legal representation. Um, that's a really important distinction. Yeah, but th th that's fine for a program and, and, and I like that language, that's nice. But when you're a judge and you look on page three at line 29, it says a covered individual has a, has a right to legal representation. So if I'm a judge and I'm interpreting that and your case comes before me 
I have to say, okay, now how do I know that this client, this defense, I have somebody has to prove that this tenant um, either waived their right to legal representation or that it was provided or they somehow didn't qualify because they make $100,000 a year or something like that. How do we, how does the judge say you can move on? Oh, it's, it's, I'm seeing this to the initial appearance cases, the Wolf versus Richmond case. That's what I, right. I this. It's right to legal representation as provided under this subtitle. And under this subtitle, there are a number of qualifications and limitations um, in terms of which cases, when, when a, a legal services provider can decline the case. There's a four-year implementation period. So it's not like you're going to pass this law and someone's going to walk in the next day and say, I have a right to counsel. There's a, there are a number of limitations throughout the law, and what it, it talks about in other places is access to legal representation, and that's the intent. I can't help but that's not the words we use. We specifically use legal right to counsel. We put that in there, and in this state, it has a really definite term when it comes to free lawyers, because in the Wolf case showed, when the court said you have a legal right to counsel, initial appearance, there were no exceptions to fully funding, that we had to jump through hoops and do all kind of budget shenanigans to try to make sure we could afford a lawyer for everybody coming in for their initial appearance. And, and, and you know, that was Lottie Dottie and everybody. There were no exceptions. And now you're using those very same words. And we're saying that the only excuse is that, is that, that I see in here is on page five, line 23, that said that the organization lacks the capacity. But if a judge says, you know, that, that, that defense was rejected in Richmond. It wasn't, well, uh, as, we'll do as much legal representation as, as legal aid can provide. The court said, no, you will provide, it's a legal right, it's a, it's a right, and we're gonna provide it. So I, I'm just concerned, look, I, I have no problem. I, I, I think I'm, I'm totally on board with trying to give lawyers to people in lord, landlord tenant cases. I, I have no problem with that. I have no problem with trying to fund that the best that we can. My, my, my problem is that when you create a right, a right is a right, that's a term of art, you've created a right, and, and, and that's post Richmond, seems to me that this says that when we pass this, you will come up with money, darn it. This is a right and, and you will fund it. And, and, and look, having met, done a whole lot of pro bono and, and reduced fee cases, I gotta tell you, I wouldn't, I stopped doing pro bono because they want every, <laughs> there, there is no practical limit on how many hours they want of your time. I didn't mind doing reduced fee because if I'm only charging you $5 an hour, that still forces you to have some kind of economy of my time. But once you have a legal, uh, you know, counsel is free, it's Katie bar the door. They would just suck you dry as a, as a private attorney trying to make it on, you know, with that kind of stuff. So I, I don't understand how this works as a, quote, right to counsel. I understand if this is a program and we say, hey, the governor gave, we got $30 million in the budget this year. We give it to legal aid, whoever, and they use their discretion to provide attorneys to as many good people as they can. I'm, I'm on board. I just don't understand this language because it's not, to me, that's not what this says. So I'll just leave it at that. I, I, I mean, we can talk, Senator Heldman, if you want. I, I you know, I'd be glad to, 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 to sit down because I'm, I'm certainly on board with trying to provide tenants with, with, with attorneys. I, 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 I don't object to that, um, but there's gotta be something that's not a quote, right to counsel. I, I have a question for Mr. Wig, uh, 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 Wiggins, if I can. Sir, so, so we've been doing this stuff on the tenant issues for a while, and this just came up in your testimony um, and some of the prefatory, the, 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 the testimony leading up to yours. And, and we keep hearing that there's sort of these serial, file, serial filers, landlords that file against the same tenants. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, landlords always impress me as, as the rational decision makers and they don't do these things on emotion, but basically rational decisions. Well, two questions for you. One, why do they file, um, we'll, call, we'll use their term, serially. Why do they file serially? And, and, and two, what is it, it, what is it in our current system that either forces or encourages landlords to file cases month after month against this, the same tenants? Can you address that? Yeah, thank you for the question, sure. So, they file because as we discussed on Tuesday night, it is their one option when a tenant is not paying rent. And so in these failure to pay rent cases, and this is probably the answer to your second question, uh, in Maryland, you have a right to redeem up to three times per year for in Baltimore City. That is you, much you, you higher. You some terms of art. What do you mean, you know, right to redeem? Okay. So a right to redeem gives a tenant. So let's say 
uh, you know, I'm a tenant and my landlord files eviction for me against me for failure to pay rent and I owe rent. So we go to court and I get a default judgment. I can pay the, the back due rent and, and fees and stay in my, uh, my, my home or, or my apartment uh, up until the time the actual eviction is carried out. And that is what happens in the vast majority of cases. And I would argue that is why most of these cases are dismissed, not most, but a, a, a subset of the cases are, are dismissed is because we do have the serial filers because you have people who are consistently not paying their rent. And when a tenant does not pay their rent, a landlord has but one option to go and get that rent, and that is to pay an eviction for a failure to pay rent. So if you want to lower the number of filings, remove the, the right to redeem three times per year around the state and four in Baltimore City. Let's be like our contiguous states and give them once. But a landlord has a second option. If I didn't pay my rent for January, um, instead of filing in January, you could just simply give me, you know, wait for three months and just sort of add it all up. And you can only go, you know, go after me every three months. Why not do something like that? So we, landlords could do that. But if we did, you'd see an increase in the number of evictions. Uh, you know, the longer a landlord waits, the harder it is for a tenant to come up with the full amount of money needed to redeem the property. We don't make money on evictions. We, we lose money on evictions. We would love for every tenant to pay at the appropriate time every month and stay in the property. Uh, and when we wait that long period of time, uh, it does lead, it, it could lead to more evictions because again, it's harder for those tenants to come up with the full amount of money. So when you file on that monthly basis, it's easier for the tenant to redeem the, on the property. So if I didn't, if I didn't pay for January, you filed, right after I didn't pay in January. Um, now I, I, I can redeem and stay in in January. Um, but if you didn't file, I don't, let's take the second scenario. I don't pay in January 1st and you're just being either not as diligent or being a nice guy and you don't file in January and you're still being non so diligent with me in February. Finally, you've had enough. And in March you file um, when I don't pay. Um, and the court says, yep, he didn't pay without excuse. Um, and I owe for three months rent now. Um, so you come against me for the, you say, well, I want the apartment plus the three months rent. Are you going to get my three months rent? Most of the time, we, I, 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 the delinquency stuff, we don't always collect. A lot of times we don't get the money um, on the back end. Yeah, we would. We would Are you take normally the just money. taking the, 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 the initial deposit? Is that, is that all you're collecting after the three months rent delinquency? Yeah, we do. We lose a lot of those late long term delinquencies. We do lose money on those because okay. uh, so know, which would kind of be the reason back, then it's gone. Yeah, but that, that would be the reason you probably want to file soon. So you only lose one month's rent instead of three months. rent. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. OK. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Castle. I see that um, I'm going to let Ms. Soro and then Mr. Hill, if it's responsive to the, uh, the dialogue here, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to throw in that a reminder that this bill only covers individuals at 50% of AMI and below. So it's not every individual that would be coming into court that would get an attorney. Um, but not just that, a little bit of a wonky point is that the funds coming in from the federal government for rental assistance um, are prioritized at that same AMI amount. So individuals who are at 50% AMI and below, if they can establish that they were directly or indirectly affected by COVID, then they will be eligible for rental assistance funds. So it's a little bit of a wonky point, but I did want to get that out there because that, that will be a practical factor when folks are looking at failure to pay rent cases that have been filed. Um, and if they have an attorney, they'll be able to look at, are they gonna be eligible? A lot of these programs are, are a lot of the rental assistance programs the first time that the tenants get to them is after they've been sued. And where the attorney comes in there is providing some gravitas and some, um, some assistance in ensuring, assuring the landlord that this person is in a rental assistance um, process. It takes a little while to document all those files and do everything that needs to be done. Um, but we have found that when there's a lawyer involved, um, the case isn't just doesn't just go forward with an eviction. Instead, held 
money is provided to the landlord and then everyone goes about their business. But without that lawyer in between, there is oftentimes not time to get the rental assistance that is available to the landlord. And the tenant's then evicted, the landlord doesn't have the rent they wanted, and nobody wins, nobody wins. So that, that's all. I just wanted to remind everyone that it's a 50% AMI eligibility requirement to get, the, to get a right to counsel. Thank you. And, and very, very briefly, in, in, in addition to, to what Lisa said, um, I just wanted to point out that when we talk about the right to pay and stay or redeem, as Mr. Wiggins was talking about, Maryland is also unique because unlike, I think, you know, we're one of like two or three states in the entire country where there is no pre-filing notice to the tenant. In other words, most states, they're provided a notice, hey, you haven't paid your rent. If you don't pay within 10 days, we're going to potentially file an eviction case. That, too, allows time for eviction diversion, rental assistance, mediation, um, seeking legal advice. We don't have that in Maryland. That's part of the eviction mill that's been created. And so that is a, an important consideration that I just wanted to remind folks of. I appreciate that. Thank you. Out of the interest of fairness, Mr. Enton, please, very quickly, we're going to tie this up with, uh, with your comments, and then we are going to move on. I will just thank you. I just want to make uh, one or two quick points. The, um, uh, our experience is, I just want to say clearly and categorically that the last thing any landlord wants to do is to evict a tenant. You have to keep in mind, on average, the cost of having a new tenant come into a property is roughly $6,000 per property statewide. That's a statewide average. You have to put the property back in decent shape. If it's a pre-1950 property, you have to comply with the lead uh, uh, paint law. And I think I may be even wrong. Maybe it's pre-75. Um, it has to be inspected. Uh, you have to find a new tenant. Um, so you're going to go, you know, from the date the tenant leaves until the date you can rent that property out to someone else, you could be looking at a month, you could be looking at eight weeks. The other point I'd like to make is, yes, there are uh, uh, repeat filings. And the reason there are repeat filings is because there are a large number of tenants that only pay their rent when the sheriff shows up. And they get to do that. Let's say it takes six weeks from the time you file. Like in Montgomery County, it takes six to eight weeks before the sheriff shows up with the um, uh, a warrant of restitution. So you get basically to pay your rent maybe once every three months. And even though you're a habitual late rent payer, because of what we call the three bites of the apple statewide and four in Baltimore City, there's nothing at all that the landlord can do about that. So, I mean, this is not such a thing where I just want to make it clear. We don't want to evict anybody. The final point I'll make, Mr. Chairman, is that in my discussions with the judiciary, there have been no evictions. Any evictions that occurred this year occurred for cases that were filed prior to uh, uh, COVID. And right now they estimate that there will not be any eviction cases heard until sometime this summer. So, I mean, I, I really believe that this is somewhat of a uh, problem looking for a solution. We think that our resources should go for rental assistance and then there'll be no evictions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Ren. Obviously, Senator Hedelman, you're up. You're, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just find it a little bit mystifying um, because my understanding was that MHA was supportive of a uh, right to counsel. In fact, their executive director was quoted in the paper when we had a work group this summer and they came in and testified as saying, the legal, quote, the legal system can be confusing and stressful for litigants even without the occurrence of a global pandemic. So it would seem to me that I, I, while I understand that the last thing landlords want is an eviction and it can be costly to them, that they would um, welcome uh, legal representation in terms of uh, trying to get the rent and trying to adequately address the needs of the tenants. So I just, I find it disappointing that MMHA is now coming and saying that they don't support um, a right to counsel because that's what this bill is about. All right. Thank you very much. So, uh, look, we're going to close the feedback loop on this. Um, any additional dialogue, please submit to the committee. We, we've got we've just, we've got some more work to do, so I need to move the committee along. I appreciate everyone. Um, if any of the senators have um, additional questions, we'll entertain those. If not, 
Thank you. Uh, that'll conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 154. We'll now move on to Senator Hedelman's second bill of the day, Senate Bill 236. Senator Hedelman, you're up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And this will be, I think, I hope, uh, very brief. Um, Senate Bill 236 is a bill that requires local counties and just the big six, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, Montgomery, Prince George's, Powered, and Anne Arundel, um, to uh, collect information from their um, civil rights organizations or human relations council on employment discrimination. Um, the, the, those are the entities that are responsible for responding to complaints. Um, right now, the Maryland Commission on Civil Rights reports aggregated data, but it's not broken down by locality. And Senator Hedelman, is, is anyone else seeing Senator Hedelman? Senator Hedelman, uh, she's paused. Are you were seeing her or is she paused? I don't see her. No. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and mute her um, box and let's let's reach out to her and get her IT issues uh, remedied. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and move. Senator Sidnor, you're next. Uh, I know we just caught you mid bite there. Sorry about that, you're a little early. <laughs> so if you're ready, if not, um, if you're not, then we've got Senator Castley uh, on deck. So uh, Senator Sidnor, you're ready to go? Okay, Senator Sidnor, you're up with Senate Bill 105. Thank you much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Chairman. Uh, Senate Bill 105 is a bill that this uh, committee should be, uh, or has passed or passed last year. Uh, the bill ended up dying on the uh, Senate floor because of COVID. Uh, the bill that you all have before you is a peace order to workplace violence bill, uh, which we passed, I believe it was uh, 10 to one with uh, Senator Huff being the sole uh, person on our committee to vote uh, against the bill. Uh, the bill, the, the, the difference between this bill uh, that's before you today and the bill that was voted out of our committee was an amendment that the committee had put on the bill for um, a report. Um, now, the reason that we had put it in uh, in the same form that it came out of third reader last year is because we wanted to make certain that um, the bills were in alignment between the House and the Senate. Uh, but like I said, this, this bill came out uh, with a 10 to one vote and we're just hoping to get um, a, a, another favorable vote out of the committee. With that, I know the evening has been long and I have uh, three very capable uh, witnesses uh, who would be uh, uh, much better than I in explaining the need for this particular bill. Uh, Dr. Charlotte Wood, from, who's the president of the Maryland Nurses Association, uh, Cheryl Brown, who's uh, with the Maryland Chapter of Society for Human Resources Management, and Bernie Gerst, who's the Director of Security uh, with LifeBridge Health, to explain uh, some of the reasons as to why we need to ensure that our employers have this ability to protect uh, their employees and, 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 and in the, in the facility. So with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Wood. All right. Thank you very much, Senator. And Dr. Wood, you are up. Oh, she's on mute. Yeah, Dr. Wood, if you, there's a little icon that'll pop up and it'll say, yep, there you go. So sorry. Thank no you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm Charlotte Wood the president of the Maryland Nurses Association. And I've been a nurse for 39 years. I've worked in multiple roles. And uh, this bill is extremely important to us. Senate Bill 105 is the Maryland Nurses Association's top priority for this legislative session. If passed, this bill will allow employers such as hospitals to petition the court 
for a peace order to protect employees from the threat of workplace violence. National statistics suggest that workplace violence against nurses and healthcare workers is escalating. OSHA reports that from 2002 to 2013, incidences of serious workplace violence, those especially requiring days off for the injured worker to recuperate, were four times more common in healthcare than in private industry on average. For example, when compared to industries such as construction, manufacturing, and retail, the broad healthcare and social worker sector had 7.8 cases of serious workplace violence per 10,000 full-time employees, while construction, manufacturing, and retail had fewer than two cases per 10,000 employees. We have heard concerns about workplace violence from the 93,000 many of those that 93,000 nurses that reside here in the state of Maryland. Workplace violence not only affects nurses, it also affects other frontline workers. And it is a national priority for the American Nurses Association. So because so many nurses believe that workplace violence is a, just a part of their job, the Maryland Nurses Association and many other agencies are committed to changing this perception. Enacting Senate Bill 105 would be a game changer for nurses and many other frontline workers. We thank you for this time, for um, allowing us to speak on our Senate bill. We thank our um, illustrious Senator Charles Sidnor for sponsoring this bill and championing this process. And we thank you, Chair, um, Mr. Chair, for hopefully and prayerfully a humbly favorable report on this particular bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wood. And uh, next we have uh, Ms. Brown, you are up next. Good to see you. Great. Good evening. Thank you, um, Chairman Smith, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Cheryl Brown, and I'm testifying on behalf of Maryland Society for Human Resource Management. I'm also an employment law attorney who represents businesses and organizations across the state. I just want to thank Senator Sidnor and members of the committee for your continued support of this important legislation. We are asking you again for your support in a favorable vote of Senate Bill 105. Marilyn Sherm represents more than 9,000 members across the state, and Senate Bill 105 would provide employers standing to seek a peace order to protect an employee and others in their organizations from an imminent threat of harm while at the workplace. Workplace violence continues to occur throughout the state in all businesses and organizations. In 2018 alone, businesses lost a number of employees to active shooter situations by either an employee, a former disgruntled employee, or an unhappy customer. We all unfortunately remember the workplace violence that occurred in shootings in Edgewood, Aberdeen, and even the Capitol Gazette. Workplace violence continues to occur in the form of harassment, stalking, and assault. At least 11 states have laws that allow an employer to seek a peace order on behalf of their employees. In Maryland, the employer does not have standing to seek a peace order if it is aware of one or more employees is threatened with an imminent threat of harm in the workplace. Often HR professionals and employers have firsthand knowledge of an imminent threat of harm as they are the ones who are charged with terminating employees. HR professionals are the ones who hear complaints from other coworkers who witness the emotions of a disgruntled employee and observe the impact of those threats of violence on an employee's performance and their attendance in the workplace. Senate Bill 105 would provide employees and their employers with the opportunities to secure the work environment when a potential threat to either or both exist. Senate Bill 105 
will bar the aggressor from entering the workplace, following an employee, contacting the employee by any means. The passage of Senate Bill 105 would provide employers a way to deter workplace violence from even entering the workplace and protect all employees when they are aware that a threat exists. I'm Thank you so much for your continued support and Marilyn Sherm strongly urges your favorable consideration of Senate Bill 105. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Next we'll have uh, Mr. Gerst. Mr. Gerst here, there you go. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Bernie Gerst and I'm the Assistant Vice President for Security for Lightbridge Health. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of Senate Bill 105 on behalf of the Maryland Hospital Association, Lightbridge Health, and the Maryland chapter of the International Association of Healthcare Safety and Security. The previous two speakers have eloquently described for you the basis of the problem. Uh, physicians, nurses, and staff already have stressful and demanding work environments. Violence or threats of violence add to an already stressful and at times dangerous workplace and detract from employee performance. This legislation is an important tool to protect our staff and our institutions. If I have a bad actor who, who assaults, threatens, stalks, or intimidates one of our staff, I can issue a trespass notice to prevent them from returning to the facility, but that only covers the workplace. Peace orders cover the workplace, residence, school, other locations, as well as any and all attempts to contact the victims by any means. If somebody violates a trespass notice, police officers are less apt to arrest, but they'll be more willing to arrest for violation of a peace order because it carries force of law. This legislation is needed so staff members who are already traumatized and victimized don't have to go to court to apply for the order in person. It's scary for some, and it takes them from their workplace, resulting in loss of staffing for the better part of the day. This legislation allows our security professionals to apply on the victim's behalf for the interim peace order. Respondents still have due process because the victim attends a later hearing where a judge decides whether to issue a more permanent order. Security is here for these purposes without detracting from providing care to our patients. We need our staff in our facilities caring for the sick and providing other services, especially now. I believe some victims currently don't pursue peace orders because they don't wanna leave their unit shorthanded. Today, if one of my nurses is assaulted, an investigator can take statements, gather evidence, and apply for a criminal statement of charges on their behalf, charging the defendant with a crime. But that same investigator can apply for a simple peace order that merely tells a respondent to stay away from the victim, their workplace or home. That just makes no sense. I ask you to please look favorably on this important legislation that will aid in protecting our most valuable resources. I wanna thank the committee and, and most importantly, Senator Sidnor for his leadership on this very important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gerst. And next we'll have Mr. Tully. Mr. Tully, you're up next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is George Tolley. I'm here testifying on behalf of the Maryland Association for Justice. And I'm uh, happy to tell you all that we support the bill and we wanna help uh, make it better. Um, we have a very small amendment that I believe will make this bill even better than it is. And it sounds like a terrific bill. Uh, the problem that we see is on page four uh, lines 30 through 32. And what it says is that an employer shall be immune from any civil liability that may result from the failure of the employer to file a petition on behalf of an employee under the provisions of the subtitle. Uh, so an employer who promises to file a petition and then doesn't, and the, the employee detrimentally relies, that employer is immune and can't be held accountable. Um, moreover, although currently employers are not allowed to, let alone required to, uh, file for peace orders, it is possible that, say, for example, a, a nurse's union might negotiate in a contract that employers shall, under certain circumstances, file for peace orders, say, for example, in the, ex in, in the situation Mr. Gerst just described. If there was a contractual duty to file a peace order, this immunity in the statute, if it were to become law, would make that contractual uh, obligation moot because it couldn't be enforced if the contract required it 
it couldn't be enforced. The, the employer would have immunity. What we suggest and, and respectfully request and in my uh, written materials is, is a proposed amendment, replace the language with language that says, nothing in this subtitle creates or imposes a duty requiring an employer to file an, a petition on behalf of an employee under the provisions of the subtitle. That is, the statute doesn't require employers to do it. It only authorizes them to do it and leave it to subsequent development of law and custom and practice in contracting and employment law so that you don't have to come back maybe 20 years from now and try to remove an immunity, which I can tell you from personal experience is very hard to do. Uh, this way, the, the law can develop the way it will if a, if a duty to file a, a peace order on behalf of an employee arises by contract or otherwise, that duty is enforceable. Time. Haven't made it unenforceable. And so with that, that amendment, we certainly commend the bill to you and hope that uh, you'll, favor, you'll, you'll pass it out favorably with, them, with that amendment. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Tully. We'll now turn to Ms. Tenney. Lisa, you are up. I should be unmuted now. Yes. Okay. My name is Lisa Tenney and I'm here testifying on behalf of the Maryland Emergency Nurses Association. Good evening, Chairman Smith and Vice Chair Waldstriker and other members of the committee. And thank you, Senator Sidnor for reintroducing this bill this year. The Maryland Emergency Nurses Association really needs this, this bill. And as uh, Dr. Wood had said, nurses and other healthcare providers experience a significantly higher amount of assault and abuse than other professions. And at the top of that list is emergency nurses, just because of the constitution of the population that we see. Come with me to work. Imagine we're in the ER. And this is a real story from a real Maryland ER, okay? Jack, the nurse, was taking care of his ventilated older patient, older man, and he was suctioning the patient. And out of the corner of his eyes and ears, he heard a commotion only to look behind him to see someone charging at him with an IV pole. Unbeknownst to him, this patient had already assaulted two other staff members, had grabbed the IV pole, and in doing so, pulled it out of the arm of another patient and was charging for some reason against this old guy in the bed on a vent. Jack instinctively threw his body over top of the patient, real story, and then our out of control patient just started whacking him in the head five times. Jack ended up with a skull fracture and a traumatic brain injury and was in no condition to file a peace order. Imagine the chaos in the emergency department, subduing the perpetrator, making sure the guy in the vent didn't dislodge his, his in, you know, he had a clear airway, making sure that we, our new trauma patient, Jack, was okay, taking care of the lady whose IV got pulled out of her, plus the other staff members. And then there were all our other innocent patients who were just so traumatized by this. Now, while Jack is hospitalized, imagine how comforting it would be Fine. to us if our employer could have applied for the peace order for us. So I thank you in advance for a favorable vote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Tenney. And with that, <clears throat> that rounds up the panel for the proponents. We have one uh, signed up for the, in the opposition, and I do not see him in the room. Is Mr. McAvoy in the room? Okay, see, so that's it. I think that closes it. That's okay with you, Senator Sidnor. Um, any you know, questions from the committee? Seeing none. Okay, fantastic. So that with that, that concludes the testimony for Senate Bill 105. We'll now move back to Senator Hedelman uh, for Senate Bill 236. So mm -hmm. Senator Hedelman, you are up. Good to see you back. Thank you. I got booted from the MGA 
Wi-Fi. So I'm sorry about that. And Zoom just went dark trying to get back in. It's a challenge. I think if you're on eight hours or more, it just like cuts you off. So thank well, you. Happens to me at least once a day. So yeah, yeah a lot. Anyway, um, so this bill is about collecting data on employment discrimination. The, and you'll see we don't I don't have a panel. I just have written testimony that is um, that has been submitted. Um, what the bill does, and this was a bill that was introduced by one of our House colleagues last year, it passed the House and it did not have the opportunity to be considered by this committee. What it does is um, it, it just gets a little more data um, from the six largest uh, local jurisdictions um, that, that represent 92% of the total immigrant community. And what we're looking at here is trying to dig into the complaints that arise on employment discrimination. It, it asks for the data to be disaggregated by the type of discrimination, the category of job, whether the discrimination is alleged in the private sector or the public sector, um, the complainant's country of origin, which we, we actually do now, and whether the complaint was sustained. Um, every year, the Maryland Commission on Civil Rights provides us with a, their annual report and their 2020 uh, report um, detailed that 79% of the complaints are due to employment. And so what we wanna do is try and dig into that a little bit and ask them to analyze the data for trends and to make recommendations on how to address so that we can see if there are issues with regard to people's country of origin and whether people who are foreign born are being discriminated against in the workforce, they can make recommendations to, to try and address those. Um, the Maryland Commission on Civil Rights is, um, the, yeah, is, is in favor of this. They say they have the capacity to do it. Um, and um, we just ha have a slight amendment um, to just clarify who in those local jurisdictions is responsible for collecting that data. So I respectfully ask for a favorable report and happy to answer any questions if you have them. All right, looking at the panel, seeing none. Thank you, Senator Hellman. And with that, that'll conclude the Thank hearing you. for cycle 236. And we'll now turn to Senator Cassidy for the final bill of the day, Senate Bill 381. Senator Cassidy, you're up. Can you hear me now? Am I all right? Yes. Yeah, we got you. Okay, uh, colleagues. So th this bill is in response to the demands for uh, greater accountability regarding allegations of police misconduct. And we've seen proposals to re repeal the OBER, the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights and, and many other bills. So this is a, another approach to that. And I, I just wanna say, so modern police agencies are powerful paramilitary organizations. They operate 24 seven, 365 throughout every corner of our state. And the officers in the field are generally alone. They're necessarily operate with a great level of personal discretion as they encounter infinite possibilities of, of, of personal and public danger, and they're often uh, under overwhelming demand. Mistakes by law, for, law enforcement officers can be very costly in terms of life, health, and public safety, and public morale. Uh, a good officer is a lifesaver who is a godsend to our communities. A bad officer is a potential menace to the community. Given the autonomy and immense power possessed by each individual officer, it's vital that all police agencies in the state operate under a process that provides for effective, timely police discipline to identify and quickly remove uh, or discipline offending officers. We need to act with caution in this as we look at this problem and seek to change the existing process because we've witnessed in our own state the immense damage that can be done to public safety when elected leaders in an effort to score political points act rashly, imprudently, and even foolishly to attack those who would protect and serve. I, uh, we need the police. We especially need very good police officers um, who are smart, dedicated, and honest. We cannot attract good police recruits or retain good officers with the desired qualifications by belittling, disrespecting them, or through unfair systems or demeaning processes. As described by Governor Schaefer in 1988, the Leober, I'll just refer to the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights as Leober, which was enacted in 1974, was to secure for law enforcement officers minimum guarantees of procedural substantive due process. And towards this end, Leober established a uniform statewide process for police disciplinary matters. It established a process that was fair to the officers, but also instilled public confidence and police officers were provided with, with, with adequate due process protection. 
In Governor Schaefer's evaluation of Leobert in 1988, that was 14 years after its enactment, he stated, most observers agree that Leobert has served its purpose well. The rights of law enforcement officers are clearly defined and are uniform throughout Maryland. The uniformity of the system enhances its effectiveness and the public's confidence in law enforcement. Ultimately, that balance that Governor Schaefer described has been eroded over time. In, 1970, in 1987 and 88, that was then Senate Bill 227, would have authorized law enforcement officers to waive any and all their, their Leobra hearing procedures and elect in the alternative to proceed under a process established under collective bargaining agreement, which I refer to as a CBA. This process passed the General Assembly twice, but was vetoed by the governor twice on the grounds that it would erode uniformity of police discipline process that then existed throughout the state. In Governor Schaefer's 1988 veto letter for SB 227, he stated, Senate Bill 227 would erode the uniformity of the system by allowing police officers in different jurisdictions to elect to be covered by, by, the, by the terms of a collective bargaining agreement in effect in that jurisdiction. The result would be an inconsistent application of, of law enforcement officers' bill of rights in a patchwork of supplemental protections under the collective bargaining agreements. In addition, these protections could be altered on a yearly basis as various collective bargaining agreements were, re were renegotiated. I continue to believe that great weight should be given to the to Leober in any interplay between it and collective bargaining agreements. The most impactful changes to Leober were made in 2006. Disregarding Governor Schaefer's cautionary advice in his 1988 veto letter of the previous SB 227, the General Assembly enacted Senate Bill 420, which completely removed the prohibition on use of binding arbitration to determine the procedures to be used in resolving officer discipline related matters. The opposition to this proposal, proposed bill are both instructive and prophetic. In Mako's opposition, they stated that if this bill were enacted, counties would likely be subjected to significant pressure to authorize the use of arbitrators whose appointment would likely be restricted by union agreement who are not accountable and whose decisions would be final. In addition, the proposed binding arbitration authorization creates the prospect of inconsistent departmental discipline. Different arbitrators could render different punishment decisions for different incidents. With the arbitrator's decision being binding, the police chief or sheriff loses the discretion to necessary to ensure that discipline is, is, is effective and that similar, dis, similar matters are uh, given the, the same uh, discipline. Accountability should not be subjected to decisions for an unaccounted third, for an unaccounted third party. In Prince George's County's opposition, they say that the bill if passed would start police agencies to have collective bargaining agreements on the path to losing control of the disciplinary process. Mako's veto letter then requested states that implementation of, of SB 2420 would ultimately erode authority and accountability of chiefs for officer discipline, denying citizens recourse and citizens confidence in the credibility of law enforcement. These bills enactment could lead to the chiefs and sheriffs who supervise the vast majority of officers in Maryland, not having, not having discipline authority over those officers. Mako letter includes a number of attachments, which are included in my support letter. I'll just note that attachment A outlines 11 incidences where the chiefs elected to terminate the officers, where hearing boards had recommended the opposite. And of course, none of that would be possible under the collective bargaining. Unfortunately, Governor Ehrlich de in, de uh, declined the invitation to veto this. So presently in all the major jurisdiction, the county law enforcement bodies operate under collective bargaining agreements, not under Leober, and in each, as, the gov as Governor Schaefer predicted, the collective bargaining agreement provides for different policies and procedures regarding police misconduct, investigations, and discipline. The one element that all the CBAs have in common is a realization of the concerns expressed by those who warned of the dangers expressed in the, in the current system. Citizens have been denied recourse and confidence in the credibility of law enforcement. The police and chiefs and sheriffs have lost the discretion necessary to ensure the discipline for similar incidents or, or that is desired public policies implemented. Police accountability is subject to decisions from unaccounted third parties and police leaders are well down the path to losing control of the police disciplinary process. My bill is very simple. We just simply remove the, 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 the amendments that have really radically changed the LEOBR, LEOBR and eroded that balance that Governor Schaefer so strongly encouraged uh, way back in 1988, which he said had survived from 1974 up until 1988. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. And so, I mean, I think, you know, I don't know if there are any questions from the panel, but, um, and it, I know it's the last bill of the day, but 
uh, we're, so we're gonna have, we're gonna start our process tomorrow with the police form bills, with, and um, you know, we'll have a work group tomorrow, I think, on MPIA. But this is LEOVR and uh, preemption or making taking the collective bargaining piece out of of the process. I think is something that that all of us on the committee are interested in doing um, and ensuring yeah. there's uniformity across the state. So, for me, and I, I just think it's important as we go forward that we we not lose mind, not lose sight of. Why we have why we ever started with LEOBR, LEOBR, and what that was about, and that's why I thought it was so interesting to look at the history, and look at some very well reasoned cautions about, uh, you know, where we would end up, and 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 they were also the deja vu. Hey, here we are, just like they said, you know, shock of all shocks. So, um, I, I, Harper County has this right. I mean, Harper County has taken that this piece out of there. Well, we never brought it in. Um, uh, we didn't when we brought in our collective bargaining statute. Um, that was when I was first in the Senate, and there was a proposal to allow my, well, in the enabling legislation, they asked, the initial request was that we um, uh, allow the collective bargaining of, of, of police discipline. And I, my response was, look, if you want my support for this bill, we will not include that. I am glad to support collective bargaining for your, you know, your, 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 your salaries, your work conditions. I, I'm totally behind that but not for police discipline. Um, the, the, the union agreed. And so our county is like the other counties that, uh, that apply a strict LEOBR process. Uh, the collective bargaining agreement has no part in that. Um, and quite frankly, you know, when I discussed it with our sheriff, he does not feel that he's inhibited in any way from removing an officer who needs to be removed. Um, he's not gun happy, he's not trigger happy on that, but he feels that the process that LEOBR LEOBR provides allows him the discretion as a chief law enforcement officer to effectively respond to public concerns about uh, removing or disciplining and to maintain a quality police force. As we move forward, I just want to look into you know the research about the on the, the counties that have gone forward with these agreements, uh, whether we can you know whether it'll have them sunsetted so that when these agreements sunset it'll be in effect until then and then you know obviously whatever we pass will be in effect or if we can go ahead and and you know kind of pierce the four corners of their of their current agreement um, whether we can do that and see if there's if it's constitutional yeah. I think we should do some research on that but, yeah and I did include the complete my letter in the complete packet it's actually ended up because it had to be broken into three submissions um, on, on the on the website because it was fairly lengthy. Um, I included all that and, and, and some of the, I, I tried to include a lot of historical documents so folks could look at that and not rely upon my statement about what Governor Schaefer or, or whoever, you know, Prince George's County or Baltimore City might have said back then. So I tried to include a lot of the historic documents. I, I do have some more just, you know, in the, in the interest of not flooding the system with too much, but we've got a lot of great historical documents that show how we got here on LEOBR. Um, and, and I think you're very instructive. And, you know, this is one of those ones where you look back at the history, and you, it makes you sort of proud of the Senate, um, as President Miller would often point out to us, you know, there, we, we do stand on, a lot of folks before us did a lot of work. And, and, and it's important that we recognize that, you know, go back and look at that stuff and not reinvent the wheel. And I think this is one of those examples where the, the legislative library, legislative history is, is extremely helpful of, of all the you know, they had a lot of input. People wrote a lot of uh, great uh, analysis on this stuff and a lot of work was done. And I think it's time that we really focus on that and go back and relook at this because we have an opportunity to say, hey, we tried this, you know, we were there, we tried this and maybe let's, let's, let's relook at what we did because the, the proof's in the pudding. You know, we, we've given this a, a, a more than a decade of a trial under the new, the, the, the changes and, and I, Unfortunately, it hasn't worked out. Uh, well, it worked out exactly as Governor Schaefer said, but not as some other folks hoped. It, you know, I, I know everybody moved forward in this vein in, 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 in with, with being optimistic. No, none of the changes were instituted with the expectation that they would undermine public confidence. So nobody was acting um, in a in an untoward manner. It's just people were we were on uh, new territory. They were experimenting. They were trying something new, and it just didn't work out quite the way they had hoped. So. Uh, the history is definitely interesting. All right, with that, uh, if there are no questions from the committee and there are no witnesses for this bill, so we uh, we are coming up on our seventh hour of, of hearings, and so we, we, we're going to beat the clock before six o'clock. We're going to punch. So with that, um, unless there's further, co further commentary, we'll say good night, and uh, we'll see you on the floor tomorrow. See you later. Have a good night. <laughs>